Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Senator Seward. Documents to the notice paper. Leave is granted. Leave is granted, Senator Seward. Thank you. Could I uh, seek leave to, uh, to uh, could I move to put the Aged Care Act independent review of legislative provisions governing the use of restraints in residential aged care and document and the Aged Care Quality and Safety Royal Commission final report, Care, Dignity and Respect, uh, back on the notice paper to be considered on Thursday afternoon. I understand leave has been granted. Leave has been granted. Thank you, Senator Seward. Thank you. I will now ask the clerk to call on any proposals for the committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate. Mr President, committees, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Fair Work Amendment Supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy uh, President. I uh, rise to speak on the uh, Fair Work Amendment Supporting Australian Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill of 2020. <coughs> I welcome the opportunity to lead for the Labor Party on this bill. Uh, which we very much strongly oppose in its totality. Uh, this bill is dangerous and it's unfair. And rather than doing what it its title says, it will in fact hurt workers. It will cut their pay and their conditions, and it will make jobs less secure, not more secure, less secure, and ultimately <coughs> it will hurt the Australian economy. It's nothing more than a cynical and opportunistic attack on workers' rights and their conditions at work, all under the guise of, uh, of COVID and the, uh, and the pandemic. Madam Deputy President, it could have all been so different. If only the government had been genuine in its rhetoric about wanting to find ways to improve our industrial relations laws in a way that would create jobs and leave no worker worse off. But as always, the government uh, talked the big game, made the big announcements, but in a so utterly predictable manner, failed to do, deliver anything like it. We've seen it so many times with this government, all announcement and no delivery. But when they do deliver, of course, it's pork, bar ba pork barrelling uh, and rorts, or just delivering for their mates. Madam Acting Deputy President, as our country and the world has grappled with the enormous health and economic challenges presented by COVID-19, Labor provide the government with all the necessary cooperation to ensure financial assistance reached businesses, workers and families as quickly as possible to help them get through this terrible pandemic. The measure Morrison and Frydenberg so loudly proclaim as their big success, the wage sub subsidy or, <coughs> as it's known, JobKeeper, as it's been branded, <coughs> was originally put forward by Labor and the unions, but rejected out of hand by this government. <coughs> The Prime Minister actually said it would be dangerous to implement what became JobKeeper. 
We put forward the idea, and when the government finally decided to do it, we supported it, even though it left nearly a, min a million casual workers behind, ignored university workers, people in the arts and the entertainment uh, industry, um, and of course the tourism industry, uh, which I've been familiar with, the sporting industry, and left loyal aviation workers completely out in the cold. But nevertheless, we were constructive. And similarly, the union movement worked with employers and the Fair Work Commission to ensure that changes could be made quickly to awards to allow businesses to keep operating in the most difficult and unique of circumstances. If in anything, what was achieved uh, showed the current system was flexible enough already to respond to and manage unforeseen issues. And despite the fact <coughs> Labor was not invited to the negotiating table when Scott Morrison announced his industrial relations working groups, uh, we were prepared to consider agreed measures that came from those groups. The unions were invited to and involved with that process, and they were represented in every working group. So if there was agreement coming out of that process, we would be open and willing to consider those changes. But what we have before us is not the result of anything that came out of those working groups. This is an important point, uh, Deputy uh, President. We cannot be deceived by employer groups or media reports that the legislation represents consensus uh, from any of the Attorney General's working groups, because it does not. Even the wage theft provisions in the bill, which at least contain some positive me measures, overriding existing stronger legislation in both Queensland and Victoria. This was not supported by unions, so it's fair to say there is virtually nothing to show for the 32 working group meetings over a period of 10 weeks, taking up around 150 hours. When the working group process was gradually announced by the Prime Minister back in May last year, it was all about breaking away from the old arguments, finding new ways for employers and unions to work together to come to an agreement around improving our industrial relations system. The Prime Minister tried to uh, portray himself as a Bob Hawke of the day, forging a new way forward. Well, I knew Bob Hawke, and Scott Morrison is no Bob Hawke. But no one brought the idea. Nobody brought it. I mean, as my colleague, the Shadow Minister for Industrial Relations, pointed out, when Hawke negotiated the first prices and incomes accord with the trade union movement, he brought universal health cover to the table. Scott Morrison, on the other hand, simply brought the table. There was never going to be any given this, only take. And that's what we're left with in this legislation. <coughs> Just ask the union movement, uh, Madam Deputy President, who, in good faith and in the spirit of cooperation, participated fully in every one of those 32 meetings. But I'm afraid to say it was all for nothing. What we have before us here in this legislation is actually as if the union movement were not even in the room. I'll say that again, uh, Deputy President, because I know you're surprised, but it's as if the union movement was not even in the room. Uh, <coughs> just read the opening summary to the ACTU submission to the Senate inquiry on the bill, and I quote, this bill, if enacted, will cut the wages, conditions and the rights of Australian workers. Working people have uh, either been the essential workers supporting the country during the pandemic or have already suffered the most from economic impacts of COVID-19. Uh, punishing them with cuts to their rights should not be acceptable to this parliament. But that is the outcome of Prime Ministers and Attorney General's working groups. A complete failure, or as was expressed in so many other submissions, a lost opportunity. So we shouldn't pretend that there's any balance in this legislation so far as the workers are concerned. 
What we need to understand is that the temptation to use the COVID crisis uh, to drive through a long wished for uh, group of anti-worker measures was just too great for this government. They simply return to what they always do. It's, it's in their DNA, Deputy President, it's in their DNA that gave us work choices over a decade. <clears throat> and remember that. Howard finally got his chance, his dream, to implement his own industrial relations uh, uh, provisions, work choices it was called. Of course, it was nothing like work choices. And over a decade ago, <clears throat> that was so comprehensively rejected by the Australian people in the 2007 election. Even in the absence of consensus from the working groups on industrial relations reform, Labor set a very simple test as to whether they would support the legislation. Our test was a simple one. Would it deliver secure jobs with decent pay? A simple question. A simple question. Would it deliver secure jobs with decent pay? But the answer to this piece of legislation is, is an outstanding no. It simply does not deliver secure jobs with decent pay. Uh, Deputy President, when we first saw this bill last December, which contained even more extreme uh, provisions relating to two, a two-year suspension of the better off overall test, we said no. The bill represented an attack on the rights of workers who got us through COVID, the heroes of the pandemic. I'll say that again, uh, the Deputy President, because I know you're interested in this point. The bill represented an attack on the rights of workers who got us through COVID. So the very workers who managed to hold the fort, while <coughs> lots of us uh, didn't turn up for parliament, these workers, like shop assistants, right around the, they turned up, they turned up for work every day, serving customers, risking their own health. And what reward do they get? What reward do they get, Deputy President, from this government? Well, they get a piece of legislation that kicks them right in the guts. So their thanks for... Uh, well, yeah, no, it is a shame, uh, Senator McCarthy. You've hit the nail on the head there. <clears throat> Here we had a group of workers. <clears throat> I'm familiar with retail workers and that wonderful union, the Shop Assistance Union, who represents them. They worked, they worked through this crisis when <clears throat> heaps and heaps of people in this chamber did not turn up to work. They were working, they were serving customers, they were ensuring that <clears throat> the one thing that uh, those people who might have otherwise been in lockdown could do was get food, uh, <clears throat> food on their tables at home to feed their kids, feed their families. And what does this government do to them? What? What's, what way does this government thank those workers for sticking their neck out, turning up for work every day, unlike we, what we were doing here? They were turning up for work every single day. Uh, they were providing a service to this community, to our community, in the worst pandemic in 100 years. And what reward do they get from this government? They get a kick in the guts, Deputy Chair. There's no other way to describe this piece of legislation. In fact. Those people opposite ought to be ashamed when they have to come to vote for this piece of legislation, because the way in which you reward those workers, those brave workers, and there's lots of others. I've, I've just picked out the retail workers because I'm familiar with them, uh, Deputy President. But there's hospitality workers that you'd be familiar with. There's people who work in hospitals, nurses, doctors, all of those people who stuck their neck out during the pandemic, continued to go to work treated or dealt with people who might have had uh, COVID or did have COVID, and the way in which these people opposite the government <coughs> says thank you to them is reduce their terms and conditions, reduce, reduce their bargaining power, reduce their ability to get a wage rise. <coughs> when was the last time any of these workers got a wage rise? When was the last time they got a wage rise? People in this chamber have had a wage rise more recently than most Australian workers have had. Have a look at the figures. Have a look at the figures on what's happening with wages, uh, Deputy uh, President. Now, I know you're familiar with this already, <coughs> but I'll tell you again. Um, 
Basically, wages are stagnant in this country. Wages are not rising. So what does this government do? They set in place, or they propose to set in place, a piece of legislation uh, that's going to make it even more difficult for workers uh, to try and recover uh, what they've lost. No, it is a disgrace. I, I can't agree with you more there, uh, Senator McCarthy. It's a disgrace what this government is proposing to do. But just think about who they're trying to target in this bill. It's not professionals. It's not the top end of town. It's those people whose jobs are most vulnerable. Their jobs are already under threat under JobKeeper with the collapse of or the ending of the JobKeeper. <clears throat> Look, I know, I know about this. I was up in far north Queensland only a couple of weeks ago talking to some of the people who face an economic cliff in two weeks' time <clears throat> because of the uh, removal of the, uh, the JobKeeper provisions. So the people who are the most vulnerable in our community, the ones who have continued to work, like casual shop assistants, for instance, turning up <clears throat> for three-hour shifts or whatever they might be, they're the most vulnerable um, in our community right now. Um, they've done the right thing. They've continued to work through um, the, the whole COVID pandemic to serve the community. And how does this government thank them? How does this government reward them? This government takes away their basic terms and conditions that might give them an opportunity to try and improve their wages uh, as we go forward. This, this bill goes backwards. What we should have had now was a bill that went forward that said thank you to these workers, that we appreciate, we appreciate uh, what you've done during this pandemic and we're going to reward you, maybe with a wage rise even, some extra hours, uh, some better leave provisions, some pandemic leave provisions. No, none of that. This government only wants to go backwards. And, uh, Labor will oppose this legislation. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Fruki. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise on behalf of the Greens to speak to the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2020. Um, and I can tell you that, unlike the title of the bill, there is absolutely nothing fair about it. This bill seeks to suppress wages and erode working conditions for all workers especially those who are the lowest paid, through a suite of measures designed to further shift the balance of power from workers to business. The Morrison government's clear agenda in putting this bill, the biggest attack on workers' rights since John Howard's work choices, is entrenching insecure work to the overwhelming benefit of big business and the enormous detriment of workers and communities. One of the most noxious provisions in this bill is its redefinition of a casual employee. The new definition will give employers all the power to determine whether a worker is casual and will allow businesses to classify workers as casual at the start of their employment, regardless of the hours they actually end up working. Not only does this new definition do nothing to prevent misclassification of per permanent workers as casual, it actually facilitates it by allowing businesses to hire workers as casual and give them full-time hours without requiring them to pay entitlements or provide any job security. The bill will rob part-time workers of hours and income security by allowing businesses to effectively treat them like casuals with the power to increase and decrease workers' hours. Part-time workers in industries that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, such as hospitality and retail, would be able to be employed on contracts that only offer a guarantee of 16 hours a week, with their employer able to increase their hours without paying any overtime. Workers will be forced into a false choice, accept a contract with minimal guaranteed hours and agree to additional hours at lower pay, or risk losing the job offer or additional hours to one of the over 2 million people who are currently unemployed or underemployed. This push from the government turns what should be secure, well-paid jobs into insecure work with no guarantee of regular hours or a take-home pay. Despite the removal of the changes um, to the better off overall test, the government has snuck in changes that could have the very same effect. 
A suite of changes proposed in this bill would significantly erode workers' rights and undermine the role of unions in the enterprise bargaining process. The Fair Work Commission won't be required to satisfy itself that an agreement doesn't exclude the minimum national employment standards set out in the Fair Work Act. Instead, the bill replaces the safety net with a yet-to-be-seen regulation that will allow employers to provide a model NES interaction term, which will supposedly assure fair work that minimum standards are not excluded. Additionally, employer obligations to provide workers with important information and all documents relating to the agreement are significantly weakened, and employers are no longer required to notify workers they have a right to be represented by their union in negotiations until a month after they begin. This means that workers may not have all the information necessary to make a decision about an agreement and might not even know that they have access to support until it's too late. The bill also requires the Fair Work Commission to approve agreements within 21 days, a provision which has raised significant concern about pressure to approve or reject agreements without proper scrutiny, resulting in low-quality agreements that actually harm workers. As if this catalogue of unfairness was not enough, the government has included provisions that prevent unions who haven't been involved in negotiations from making submissions to the Fair Work Commission. This means that unions, the experts in industrial relations, will not be able to scrutinise non-union agreements and work towards improving them. During the inquiry into this bill, we heard from unions about, working, about the working group process up to the bill. Ms. Laurie Ann Sharp, Assistant Federal Secretary of the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Foundation, summed it up pretty well when she said, I was involved in the five-month process during the lockdown in Melbourne, and we entered it all in very good faith. How disappointed we were to see this legislation. It seems that the government has gone straight to the hands of the big corporations. And that is exactly right. The government, as always, has gone straight into the hands of the big corporations. It appears that while plenty of proposals from business lobbies have made their way into this bill, recommendations of unions and other labor law experts were summarily dismissed by the government. It's not hard to imagine why. We know why. Reforms that would improve workplace entitlements and benefits for workers are not part of the liberal national big business agenda. I don't think they ever were. Time and time again, we have seen big businesses act in their own self-interest at the expense of workers' wages and conditions. However, the government is removing the safety net checks and balances that are designed to protect workers and asking them to trust businesses to do the right thing. This is not a government which has any interest, any interest whatsoever in supporting good jobs for anyone but the wealthy or the kind of economic recovery which would make life better for everyone in our society. Their interest is in propping up dying industries like coal and gas at the behest of their donors, and securing jobs for themselves, the board directorships and senior executive positions that await them at the other side of their term in this parliament. This government's only true constituency is big business. And this bill is a gift to the corporate interests that bought the Liberal and National parties a long time ago. A casualized workforce effectively at the mercy of their bosses, at the mercy of their bosses' wishes to hire and fire, is exactly what corporations and this government are looking for. And that is what this bill will deliver, an insecure workforce with no income security and reduced capacity to organize collectively. It will deliver a more easily exploitable workforce one which has no choice but to accept bad jobs with bad pay and bad conditions so that people can just get by. The explosion in casual work before and during the pandemic is a recipe for greater inequality 
and more stress and angst amongst people and communities. The pandemic has highlighted the inequality that has been allowed to flourish as a result of insecure work in Australia, and it has supercharged it. Not only is this bill anti-worker, it is also racist and sexist a bill which increases the precarity of casual and part-time workers, reduces collective bargaining power, and suppresses wages will be yet another blow to women and migrants, compounding the harm of this government's gendered, racialized, and exclusionary responses to the pandemic so far. Just as women and migrant workers have borne the brunt of this pandemic, so too will they suffer because of the provisions of this bill. Already overly represented in the casual and part-time workforce, women and migrant workers are also overrepresented in the lowest paid sectors of the economy. During the pandemic, women lost their jobs twice as fast as men, withdrew from higher education at greater rates than men, were even further loaded with unpaid caring work, and after a brief period of free childcare, had that ripped from under them too. Thousands and thousands of migrant workers have been locked out of JobKeeper and JobSeeker due to eligibility requirements and already vulnerable to exploitation and wage theft. Without the ability to access income support, migrant workers' situations have become even more precarious. Many have been forced to rely on charity and try to make ends meet in the gig economy. The danger of unregulated gig work that has brought home that was brought home by the deaths of delivery riders on the job. This bill will only make things worse for the most vulnerable workers in our society. Before the pandemic, wage growth for all workers was stagnant. Jobs were increasingly insecure and wage theft was rife. Since COVID reared its head, things have only gotten worse. Casual workers were the hardest hit during the pandemic accounting for two-thirds of people who lost their jobs in early 2020. Casuals who still had a job were amongst the lowest paid and most insecure workers, with no access to paid leave entitlements. The labour share of national income has fallen below 50% for the first time since 1959, and corporate profits have soared. Wage growth has fallen to record lows during COVID, and wages have declined in real terms. As lockdowns have ended and businesses have begun to reopen, the proportion of insecure jobs has exploded. 60% of all jobs created as the economy has started to open up again are casual jobs. Nearly two-thirds of new jobs are part-time. Where those part-time jobs are permanent, the government is opening the door to effectively casualizing them. It is impossible to deny the extreme danger to public health posed by insecure work and precarity both in the form of direct threats to public health in the context of a pandemic and its negative effect on people's psychological, social and economic well-being. As we know, the lack of paid leave for casual workers forced people to choose between their health and their income. This government forced people to make impossible choices between risking contracting COVID by going to work or losing their incomes and staying home like we were all instructed to do to keep ourselves and each other safe. An economic recovery measured solely in terms of how well business is doing will be no recovery at all. An economy is not just numbers cleverly arranged on a spreadsheet. It is not just a series of balance sheets. It is not just the fantasy world of financial markets. The economy is fundamentally about the way our society is organized how resources, power, and the productive and caring work that sustains us are distributed and how that work is compensated. An economy cannot be healthy if it isn't fair and inclusive. If people don't have their basic human needs and rights met, if work isn't meaningful and safe, if people aren't able to be creative and social because they don't have time or can't afford it, an economy is not functional. The Greens reject the fantasy world of the Morrison government, a world in which the Morrison government lives in, a world where money and price are realistic representations of value and sufficient signifiers of the health of an economy. We recognize the vital importance of social labor and care 
and the fundamental necessity of making sure everyone's economic and social needs are met. We deserve to have a government determined to help the country grow out of this public health and economic crisis with a more inclusive, safer, secure economy where every worker can honestly look forward to a brighter future. What we should be doing is reducing insecure work, not entrenching it. We need a genuine process for ensuring casual workers have the opportunity to convert to permanent employment if their work is regular, and if they would like to, to avoid catastrophes like we have seen throughout the pandemic. At the very least, we must ensure casual workers have access to paid pandemic leave. We must ensure that gig economy workers receive the same wages and conditions as any other workers. We must wind back union-busting laws and guarantee the right to strike. We need to shift the balance of power back towards worker, not more in favor of billionaires. And the Greens want minimum wages, terms and conditions in the Fair Work Act, modern awards or enterprise agreements to apply to gig economy workers, and legislated security of work. Instead, the Morrison government wants to take us further down the path of extreme wealth inequality and disempowerment of labor. Because like all the neoliberal zealots that came before them, they have no abiding belief in society or in community. If the Senate passes this bill, it will be buttressing a nihilistic ideology that sees workers not as people, but as wage bills to be minimized and units to be shuffled around to fill shifts and then be discarded. It will send a message to every worker in this country that their lives, their families, and their communities aren't important to this chamber. Workers deserve much better than that. The Greens reject this bill, and the Greens reject this government. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Bragg. Thanks, Madam. Sorry. Thank you, Acting De Sorry. Thank you, Deputy President. Try again. I think after 18 months I get that right. Um, this is an important piece of legislation in the life of this parliament, the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's jobs <coughs> and economic recovery bill. And it, it is, when we come to this topic of industrial relations, an opportunity to hear about the parallel universes which exist around this chamber, uh, where you can hear all the sorts of um, smearing and all the, um, the, the, basically the imputation of corruption, which we hear from uh, the Greens just then, which really is so, such a degrading way to start off a, a debate. Um, now, I understand that people have different views on these matters, but the reality is that uh, these are important issues for working people. They are important issues for Australians. Uh, the way that we calibrate our labour laws, the way that we set up our tax policies, are very important to the lives of people that elect us to these chambers. Uh, and I would like to think that we could have a more mature debate than just hearing people come in here and read out the, the talking points that haven't even been written in this building. I mean, it's quite clear that it, it is vested interests that are writing these talking points uh, for members and for senators, uh, and I think that it's coming in here and reading them out. Now, when it comes down to the, the basic element, you've got a country that has been very successful, the 12th largest economy on earth, with a small domestic population. Uh, you've relied upon foreign capital. You have relied upon trying to get good migrants. You've got an outward disposition. Uh, you've got to be competitive because you are competing for investment. You haven't got enough capital to develop your own country. That is the Australian problem. Uh, capital has been diverted off to the superannuation people and others, and so we have a major issue with our competitive position. Uh, and so that is a that is a starting point for me, because how competitive you are determines how much investment you will get, and then how many jobs you'll be able to create on the back of that investment. I mean, it's 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 pretty simple. And so labour laws are critical. Labour laws are critical. <laughs> Labor laws have got to be competitive. No one owes this country a favour, so you've got to be competitive. You have to create the conditions where organisations, people, businesses are going to invest in this country and create more jobs. 
So when you look at the things that hold back the economy, and I accept that they're politically difficult to change, you tax the way you tax, your tax rates, your labour laws, these are really important things. And so I welcome the fact that our government is pursuing these industrial relations changes. They have come out of a process held in good faith by our government and key stakeholders, employers, unions, third parties. Now, I mean, on this question of unions, because there has been a lot said about this, I mean, this side is not wanting to be hostile towards organised trade unions, but we are concerned about the tendency of organised trade unions to operate in the benefit of themselves, not for the benefit of their stated constituents, the workers. And there has been a tradition of financial schemes, boondoggles, uh, super funds, industry super funds, whatever, in bringing together money taken from workers and spending it on themselves. And that is a major concern. So we want to see good trade unions representing the interests of workers. We want to see the same things on the business side. We want to see good organised business organisations representing the interests of business, focused on the national interest. This is the, this is the challenge we have in this area. And it's the same on labour laws, it's the same on superannuation. It's hard to find organisations that will argue what is the best thing for the nation right now. We're not interested in what's the best thing for capital or the best thing for labour. We're trying to find the best thing for the country as we come out of this economic shock. That is very important. Uh, and so I wish that more would come with clean hands. Now, on the elements, they have come out of this process. The, the, perhaps the major one deals with casuals, and there has been enormous confusion after the, the Rosado case, where there has now been a court decision that effectively says that casuals paid a higher rate of pay uh, can effectively double dip and get the same protections uh, as a, as a full-time worker. Now, we have no problem with flexible work. We have no problem with full-time work. We have no problem with people having uh, legal statutory protections. Uh, but we don't want to see double dipping. And the implication of people coming into this place and arguing against these changes uh, really are quite grave, because the way that the Rosado case has been determined by the courts has meant that there are $39 billion of liability sitting on the, on the balance sheets of these organisations, of, of business in, in Australia. So we have to tidy this up. We have to give, we have to give certainty about what a casual worker is. And there was a, a quote from the Australian Mines and Metals Association CEO Steve Knott last year, where he said in the wake of this judgment, that the precedent set by the federal court in both the Rosado and the Skeen decisions overturned decades of common understanding about casual employment and suggested casuals could have two bites of the cherry. Higher hourly pay rates and entitlements reserved for permanent employees." End quote. Now, this is something that we should fix, and this bill offers, offers a, a pathway. This bill gives casual workers a pathway to permanent employment. That's what it does. And it clarifies, it clarifies what exactly a casual worker is and what a full-time worker is so that businesses can employ people knowing what the laws are. Quite an, quite an important precondition for investment is actually understanding the world in which you're, you're entitled to make an investment. I mean, labour costs, uh, quite rightly, in many sectors are quite high. So clarifying this and giving a clear path to conversion uh, is a welcome welcome reform. On this question of awards flexibility, which is another element, um, we want to see the extension of the coronavirus settings, which allow workers and businesses to agree on more flexibility. I mean, this whole idea that we've got to be trapped and straddled to this Fair Work Commission archaeology forever uh, is going to send us straight to the dark ages. So the idea that that, that workers and businesses are, are banned, can't actually agree on providing more flexibility which suits them, 
I think is very, very troubling. And you have to wonder why would parties come into this place and want to deny individual agency, workplace agency, why? And perhaps we'll find out. Uh, but at the end of the day, we also want to improve underemployment by providing more avenues for people to get more work, which could be delivered through this question of more flexibility. So 30 per cent of retail workers say they want to have access to more work. 40 per cent of food and accommodation workers say they want to have access to more work. And this flexibility, which is proposed in this bill, could deliver that. Now, when we turn to enterprise agreements, I mean, this has got to be one of the, the, the biggest fa failings of the industrial architecture known as the Fair Work Commission framework. Um, so the whole idea is that you've got basic conditions guaranteed in law, the employment standards, and then you've got the awards. Now, that is supposed to be a baseline. That is supposed to provide Australian workers with certainty and protection. And then the whole system was premised on the basis that there would be enterprise bargaining. There would be the opportunity for workers, individually or represented by unions, to bargain with their, <laughs> with their workplaces, with their employers, to go above and beyond, to get a better deal at the workplace level. And that system, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, is dead. Enterprise bargaining in Australia is dead. It is died. And if you don't believe me, I will give you the view of a, a former Fair Work Commission president, Deputy President Peter Richards. So many presidents, it's hard to keep up with all the presidents in this uh, 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 constitutional monarchy, uh, who has said, ironically, collective agreements have become bundles of individual contracts and are simply too transaction risk uh, rich for employers to bother about. Um, but then interestingly, we've got a view from the Australian Council of Trade Union Secretary Sally McManus, uh, who has said uh, in relation to the bargaining system, uh, quite rightly, we can't allow workers' pay or conditions to go backwards through bargaining. Agreed. But bargaining has got to be a better deal, it can't be a worse deal. And Ms McManus goes on to say, we need to fix the bargaining system to give workers more power to win pay rises and improve conditions, not give employers even more options to cut wages. Well, agree, agree, agree. Now, my old boss, Jennifer Westacott, has also said uh, that the boot uh, and the enterprise bargaining system, which is dead, was, quote unquote, a productivity killer. So there you go. You've got the ACTU and the Business Council of Australia all saying this enterprise bargaining system is dead. It is dead. So that means that workers can't get a better deal. So our bill puts forward a proposition that you can get EAs, enterprise agreements, done in 21 days, not three years or 14 decades, as this Fair Work Commission takes to deal with things. Um, so a less technical test will revive enterprise bargaining in Australia, and that would be a good thing for Australian workers. That would be a good thing for business, which ultimately provides 80 or 90 per cent of the private workforce, of the workforce in Australia. We can't all work for the government in this country. Most people work in the real world, and they want to get pay rises. They want to get a better deal than the awards, and enterprise bargaining being dead is hurting workers. So we need to bring enterprise bargaining back to life. And this bill is the only option in town. This is the only chance to bring back enterprise bargaining from the dead, from the crypt. 21 days you could knock off an enterprise agreement if this bill was to pass. The Fair Work Commission uh, thinks it's some sort of a, an emperor over the economy. Well, I, I tell you what, no one elected those people, and we need to legislate to provide that the Fair Work Commission needs to deal with these things swiftly, swiftly, and it needs to take a sensible approach, a principles-based approach, and in making its assessment about are these workers better off or not. And that's a pretty simple test. It will go to their pay, their conditions. It's a pretty simple test, but we need to clarify it because 
enterprise bargaining is dead and that it's hurting workers. This bill will also deal with longer-term agreements. It will provide that there can be eight-year eight -year greenfield agreements uh, when the agreement exceeds an investment of more than $250 million. And I remind the Chamber that, yes, uh, we uh, have this major problem in this country that we don't have enough money to fund our own projects. We don't have enough money, so we rely upon foreign investment. And actually having longer-term agreements means we might get more foreign investment and we might have more jobs. So that is another important reform. And I would say to the, to the Senate that uh, there are serious projects which, which, which would benefit from having longer ter a longer tenure. In my home state of New South Wales, we're currently building uh, the second Sydney airport. And I've got no doubt that projects associated with the Aerotropolis, soon to be known uh, as the suburb of Bradfield, named after the great engineer who designed the Harbour Bridge, uh, would have benefited from these longer-term agreements. Now, finally, I come back to underpayments. So this will turn uh, much stronger laws on in Australia. So you'll look, be looking at four years jail if you underpay your workers, a million dollar fines for individuals. So we're taking this very seriously. Uh, and it, it actually addresses a lot of the issues that have been raised uh, in the Senate inquiry conducted through the Senate References Committee. But like in summary, I mean the whole point here is we want workers to get a better deal. We want more investment in Australia. These are sensible incremental changes which are not based on ideology, they're based on solving problems. They will mean that there will be more jobs as we recover from this pandemic. We will be a more attractive investment destination because people will have certainty that they can employ casual workers, they can have longer deals, they can get an enterprise bargaining agreement through our system, and that is a good thing for Australian workers. Senator Polly. Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australian Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2020. This bill represents the Morrison government's latest industrial relations reform package and their latest attempt to erode the rights of workers and suppress wage growth. Now, Labor has said from the outset that we will only support legislation which not only protects the pay and conditions of workers but rather enhances it and ensures secure jobs with decent pay. Christian Porter may have removed the most extreme parts of this bill, the suspension of the boot for two years, but there is no doubt in my mind that the bill before us makes work less secure and cuts pay. It's also self-defeating because without measures to create more secure jobs with the prospect of a wage rises, workers will have less capacity and confidence to spend, which will in turn suppress demand and hurt the domestic economy. This bill is being introduced at an unprecedented moment in Australian history. Before COVID-19 hit our shores, Wage growth was at its lowest level since the 1930s depression, and now exacerbated by COVID-19, the recession has seen wages stand still standing still, growing really at a mere 0.6 per cent in the December quarter. The CPI rose by 0.9 per cent in this quarter as well. So, any growth has been eligible. There is also a wide consensus amongst academics, unionist economics experts, economists and the Reserve Bank that wage growth must in be incremental in ensuring that we are able to fuel our economic recovery. But this bill will do the opposite. In its briefing note prepared following the introduction of the legislation, the ACT said, and I quote, the bill fails the government's own test. Workers will be worse off. The government's changes will make jobs less secure. They will make it easier for employees to casualise permanent jobs and allow employers to pay workers less than the award safety net. This is the opposite of what the country needs. Now, the working group process was a great idea to get employers, unions and government officials around the table is productive. 
But as indicated in these comments from the ACT, it is clear the bill does not represent a consensus outcome from the working uh, group process. The government has ultimately reverted to type and bowed to the demands of employer groups using the COVID crisis as leverage. As repeatedly said in the public hearings, this is a big business lobby wish list and will come at the expense of working men and women. Despite the government and employer groups' fear campaign around the impact of the recent federal court decision on employers hiring casuals, the bounce back in employment numbers has seen casual jobs accounting for around 60 per cent of all wage jobs created since May, according to the Centre for Future Work. We know casualisation is alive and well in Australia, a country that is becoming increasingly split with the haves and the have-nots because of the Morrison government, because of their policies, because they want to undermine working Australians. They want to cut their wages and their conditions. Their analysis found that between May and November 2020, casual employment grew by 400,000, by far the biggest expansion of casual employment in Australia's history. That's what's happening right now in this country. The permanent addition of flexible work directions is proof that changes to the Fair Work Act introduced temporarily by the Liberal government are never that. This measure was originally introduced as part of the JobKeeper program and limited to employees receiving the wage subsidy. However, since then, it has continued to be expanded in its application well beyond its original intent. That's why you always have to read the fine print anything proposed by this government. But now the bill creates a new definition of a casual employee. Extraordinarily, the government has ignored the years of common law and overturned the recent federal court's decision that upheld the common law definition of what is a casual. The designation of an employee as a casual at the start of their employment determines their ongoing status regardless of their actual work pattern. Under the government's own figures, this involves counselling an estimated $18 to $39 billion in back pay that would have been otherwise owed to casuals. Over the past seven years, under the nose of the Morrison government, there has been a notable trend of increase in the use of subcontractors and labour hire firms. This has been favoured by big multinational companies as its means by which they can cut wages and weaken workers' bargaining position. It also makes it very easy for companies to shift blame and has established a permanent casual rot. And we know the word rot is so heavily reliant on being associated with this government. Now, there's been an epidemic of casualisation and underemployment and casualisation in this country, from the mining industry through to retail and hospitality. This bill goes directly against the common law definition of a casual, undoing 20 years of very careful consideration court authority. What it does do is support big businesses and high labour hire companies. If this bill does pass, it will allow the legitimisation of a permanent casual. The problems of being a permanent casual are widely recognised. Of absence of paid leave and job security makes it difficult for employees to go on holidays and, more importantly, to obtain a mortgage to buy a house. And it also affects those who are trying to rent a home. Housing affordability is already a problem in this country and in particular in my home state of Tasmania. And this bill will make it harder for working families to obtain a mortgage and to get their foot in the door. What else is wrong with the plan? Well, employers must make a written offer of conversion to casual employees after 12 months if for the last six months there's been a regular pattern of work. 
However, as employer does not have to make the offer if there are reasonable grounds not to. Remember I said you're going to watch the fine print from this government? Another example of it. An example would be that the employer has reasonable grounds to think the job might not be there in 12 months. The gap is so wide that it allows employers to not convert. As we've seen from an analysis of the actual nature of casual employment, very little is about flexibility in most cases. Rather, the decision to engage workers as casuals is about creating precarious employment for its own sake. There is no arbitration of disputes other than by agreement. An employee who wants to dispute the decision can only do so by applying to the federal court. The bill introduces a new simplified additional hours agreement. Provision will be initially applied for 12 modern awards. These represent permanent change and are effectively a reduction in the award safety net and not a temporarily COVID-19 measures. Mr Acting Deputy President, this is an agreement between an employer and a part-time employee for the employee to work additional hours with little or no notice without being paid overtime. The new provision applies to employees who work an average 16 hours per week on a roster arrangement or simply 16 hours per week. The longer-term potential impact or the risk of this arrangement becoming normalised is that future part-time jobs will become a standard 16 hours commitment with simplified additional hours being used to top up on a needs basis. This reduces job security and effectively casualise part-time work. Of particular concern to me is the aged care workforce. 88 per cent of aged care workers are employed part-time or casually, and roughly the same percentage are women. And as a frontline workers, the Liberal Party's agenda is a real kick in the guts for all the hard work that they did throughout the pandemic. There is already a chronic understaffing in this sector, and there is reform. This reform will only make it worse. It is hard enough to attract people into the aged care, disability and service industry. This bill will disincentivise workers to come and work in aged care. As it is, workers need to put their lives on hold to make themselves available for that extra work. And if they can't, there is usually retribution. But things like childcare are hard to organise on short notice. It's hard to enjoy your life if you are potentially waiting anxiously to get a call for an extra shift. The Liberals' policy will entrench the permanent casual rot already rampant in this country under their watch. Those sitting opposite have held and a rushed and truncated inquiry to try and push through the legislation by stealth. A major theme of the hearing was that this bill will erode job security in this country. People want certainty in their lives and certainty comes with a permanent job. The Morrison government is doing all that they can to undermine work in this country, to undermine workers, and we on this side will always stand up for Australian workers. This omnibus bill also includes flex flexible work directions that allow an employer to give direction to an employee about their duties and their location of work. This is a two-year provision based on the original JobKeeper stand-down directions that were introduced on the basis they would be temporary and only connected to employees in receipt of JobKeeper. Since then, the provision has been extended to the so-called legacy employers. Now they apply to the 12 modern awards. 
but the minister has the authority to expand the list, thereby exposing all workers. This means for workplaces covered by and identified awards that the special flexibility will be available to every employer who seeks to revive their business if they never qualify for JobKeeper. In its analysis of this legislation, the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, which I chair, has highlighted its concerns of the amount of significant matters in the bill that are set out in delegated legislation. This legislative instrument is not subject to the full range of parliamentary scrutiny, and we questioned why the government is doing this. And it's a habit with legislation under legislation of this government. We need to be able to scrutinise legislation. Now, in regards to the changes in definition of casual employment, the committee has also expressed a long-standing scrutiny concerns about provisions that have the effect of applying retrospectively, as it challenges a basic value of the rule of law that, in general, laws should only operate prospectively. The committee has a particular concern that the legislation will or might have a detrimental impact on individuals. In essence, the bill will casualise permanent employment, restrict unions to intervene for workers who have no representation, reduce scrutiny of enterprise agreements and completely undoes the common law definition of casual employees. It also shifts most of the risk from employer to employee relationships to the employee. If workers have to bear all of the risk, it makes it hard to get certainty. If they don't have certainty, they cannot afford to contribute to our economy and they will not support Australia's jobs and economic recovery. The government has rushed this uh, inquiry. It's rushing this legislation. The minister responsible for this bill is on indefinite leave. We must question the need for this bill, and the peripheral of expert opinion has warned against it. They have warned against it for good reasons, because it is all about undermining Australian workers and casualising the workforce in this country, and it deserves to be defeated. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And it is with great pleasure that I rise to speak in support of these important reforms, because as the Morrison government has demonstrated throughout this pandemic, this government is determined to implement measures that will help business regrow jobs, and they are coming back strongly, with more than 93 per cent of those jobs lost with this once-in-a-century pandemic already being filled by hard-working Australians. We are about boosting wages, enhancing productivity and implementing measures that benefit both employers and employees. But before I go through the reforms in detail, it's worth reflecting on what we've heard from those contributions that I've been listening to very carefully so far. Thus far, I've heard from those opposite on the Labor benches that they didn't turn up to work during the COVID pandemic, when over here on the government benches, the Morrison government was all about protecting lives and livelihoods through a once-in-a-century pandemic. We've also heard hyperbole, unsubstantiated misrepresentation and a misconstrue of, of basic statistics. Uh, Senator Polly referred to the December quarter growth figures. And it is worth reflecting that, uh, as Josh Frydenberg, the Federal Treasurer, has very pleasingly been able to announce to the Australian people in recent days, uh, the December uh, quarter was the second consecutive quarter for the first time since 1959 that the Australian economy has achieved a growth rate of more than 3 per cent. The first time since 1959, Mr Acting Deputy President. So the government's modest, sensible, non-ideological and incremental changes that are contemplated here today are reflective of the cooperative spirit that we so successfully embraced uh, in, in this nation's approach to the pandemic. The Fair Work Amendments uh, address known problems with Labor's Fair Work Act that are currently stifling job creation and wages growth in this country. The changes made will provide certainty to both businesses and employees, clearly defining casual employment and giving casual employees a statutory pathway 
to convert that uh, employment to permanent full-time or permanent part-time employment, should they so choose. I find it staggering that those opposite have suggested here today that defining the nature of employment at the start with clarity for both the employer and the employee is somehow unfair. Nothing could be further from the truth. And at the same time, the Morrison government is providing every worker in Australia who works under a casual employment arrangement a clear, consistent and defined pathway to convert that employment to permanency for the first time, Mr Acting Deputy President. I've also heard claims today about legitimising permanent casual arrangements. I find it staggeringly arrogant and so typical of those opposite that they would seek to tell those Australians who instead choose to work under casual arrangements on an ongoing basis that they can't. It, in fact, it reflects the, uh, the, the, the recent rhetoric out of the Labor Party that they would seek to impose a $153 a week pay cut for those Australians who would lose the 25 per cent casual loading on their earnings. Indeed, we would extend our successful JobKeeper flexibilities around duties and location of work to businesses in the retail and hospitality sectors that were so terribly hit uh, during the course of the pandemic. We give employers greater confidence to offer secure part-time employment, facilitating additional hours of work for part-time employees in the retail and hospitality sectors who want more hours, Mr Acting Deputy President. And for the first time, those hours under these flexibility arrangements would include the leave entitlements and uh, workplace entitlements with respect to unfair dismissal protections that are currently declined to them. Those hours are currently filled by casuals, so basically the Labor and the Greens are entrenching casualisation in the Australian economy by opposing these very sensible reforms. These amendments are the result of thorough and extensive consultation with unions, employers and industry. But sadly, Labor has decided to oppose every single one of these modest, incremental and non-ideological changes. Have we heard yet today a single, a single element of reform that could be improved with a suggestion from those opposite? No, we have not. We have heard mistruths. We've heard misrepresentations and hyperbole. Those, opposite over, uh, sorry, those on the government benches are focused on delivering actual outcomes that put more money into the pockets of Australian workers and take less tax from them. It is Labor and the Greens who currently stand in the way of these needed reforms. Because who do these reforms most impact? Who is Labor and the Greens currently blocking from more wages in their pockets? And it's those casual workers who need flexibility, younger Australians who were hit hardest by the job losses at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, those Australians who are crying out for the ability to work extra hours under flexible arrangements, who desire for the first time the right to convert casual employment to full-time uh, full or permanent part-time work. So apparently it is too much to ask that the Labor Party adopt a mature approach to industrial relations focused on the needs of Australians rather than keeping their union masters happy. We don't live in the fantasy world of the Greens. We live in the real world, where pennies actually earned here rather than raining down from heaven. We're a healthy and wealthy society, and that enables us to focus on the needs of those most disadvantaged in our communities. Indeed. Those, uh, those workers in the gig economy that uh, the, the Greens seem particularly focused on, far from when, when we talk of a, a minimum wage or a floor, imposing those sort of arrangements on those workers imposes a cap on their maximum earning, a cap on those maximum earnings potential. With respect to casual employees, we are fixing Labor's failure to, design, to define casual employees more than a decade ago now by in introducing that clear definition of what it means. It provides certainty around when a person is a casual employee and certainty to both them and their employer as to the rights and obligations that accompany that. The government firmly believes 
that all employees should be classified and paid correctly. Wage theft and exploitation is never acceptable, and we'll turn to the improvements and enhancements that the government seeks to make with respect to uh, in enforcement provisions in a little while. But the ability for some employers, uh, employees rather, to double dip on their entitlements uh, by being uh, paid a casual loading uh, as uh, compensation for not receiving leave entitlements and then being paid those leave entitlements on top of that is grossly unfair, and I think that any objective assessment uh, in the minds of the average Australian would certainly agree. In the event that an ongoing employee is misclassified as casual, the bill will ensure that casual loading amounts paid to that employee can offset against claims for leave and other entitlements, uh, eliminating any potential for double dipping. This potential for double dipping represents a $39 billion liability for Australian business. And we're not just talking about big business and corporations here. We're talking about small and medium enterprises across Australia that are the backbone of the Australian economy. Uh, by opposing these changes, Labor has decided that it is standing in the way of casual employees who want to become full-time employees for the first time. We've heard claims today about an explosion in the level of casual employment across the Australian economy. That is simply false. Since the early 1990s, casual employment arrangements have applied to approximately 25 per cent of the Australian workforce. So let's not cherry-pick from the December quarter just a few months ago. Let's look at the statistics that are borne out over the course of decades. Mr Acting Deputy President. We've heard claims that these reforms are racist and sexist. Frankly, th those sort of claims have no place in a debate that's focused on putting more money into the pockets of hard-working Australians. Has Labor actually read this bill? I wonder, because we've heard claims uh, earlier today that employees would have no right to arbitration in anything other than pursuing action through the federal court, when in fact, instead Employees uh, have protections around the right to convert at 66L, uh, have the detail surrounding the dispute process, including that initiation from a discussion with the employer the whole way through the process at 66M, and uh, the Fair Work Commission have the arbitration process to prevent employers abusing any limitations on the conversion right described at 66H. Under Schedule 2 of the uh, proposed reforms, the government's uh, 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 greater flexibility uh, will actually improve the opportunities for Australians to work more hours in the hardest hit sectors post-COVID. The bill allows those, those workers uh, who together, uh, in those sectors rather, who together employ more than one third of casual employees to work together to agree on additional hours for part-time employees who actually want them. This will increase working hours, wages and encourage employers to offer more permanent secure roles with the benefits paid, uh, including sick leave, over more traditionally flexible arrangements like casual roles. That is what this government is about. Uh, and those opposite, by standing between these reforms uh, and those Australian workers who want them, seek to show their true cause. With respect to enterprise agreements, these enterprise agreements encourage job creation, wage increases and productivity growth. We know this because enterprise agreements on average put 69 per cent extra earnings in the pockets of Australians uh, when compared to the awards that would apply in other cases. We've seen re reports suggesting that Labor sees those employees wanting those higher uh, uh, wages provided by enterprise agreements as merely collateral damage in this fallacious and unsubstantiated war. So much for Labor being on your side, not if you want higher wages, higher productivity, higher flexibility and more control in your own life. To assert that the Fair Work Commission needs to uh, approve in a tick and flick exercise these agreements in 21 days is patently false. The Fair Work Commission very clearly has the ability uh, to extend that approval process uh, where the merits of the application bear that out. But make no mistake, Mr. Mr. Acting Deputy President, 
These reforms don't allow the Fair Work Commission to stand between uh, Australian workers who desire more money in their pockets and an expedited agreement-making process. There's no automatic union involvement in that, but it's not precluded in any way. Should any single Australian uh, entering into a negotiation process appoint a union, then so be it. They're at the bargaining table. But Mr Acting Deputy President, where 9 per cent of the Australian private sector are covered by unions, why on earth would we listen to those opposite to tell the other 90 per cent of Australians that they need to have a union between them and their employer? It's not borne out by the choices that Australians make every day, where they choose to keep their hard-earned money in their pocket or spending it on their families, rather than giving it to the union movement who keep our colleagues in check over here on the opposition benches. From the West Australian perspective, the Greenfields Agreements uh, changes are essential to securing, securing the ongoing sorts uh, of massive infrastructure investment in the resources and energy sectors that we desperately need as we recover from COVID-19. Uh, the maximum period of time that an agreement can run for is eight years. It's not automatically eight years. It is a maximum of eight years and only where it includes a mandated increase in salary annually. What stands between that sort of very positive arrangement that facilitates investment in massive projects, that generates jobs and drives taxation revenue, that pays for the sorts of things that keeps the Greens uh, in this chamber. It is the opposition to these sorts of reforms. Finally, we talked about compliance and enforcement very briefly before. The changes in Schedule 5 introduce stronger protections for employees through measures that not only include tougher penalties and orders to de deter non-compliance, but where non-compliance actually occurs, it gets those wage underpayments recovered and into their pockets sooner. So what stands between that money in their pockets sooner? Again, it is the opposition and the Greens who stand between us, very sensible, incremental and non-ideological reforms. Mr Acting Deputy President, the Morrison government is about jobs and more money in the pockets of Australians. I commend these reforms to the Senate. Senator Sheldon. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. I'm very pleased, to talk, very pleased to talk on the Fair Work Amendment Bill. Look, just before I do that, look, Senator Small, I appreciate that you've given an outline of what's happening in the gig economy, but I might give an outline this morning. Um, at Hungry Panda at 11.30 today, after a series of strikes by those Hungry Panda workers, after the first strike was because there is no minimum wage, they're not getting paid the minimum wage, and the company effectively turned around and took a third of their income off them. So they went on strike. The company's response to that was to terminate a number of people that were held meetings to talk about the abuse that they were receiving at the hands of the company. They had no commission to go to. They had no workers' comp arrangements when they were getting injured and a number of their colleagues had been killed and injured. And you're saying that somehow these people uh, have a capacity under our system to earn higher income and by having regulation you're holding them back. No, your pro proposal is killing them. And I'll say this quite clearly in opposing the bill with the rest of my colleagues. Since the beginning of this pandemic, Labor has set, a consistent, has set a consistent test for legislation proposed by this government. Will it create good, secure, well-paying jobs? It was to protect these jobs that Labor supported the JobKeeper wage subsidy, a program intended to keep workers connected to their employers. But cruelly, the government's implementation of the program excluded thousands of workers at Donata and did nothing to stop Qantas outsourcing thousands of others. Despite this bill's entitle, this bill includes not a single provision that would create secure jobs, increase wages or enable Australia to recover from the economic consequences of COVID-19. Instead, this bill will prolong the worst, most debilitating aspects of Australia's economic landscape by entrenching and further furthering insecure work. It will cripple already sluggish wage growth, and it will fail to deter the rampant wage theft by watering down existing laws in Victoria and Queensland. 
The economics of this bill is simply bad, which makes the, this bill so exceptional, because the economics of recovery is abundantly clear. We know that the labour market is the foundation of the economy. When the foundation is weak and insecure, so too is the economy. When workers are underpaid, they spend less and demand goes down. When they have no choice but insecure employment, they don't spend. And when they have few rights, forced to accept lower pay and lower conditions, consumer confidence is undermined. Instead, we need our, what we need is quality jobs, secure employment and fair pay. These are the conditions of a strong labour market, one that provides consumers the confidence to consume and invest. Now, you cannot bet Australia's economic recovery on a pay cut. You cannot rebuild our labour market on more insecure work. A good economy doesn't drive good jobs. Good jobs drive a good economy. We cannot ignore that when this bill sits in the timeline of government policy, we are 12 days from the end of JobKeeper and with no policy of support in sight. As a Labor dissenting report correctly points out, the government says the economy is doing well enough that business no longer needs JobKeeper. But then they say the economy is doing so badly they need to cut the pay of workers. They can't have it both ways. COVID-19 should have been a wake-up call for Australia's policymakers. Since the 1980s, casual employment has doubled to a quarter of all workers. It has become an industrial norm with grave consequences. And most notably, insecure employment has become a feature of our aged care industry, where the lack of sick leave and workers forced to work across multiple centres becomes a recipe for disaster on the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ms Sherry Clark, an aged care worker for more than 20 years, told her story to the inquiry into this bill. She said, because most of my work, work is so insecure, I can only plan to live on my minimum contracted hours, and a contract of 16 hours per fortnight is not enough to live on. This impacts all aspects of my lifestyle, including health. My budget does not allow me to choose healthy options, and I often miss meals. Paying my car registration or visiting my dentist is a day-to-day -day decision for me. Well, workers in the gig economy are in a similar position, without sick leave to fall back on, without entitlements to use. Workers in the gig economy couldn't afford to isolate and couldn't afford to socially distance. A recent survey of gig workers conducted by the Transport Workers Union of Australia found that riders would be paid as little as $10 an hour that 90 per cent had seen their pay decrease over time and 70 per cent were struggling to pay their bills and buy food. Any government would have seen these issues, heard these stories and said, enough is enough. But no, the Attorney-General and the Minister for Workplace Relations said it was all too complicated to pay people a minimum wage. And of course, Senator Small just reconfirmed this government's view about exploitation. Let it rip, let it keep going, and now they have a bill to encourage it. They could have chosen to reset the trend, fostering a labour market rich in good paying, secure jobs that give workers the sort of confidence and freedom to isolate when needed, to raise a family and get by. Instead, this government looks at insecure work and calls it flexibility. Well, I can could tell you, it's not flexibility when a worker has their wages stolen. It's certainly not flexibility when you have, you have no ability or rights to negotiate a livable wage. It's certainly not flexibility when you're forced to take a second or third job in order to make ends meet. We cannot forget that this bill is just the second act in the government's attack on working people. Firstly was their failed ensuring integrity bill, a bill to attack working people and their representatives, to undermine their ability to argue for higher wages. And of course, fresh from their defeat in the Senate, this government declared a new compact, a new accord with working people. They established, they said, an industrial relations working groups for unions and business to come together and form genuine proposals for reform. 
In the context of COVID-19, the ACTU and its affiliates took this office seriously. They sat down. They laid out issues that needed to be addressed. They even found an area of compromise. The ACTU and BCA, Business Council Australia, hashed out some areas of reform, only to have the other business groups boycott the meetings and the Liberals just abandon the whole process. The bill is this, the bill is this response, a bill to deliver an ideological industrial relations agenda on behalf of the most reactionary of the employer groups, one that paves the way for employees, employers to cut the wages and conditions of workers like Sherry. And how do we know this? Because not a single employer group who appeared at the hearings into the bill could give a guarantee that employees would not be left worse off under this bill. The National Retail Association, when asked, said, I cannot give you that guarantee. The Australian Hotels Association, when asked, replied, no. The Australian Retail Association replied, I don't think we can make any guarantees about reductions. And of course, the Australian Mines and Metals Association replied, it's very hard to answer complex industrial relations matters, matters with a yes or no. There should be nothing complex about whether the legislation will leave workers better off or not. If the industry and business community is so uncertain about the effect on workers, then why are they so supportive of it in the first place? Maybe because they knowingly know what will happen under these laws. You know employers like to talk about complexity a lot. Well, some employers, certainly the ones that are caught for wage theft, and say it's all too hard. Well, they don't seem to have a problem with the complexity of this bill, do they? They operate under the same false assumptions that you can only get economic growth going when wages are lower, when workers are cheaper, when profits are higher. And we know this is for, for what it is, a lie. It's the same lie told by this government sought to, when it sought to remove penalty rates. It made claims that it would create hundreds of thousands of jobs. That noise is still ringing in my ears. That employers unburdened with paying their workers extra for shifts would suddenly take on new staff. And of course, what happened? Nothing. The cut in penalty rates resulted in no more jobs, not a single one. And no industry group, employer group or government has been able to demonstrate that any jobs at all have been created. Instead, according to the McKell Institute, some $2.87 billion in workers' income were ripped from the payslips of workers further undermining con consumption, confidence and demand. This bill will entrench casual employment as a permanent feature of our industrial relations landscape, one in which a worker is not a casual because of the nature of their employment, because, but because of a word inserted in the terms of their contract. And those employees that want to do the right thing will be under the mercy of those that don't do the wrong, that do the wrong thing. But those that want to do the right thing will not be able to bargain in the same places when they're trying to win contracts because of the undermining by those employers that do the wrong thing. And the new norm begins. It ignores the reality of modern work, assumes that employers will never use this definition to exploit worker and seems seeming primarily concerned with overturning the recent work pack decision. A myth perpetrated by this government that the recent decision will see workers double-dipping entitlements and casual loading. This bill's new casual definition is a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. The work pack from the outset said any back pay of annual leave entitlements against any casual loading that was paid. So it, the problem was that the company was calling him a casual employee and not paying him any casual loading. A number of Labor lawyers raised this point during the hearing. The bill proposed a new definition of casual employment would create a pathway for employers to declare a worker a casual on day one and then ignore those conditions for the length of his, their employment. As per capita outlined, it said, at its worst interpretation, the new definition and conversion clause could encourage employers to offer, offer casual employment to all new employees, giving them a year of try-before-you-buy employment for all employees 
regardless of the eventual hours worked. And is this, there is mechanisms to ensure also an employer generally holds this view or is to rectify if it turns out to be incorrect. There's no mechanism. Under this legislation, there is no right to arbitration unless the employer agrees. So here you've got the exploitative employer having to agree that they can turn around and take the matter to arbitration. My goodness, is that the rule of law? As the Law Council of Australia has rightly pointed out, without defined arbitration clauses, there is no absolute power for the Fair Work Commission to settle disputes over the provisions of the bill. Instead, workers have to rely on the ability of the Commission to mediate a dispute. And if the employer doesn't agree, well then tough luck. There is no point having a right unless you have the power to enforce it. This bill's casual conversion rights are just that, rights in name only. Well, the bill will make it easier for employers to cut the paying conditions for their employees through amending a number of existing modern awards, adding new simplified additional hour agreements to 11 awards covering everything from pharmacies to restaurants to meat industry and vehicle repair. And of course, a minimal parliamentary oversight, the minister responsible, the attorney general, can just increase the number of awards to be covered by these provisions. Because it doesn't stop there. The cat is already out of the bag. The Business, Council, the business South Australia has proposed another 11 awards to be amended as such. And it's not just awards they're undercutting, is the entire process of bargaining and agreements and the use of the Fair Work Commission as the rule of law. This bill will shift the burden of proof onto unions when seeking to strike an agreement. They will now have to make the argument that better paying conditions for workers won't stand in the way of the employer's profits. This bill will also absurdly prevent unions from intervening in the proposal of agreements to meet the better off overall test. And one only needs to look at the A1 earth moving mining and civil, which had the CFMEU not sought leave to intervene and prevented its approval, but have seen workers paid as much as $180 a week less than the award. In striking off the approval agreements, you play a fundamental role. This bill would seek to make this much harder. The effect of this will, will lower wages and worse conditions and more wage theft will exist. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'm very pleased to rise today to speak on the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Job and Economic Recovery Bill 2021. Now, this bill has been developed with input from a range of stakeholders, including unions and employers, to ensure that reforms appropriately balanced, providing flexibility and certainty for businesses and important uh, protections for employees. Now, this bill is not ideological. It's not some experiment in economic theory. Rather, it's designed to tear down the barriers to creating jobs. Now, if I was to boil down my aims of coming into this place and being a senator for Western Australia, they could be summarised in this way. I want to see as many Australians as possible get a job and stay in a job for as long as they can and earn as much as possible while being in that job. Now, this is key, whether it's in the metro areas, the regional areas or even our remote areas. This is key to as many Australians achieving as high a standard of living as possible. Now, I've seen firsthand how jobs can change lives. Many on this side of the chamber have experience in creating jobs across all sectors of the economy, and we see that as a good thing, not as some form of exploitation. I've seen the difference firsthand in countless number of lives of people that have been able to get a job, many of them for the very first time. Uh, many of you know, I've spoken about this previously here in the Senate, that prior to coming into parliament I was involved in an organisation called Generation One that uh, worked across Australia to create jobs for Indigenous people, 
for Aboriginal people, whether they're in remote locations, uh, in regional areas or in our cities. And through the work that I was doing, I've seen over 28,000 long-term unemployed uh, Indigenous job seekers take up work in sustainable work. But that wouldn't be possible if those jobs were not there. It wouldn't be possible if we didn't have an environment to create jobs. And I want to see more of these opportunities created. I want to see more of these opportunities to be able to transform and change lives. Now, employment won't change everything, but without it, nothing will change. And if we're going to truly deal with the systemic issue of uh, entrenched welfare dependency, we have to have an environment where the jobs are there so that people can take up those opportunities, so that they can be fulfilled by engaging in a meaningful career, so that they can see the benefit of work not only for themselves but indeed for their families and in many cases right across their whole community. But it's only possible if the jobs are there. And so we engaged with employers as part of this process. We also engaged, the government did, with, uh, with, with, with the unions to hear about how we could actually create the flexibility that was required, to create the right environment that was required to create more jobs and ensure that those jobs are sustainable. To ensure that those jobs are sustainable. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, this is one of many bills which the government is strengthening and is hastening our economic recovery from COVID. Now, at the height of the pandemic, 1.3 million Australians lost their jobs or were stood down on zero hours. Now, you just think about the impact of that. It's a big number, 1.3, but it actually, represents, it actually represents the lives of individuals and families. And this government has been singly focused on ensuring that we do everything that is possible to ensure that those jobs are returned. Now, we've seen remarkable figures uh, throughout this last 12 months in both the decreases in unemployment and the increases in economic activity. In fact, the Treasurer has told us that over 90 per cent of the jobs that were lost due to COVID have been returned. Now, this is due in large part to the underlying strength of our economy before we even went into the pandemic, but it's also due to the support of the economy with measures such as JobKeeper, uh, temporary or targeted increases to JobSeeker, small business cash flow support and the Home Builder program. It's also due, in a large part, to our handling of the health aspects of this pandemic. Australia was the first country in the world to close its borders, international borders. First country in the world to do that, to stem the flow of the virus. The second most important factor in the health area was procuring our own uh, production, sovereign production of a vaccine to help us get out from this situation that we're finding ourselves in. We have managed our way through this, but of course part of the recovery out of this is to ensure that we create the right environment for more and better paid jobs. That's always been the initiative. That has always been the imperative of this government since we were first elected. As more people return to work, our accelerated tax cuts will also have an increasing effect on economic stimulus as well. Over $2 billion a month in extra take-home pay is flowing into the economy due to our accelerated tax cuts. Now, these were implemented long before the pandemic even hit, and thank goodness it was, because it's now having a real impact. It's going to have a real impact on the, the economy and the ability to recover. Now, there is so much more to the economic recovery uh, th and, and reform than just stimulus and tax. One factor which has remained largely untacked, un untouched is the uh, is industrial relations. Now, it's a dangerous area for a Liberal uh, to attempt to uh, ref provide reform, some would say, uh, but courage is required to keep this country on a road of continuous employment. Now, I commend the Industrial Relations Minister for all his work on this bill, as well as his partners in consultation, including the unions, uh, employer groups and experts in the field. The breadth of cooperation achieved is one of the lasting silver linings, if there are any, uh, from COVID. 
And long may this spirit endure, and may the mortal combat that has long been present in this sector end. Now, it's disappointing, extremely disappointing, I've got to say, to hear that the Labor Party is opposing it after such rigorous consultation was undertaken, consultation that was undertaken in good faith. The changes contained within this bill build upon the same cooperative spirit the country so successfully embraced during our approach to the pandemic. We have heard some very dramatic language uh, from, Labor, from the Labor Party, harking back to the Labor Party of old with a worker versus employer mentality. Now, this dramatic language does, just does not fit with the reality of this bill, which is not extreme in any way and in no way represents a drastic departure from the current industrial relations regime, which, which must be said was implemented by the Labor Party when they were last in government. Work choices this is not. We also heard from Senator Faruqi from the Greens describe the unions as expert in industrial relations. Now, that would be akin to describing the Greens as experts in economics. Madam Acting Deputy President, we had hoped that 2021 would see the Labor leader, Mr Albanese, adopt a more mature approach to industrial relations. Sadly, uh, the Labor Party's opposition to all of the government's industrial relations reforms show that they remain fixated not on solving problems but on playing politics and turning workplaces into battlegrounds. This is unacceptable, Madam Deputy President, because this bill will support the government's commitment to Australian jobs and our continuing economic recovery by providing certainty to businesses and employees in relation to casual employment, by giving regular casual employees a statutory pathway to ongoing employment by including a casual conversion employment, uh, entitlement in the national employment standards. Very important reform. By extending temporary JobKeeper flexibilities. Uh, we've got to see by, by giving employers confidence to offer part-time employment and additional hours to employees, by streamlining and improving the enterprise agreement making and approval processes, by ensuring industrial instruments do not transfer when an employee transfers between associated entities at the employer's initiatives. I could go on by providing greater certainty for investors, employers and employees by allowing the nominal life of greenfield agreements made in relation to the construction of major projects to be extended, by strengthening the Fair Work Act uh, compliance and enforcement framework to address wage underpayments. Wage underpayments. Now we hear those opposite uh, 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 rightly point out the, the need to address the issues of wage theft in this country. They rightly point that out. And here is an opportunity to actually do something about it, but because of their ideolo ideology, they stand against it. Businesses must have the confidence to hire and ensure employees receive their correct entitlements. Uh, by in, we also, this bill seeks to uh, introduce measures to support more efficient Fair Work Commission processes. This is important as well. We've uh, as we've shown throughout the pandemic, the government is determined to implement measures that will regrow jobs, that will boost wages, enhance productivity and benefit both employers and employees by providing the best possible outcomes for all. Now let's hear from some of the stakeholders, shall we? The Master Growers Association, in their submission to the inquiry in this bill, submits that unless these reform measures are implemented, our economy will continue to stagnate. Reform in the industrial relations system is imperative. Now, these jobs in that industry, in the retail and the, the grocers, uh, grocers association industry, for many, these are the first jobs that they might get. Now, there's great careers uh, working in, uh, in that sector, but there's also great first jobs. And if we don't create the environment, particularly for young people, which, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President, I know is something that you're also very committed to seeing, is, is young people given the opportunities to get ahead. Now, if we don't have the flexibility, if we don't have the right environment and support, then how can these opportunities be made? We heard from the Chamber of Commerce uh, in their submission on this bill. 
the Chamber of Commerce and Industry in my home state of Western Australia. They submit that modern awards have failed to provide the flexibility to accommodate government restrictions in alternative work arrangements, with limited capacity to obtain timely and meaningful variations through the Fair Work Commission. So the efficiencies in this bill to work with, for the Commission to respond in a timely and efficient way is absolutely essential, and this bill goes to remedy this problem. The Fair Work Ombudsman welcomes the funding announcement uh, announced by the government in this bill, which will provide the support to the Ombudsman's role in achieving better workplace compliance. The Australian Industry Group points out in its submission to the bill that over 80 per cent of casuals do not work for large corporations. Now, this is the belo beloved bogeyman of those opposite, that large, the big bad large employers are here to, and they're, they're these big bad evil people. But the reality is that, that over 80 per cent of, uh, uh, of these many jobs are actually with uh, small and medium enterprises. Now they submit that the current cost risks are threatening to drive many small businesses into insolvency and threatening to destroy the livelihood of a large number of small business owners. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, let's not forget that much of this bill would not be necessary were it not for Labor's complete failure to legislate competently in this space. We are fixing Labor's mess. To dis and, their, and their inability to define casual employees a decade ago by introducing a clear definition of what it means to be a casual employee. Now, the lack of wage growth bemoaned by many uh, is in fact occurring under an industrial relations regime that those opposite in fact put in, sell, uh, put in place. It really beggars belief. Now, before I close, before I close, I want to touch on the provision of this bill relating to compliance and enforcement. Now, it will better protect employees from wage theft. It will deter dishonest employers from undercutting their competitors by introducing tougher penalties and facilitate a more efficient recovery of wage underpayments and encourage businesses to identify and address underpayments more quickly. But we're seeing Labor oppose this. What a shame. What a travesty. So much for being the party of workers. Well, they gave that up decades ago. We will introduce stronger protections for employees through measures including tougher penalties and orders to deter non-compliance. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, this bill will put downward pressure on unemployment. It will work to simplify awards, make it easier to recover unpaid wages, and it will codify a pathway for casuals to transition to permanent employment. All of these things will benefit the Australian economy and Australian workers, despite those uh, Order, certificating opposite. Sullivan, your time's I commend this bill. Senator Urquhart. I rise to speak on the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2021. But to be frank, I find that phrase, supporting Australia's jobs and economic recovery, used in relation to this bill, this bill which is deep and hypocritical betrayal of working Australians, profoundly offensive. Because this bill does nothing to support secure jobs and it does nothing to support the long-term economy. More than ever, working Australians know that you can't trust Scott Morrison, the Liberals, the Nationals with their wages and conditions. During COVID-19, we witnessed extraordinary service and sacrifice from our essential workers, coupled with a realisation that an essential worker extends beyond those who protect our health and rescue us from natural disasters. They are cleaners, truck drivers, security guards, aged care workers, public servants and workers in our ports. They deliver food, they care for us, they protect our borders, they make sure that we get our support payments, unload ships, stack shelves, keep us safe, all the while taking risks with their own safety. And yet, as we emerge from this pandemic, our essential workers are being rewarded for their dedication and sacrifice with a deep betrayal from the Morrison government with this bill which purports to supporting Australia's job and economic recovery, which but is absolutely intent on reigniting the industrial relations wars that Australians are so very tired of. Hundreds of thousands of workers experience the brutal reality of insecure work 
during the worst of this pandemic, stood down or losing their jobs without compensation. Others, in self-isolation or in quarantine, with no paid leave, struggled without income. Aged care workers, cleaners, hospital staff and security workers who were holding down multiple casual jobs to make ends meet faced extreme pressure to restrict themselves to one workplace, with little or no financial compensation, and not to mention the travel agents who help bring people home, get their money back and assist them in so many ways. The whole experience taught us a great deal about the value of having a secure job. We know now more than ever that we need more jobs, not less. In April 2020, uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison declared, we're all in this together and we've got to put down our weapons. It is now quite clear that he has picked up those weapons in the form of this industrial relations bill, claiming it is necessary to support economic recovery. That claim is rubbish. We need only remember the disaster of the Howard government's work choices experiment back in 2006 and 2007 to hear alarm bells ringing. The Fair Work Amendment Bill supporting Australia's jobs and economic recovery scraped through the House of Representatives and is now with us in this place and we are faced with all its ugliness and naked ideology. It is a grubby sellout that will not protect workers or provide secure jobs. It will not lead to economic recovery. It creates a pathway for employers to cut pay. It wipes out back pay claims for misclassified casuals and proposes new so-called flexibility for part-time workers to pick up shifts without overtime rates. This bill would allow part-time employees covered by awards in the retail, food and accommodation industries to work extra shifts at ordinary rates. This has been referred to as part-time flexibility, but in truth it's casual employment by another name and allowing extra work without paid overtime that will cut take-home pay. Basically, it will allow employers to use part-time workers as yet another form of casual labour. And what about creating sec secure full-time jobs? Why would anyone hire an employee in a full-time secure job when they can hire them as a part-time worker for, say, 16 hours a week and then just demand that they work extra hours on a business needs basis at no extra cost or penalty to the business. Under this bill, any job can be casual so long as a worker is desperate enough to accept it. This will feed the further spread of insecure employment without paid leave entitlements. In terms of a pandemic, a significant group of public health experts from the Australian National University have called these IR changes an immediate threat to public health. A significant threat to public health. I urge every member to let that sink in for a moment. Casuals with no sick leave have already borne the brunt of this pandemic. And now the government is shamelessly attempting to legislate to have as many casual workers as possible. In reality, the changes in both part-time and casual employment rules will discourage new hiring. If existing employees can be flexibly required to cover overtime shifts without uh, costing employers any extra, why would they hire anyone else? This IR bill has been spruiked by two hollow men, our Prime Minister and his Attorney-General, Christian Porter. It's being sold to us as a trigger for post-pandemic job creation. This claim is as hollow as they are. This government cannot accept that the best way to ensure economic recovery is making sure that workers have a secure job, a regular pay packet, paid leave and fair superannuation to allow them dignity in retirement. Our economy will be buoyed by workers spending their pay, taking holidays and getting home loans, not by cutting wages and job security. The Liberal government is back to its old ways, once again declaring war on working people and using the pandemic as an excuse to scapegoat unions, casualise more jobs, drive down wages and fatten profits. To add insult to injury, they are now attempting to freeze the next rise in the superannuation levy. 
ACTU Secretary Sally McManus pretty much summed it up when she said, you can't heal the economy by, working, uh, by hurting working people. Since the Prime Minister won't listen to sound economic argument, perhaps we could get Jenny to talk to him about it. Let us just consider the possible working life of a young person moving into work in 2021. Their first job in their teenage years, usually a casual one, and casual at that time in life is probably what suits them, best as they juggle study and all the changes and decisions of those formative years. But this government would have that worker look forward to a lifetime of casual work. This bill entrenches casualisation. It makes it easier for employers to make you a casual worker when you don't want to be and gives you no effective right to challenge an employer's decision to block your conversion to permanent work. So a few years later, when this worker is keen to buy their first house, no home loan, because banks don't like lending money to casuals. So there they are, stuck in a rent cycle in a world of escalating rents and house prices. If pandemic or economic disaster hits, their casual job is most likely to disappear. Maybe then they decide that they're ready to start a family. What's the prospect of them having a decent amount of paid parental leave as a casual worker? Well, it'd be very, very low. And after that, maybe they decide to return to work on a part-time basis to balance family and caring responsibilities. Well, under the changes this bill proposes, they can be pressured to work endless amounts of overtime but not be paid overtime rates. Let's say they end up in a workplace where there's an enterprise agreement. Under this bill, their employer won't have to tell that worker they have started bargaining that agreement for a whole month, won't have to give that worker a comprehensive explanation of the agreement that they will be voting on. If that worker is younger, has lower level English skills or is unrepresented, their, work, their employers will no longer have to explain that agreement to them. And to add up insult to injury, unions will not be allowed to assist the Fair Work Commission in assessing non-union agreements, and the Commission will be forced to tick and flick agreements under severe time pressure. There is no reasonable argument that this bill is good for economic recovery, job creation or economic growth. We do not know, but will know very soon, how each member of the crossbench will vote on this bill. However, I understand that it is highly likely that the future security and prosperity of every Australian worker may soon rest on the shoulders of one senator, one member of the crossbench. I hope that every member of this chamber is thinking right now of the millions of Australian working people that this bill will affect, possibly for their whole working life. We live in a democracy, and if we live in a democracy, then the abiding interests of those working Australians, their families, their children, must be our guiding light. And this government has no mandate, absolutely no mandate, from the Australian people to make these changes. It hasn't taken these profound, life-changing reforms to an election. It hasn't commissioned rigorous economic modelling, or if it has, it hasn't shown it to us. And it hasn't consulted as an honest broker with working Australians. No. It has slithered through the last seven years, keeping its precious workplace reforms close to its chest, waiting for its moment, swearing black and blue that there will be no return to work choices, and waiting, waiting until we're in a pandemic, waiting until people are desperately worried about their economic future, and then quietly laying out the same old playing cards on the table. There is simply no case, no substantive argument to change the nature of casual work, to steal overtime from part-time workers, to undermine the enterprise bargaining process so that workers can be left completely in the dark about the agreement they are to be employed under at critical times in the negotiation process. There is no case for these grubby changes. But it's the Liberal, what the Liberals always do. Cutting Australia's pay is in their DNA. Their vision for Australia is one where millions of Australians struggle to pay the bills and take care of their family, where millions of Australians are left behind. And for any one man or woman, one Australian among millions, 
one sitting on a very comfortable senator's salary with excellent superannuation, to think he or she is even beholden to negotiate on this grubby agenda for any one individual to even think making such a profound decision about the future of work in Australia should sit on one set of shoulders should be untenable. The only way in that position can go is to say no. It is not my place. I do not represent the millions of Australian workers now and into the future that this will affect. I cannot possibly own a decision that affects so many for so little reason. We know Labor understands that Australians want jobs you can rely on, jobs you can buy a house on, jobs you can raise a family on, jobs that pay the bills, jobs that don't disappear overnight when disease breaks out. And I urge all members of this chamber to think deeply on that, to pause and reflect very deeply on the weight that may well be sitting on one set of shoulders, an inappropriate weight a decision that sh should not be one person's to make, a weight that should be and must be cast aside. Australians who work at their jobs should be rewarded, not have their pay and hours cut. Australians work hard at their Order. jobs. Senator Urquhart, you will be in continuation on the resumption oh. of debate. Questions without notice. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr uh, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. This morning, speaking about COVID vaccines, Senator Canavan called for the Morrison government to, and I quote, suspend the rollout here in Australia. Does Senator Canavan's position represent the government's position? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President, and thank uh, Senator for his question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator Canavan's position does not represent the government's position. I mean, I, I acknowledge, I acknowledge the comments Order. from Senator Canavan, uh, Mr. President, and I acknowledge his right to have a perspective, to have a view on these things, Mr. President. I, I acknowledge his his perspective, but Mr. President, as we have done, as we have done all the way Order. through this pandemic, all the way as we have done all the way through this pandemic, Mr. President, we. Mr. President, are taking the health advice with respect to the vaccine rollout, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, over recent days, with respect to the concerns that have been raised and the suspension of the vaccination rollout in a number of countries in Europe, uh, our health agencies, particularly the TGA, have been in close contact with those agencies. Uh, those agencies in Europe uh, to, understand what is, to understand what is occurring, Mr. President, and also, Mr. President, to assure ourselves that the vaccination rollout is safe to continue with, Mr. President. And the TGA has issued a statement to that effect uh, to indicate that the, the uh, vaccination rollout is safe to continue with. Uh, the uh, Mr. President, the uh, ATAGI has issued a statement with respect to the rollout that it is uh, safe to continue with, and Mr. President, as has the Chief Medical Officer, who has issued a statement with relation to the safety of the rollout. Mr. President, so we will continue. We will continue to act on the health of health advice. Order, Senator Colbert, uh, in the time safe for the answer the has expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This morning, the Treasurer rejected Senator Canavan's calls to suspend the rollout, saying, and I quote, they have now not found any causal link between the vaccine and blood clots. Yet 10 minutes ago, Senator Canavan doubled down on his comments in a tweet. Who are the Australian people supposed to believe, Treasurer Frydenberg or Senator Canavan? Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. I would urge the, Tas the Australian people, the Tasmanian people too, the Australian Order. people to follow the advice that's been given to us by our world-leading health agencies, the TGA, one of the best agencies of its kind in the world. And I would urge the Australian people to follow that advice, Order. Mr. President. I would urge the Australian people Order. to follow the advice of the 
Chief Medical Officer, Professor Senator Watt. Kelly. And I would urge the Australian people to follow the advice Senator Watt. of ATAGI, Mr. President. So all of these agencies, uh, including the Chief Medical Officer, have issued statement saying that there has been no causal link found between blood clotting and uh, the vaccine, uh, and that it is safe to continue with the rollout, Mr. President. The, the, all of those agencies are in close contact Order, with Senator their sister Colbeck. agencies in Europe. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Senator Canavan's comments risk undermining confidence in Australia's health regulators. It would appear Senator Abetz might agree. And in the rollout of the, of the COVID-19 vaccination program, has this minister, the Minister for Health or the Prime Minister, addressed with Senator Canavan the comments he made this morning? And if not, why not? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr President, uh, I am aware of a conversation between uh, the Prime Minister and uh, the uh, Health Minister and Min uh, Senator Canavan uh, during a forum this morning where this matter was debated. Uh, so, Mr President, the views of the Prime Minister and the Health Minister are well known. Are well known, Mr. President, to Senator Canavan. And Mr. President, I would urge, I would Order. urge, Mr. President, the Australian Order. people to take the world-leading advice, the world-leading advice of the TGA, ATAGI, and the CMO, Mr. President. I would urge the Australian people to follow that advice. In fact, I would urge all my colleagues to follow that advice, because that is the thing that will remain retain confidence in the rollout of the Order vaccine in this left. country, which is Order. so important to us from a health perspective, it's so important to us from an economic perspective, that we continue Order. to safely roll out the vaccine in this country in the support of all Australians. Order. Before I order on my left, before I come to you, Senator Patterson, I'd like to draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of the Ambassador of Japan to Australia, His Excellency Mr Yamagami Shingo. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the parliament and in particular to the Senate. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. And my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on Australia's participation in the Quad Leaders Summit? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. Qu Mr. President, and uh, thanks, Senator Patterson, for his question. It is timely indeed that His Excellency is in the uh, gallery today for uh, for this uh, question. Uh, because, Mr. President, on Saturday, I was uh, pleased to join the Prime Minister for the first Quad Leaders meeting, which followed the third Quad Foreign Ministers meeting in February. The Quad brings together four like-minded democracies: Australia. India, Japan and the United States, united by a shared vision for a free, open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific region. The Leaders' Summit was an historic moment that reinforces our support for a sovereign, resilient and stable Indo-Pacific. President Biden, Prime Ministers Morrison, Modi and Suga have set an ambitious, practical and positive agenda for key regional priorities. As the Prime Minister said at the beginning of the summit, history teaches us that when nations engage together in a partnership of strategic trust, of common hope and shared values, much can be achieved. This supports Australia's strategic interests, reflecting our belief in a region governed by rules, not by power. Through the Quad, Australia works with our close partners to support a region based on sovereignty and respect for international law. The Quad complements Australia's engagement in ASEAN-led, ASEAN-centred architecture and other bilateral, regional and multilateral groupings. All four Quad countries are strongly committed to ASEAN centrality as well as the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific and to working with regional Order. partners to ensure a prosperous and secure region. Australia looks to our friends in achieving these goals, but Mr. President, we don't leave it to our friends. As our response to COVID-19 demonstrates, Order, our, Australia Payne, will do our time share of for the, the lifting. Answer has expired. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how is Australia working with our key partners to secure and distribute COVID-19 vaccines in the Pacific and Southeast Asia? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. And in the spirit, indeed, of our important response to the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, 
Quad leaders launched a landmark partnership on Saturday to support our region's recovery from COVID-19. Together, we're taking action to expand safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing and delivery in 2021. Reflecting our respective strengths, our investments will ramp up vaccine manufacturing capacity, fund the procurement and distribution of vaccines and provide last-mile delivery support. Building on the government's existing commitment of a $523 million uh, regional vaccine access and health security program, Australia has pledged an additional $100 million to be allocated in consultation between Quad partners. Wherever possible, Quad partners will take opportunities to implement joint or closely coordinated programs of support for our partner countries in the Indo-Pacific, with a particular focus Order, on Southeast Senator Asia. Payne. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how will the Quad framework assist to deepen Australia's cooperation with India, Japan and the US on key emerging issues in our region? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I want to note, Mr. President, that uh, Quad leaders, in particular, underscored that climate change is a global priority and, of course, a risk to Indo-Pacific resilience. We have established a new cl Quad climate working group to strengthen climate action and advance the low emissions technology required to achieve net zero emissions as soon as possible. We have also established a critical and emerging technology working group. Recognising that a free, open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific requires that critical technology is governed according At to shared of the interests and values. That builds on the Quad's existing agenda, agreed by foreign ministers at our own meeting in Tokyo last October. And that agenda includes cooperation on maritime security, on infrastructure, on supply chain resilience, on counter-terrorism, on cyber and on countering disinformation. I particularly look forward to taking forward this important work with my counterparts, Indian External Affairs Minister Joshanka, Japanese Foreign Minister Order. Motegi Senator and US Payne, Secretary of State Blinken. Answer has expired. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. On the treatment of women in the parliament, the Minister for Women has said, and I quote, the only way it will change is if we, as parliamentarians, own the problems own the failings and make the necessary changes. Attorney General Porter has sat on the Respect at Work report for a year, responding to only three of the 55 recommendations. Will the Minister for Women call on the Attorney General to own his failings and make the necessary changes to implement the remaining 52 recommendations one year on? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, the government has taken a number of steps to address a uh, component of the recommendations addressed to the Commonwealth. Those Order. recommendations were outlined in the Women's Economic Security Statement processed through the budget, Mr President, and the government is actively considering the remaining recommendations in detail with a view to con continuing to implement that response as soon as possible this year. I want to acknowledge the work that's being done by Senator the Hon. Amanda Stoker, the new Assistant yeah. Minister yeah. to the Attorney General. Uh, in that regard. Of course, Mr President, Order. additionally, Safe Work Australia has been doing very important work in this, in this uh, space, including by releasing its sexual harassment in the workplace guidance earlier this year. Uh, I would also, Mr President, um, uh, refer to the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's uh, words in relation uh, to the report, uh, acknowledging, and as I did in fact in a question asked of me recently also, that COVID did along with a number of, in, a number of matters Order. before government at the time, did have an impact on this process, that a number of the key recommendations have been funded, in particular looking at the next survey, uh, getting together the Workplace Sexual Harassment Council and some education and training resources. I do want to note, Mr Order. President, and those opposite seek to ignore this, but I do think it is actually important to acknowledge that as a, as a report about workplaces, the um, report's recommendations are not limited to government alone. While the government naturally has had to direct its resources to immediate priorities, I think the Commissioner has also been encouraged in the level of influence she's seeing the report have in workplaces, uh, the main subject of its concern over the past year. And I said in response to a question last week, and Order. I'm not sure 
from Senator whom Keneally. that question came, Mr. President, but I did say in response to a question last week or the week before that Senator the report Keneally. also involves other governments, Mr. President, plus business in particular, and a number of agencies, including Safe Work that I've already referred to, Fair Work Australia. Order. It Senator is not Payne. an entirely government, Time for the Commonwealth answer government led report. Has expired. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. Does the Minister for Women consider it appropriate that the Attorney General Mr Porter, remain the Cabinet Minister responsible for the Respect at Work report. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, the Attorney General, who is, uh, uh, who is currently on a period of leave, the Acting Attorney General, Minister Cash, uh, here in this chamber, the Attorney General has outlined uh, very clearly his position in relation to uh, the issues to which Senator McAllister alludes. Mr President, this country operates on the basis of the rule of law and the presumption of innocence. And it is not possible Order. to be selective Order. about to whom that should and should not apply. The Attorney-General has initiated certain proceedings of his Pratt. own motion in relation to a number Senators of these matters. And Watt. I would also note, um, Mr President, as I have Order. said in this chamber pre Watt. previously and as I have made clear again today, that in relation to the Respect at Work report, that work is being carried out by the newly appointed uh, Assistant Minister, Senator the Honourable Amanda Stoker. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. In both of her answers to date and previously when asked about this report, this minister has deferred responsibility to the junior Assisting Minister, Senator Stoker. Will the Minister for Women listen to Australian women step up and take responsibility for doing her bit to ensure that the 55 recommendations are finally implemented? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. There's a number of issues uh, that have been raised, including through um, the terms of the uh, uh, petition presented to the parliament yesterday, uh, and they did uh, support the adoption of the 55 recommendation in the Human Rights Commission's Respect at Work report. I've already indicated that those are being considered, Mr. President, through the appropriate portfolio minister, actually, Mr. President. And in terms of uh, of, it, of recommendations that Order. I was able to address, Minister. Those recommendations were addressed, left. including with funding, in the Women's Economic Security Statement in October last year. Uh, so the uh, full response, as I said, it will be brought forward by the Assistant Minister to the Attorney General, Senator Stoker. But there's a number of recommendations, Mr. President. For example, the ratification of the ILO's Convention on Eliminating Violence and Harassment in the World of Work. Well, if you knew anything about the implementation of such matters, Senator Keeley, then you would know that the government's approach Order, to ratifying Senator treaties Payne. is Order, now, Senator Payne. now consistent Time for the with answer us. Has expired. Order. I was struggling to hear the minister during that answer. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday marked the two-year anniversary of the far-right terrorist attack in Christchurch, New Zealand, when an Australian man killed 51 innocent Muslims. On 9th December 2020, following the publication of the New Zealand Royal Commission report, I asked you, Minister, whether the Prime Minister had read the report and how the government intended to respond to it. You gave me a commitment that the government will examine the report thoroughly, all 44 of its recommendations, engage with the New Zealand government on how it is implementing the recommendations and consider any and all implications for the operation of our own counter-terrorism policies and practices. More than three months have passed, Minister. Has the Prime Minister read the report? Has the government spoken with the New Zealand counterparts about it? And when will the Australian government respond to the report? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr. President. Well, the very important work that Senator Faruqi identifies in terms of the response to right-wing extremism, uh, to extremism in all its forms where it poses a threat uh, to the safety or social cohesion uh, of Australia, uh, is an ongoing piece of work that our government has taken seriously for many years and continues to take very seriously, including in relation to learning the lessons from the tragic Christchurch massacre uh, and learning from the elements of the New Zealand report and investigations that are relevant to Australia. Uh, and our government agencies, in relation to their responses and the advice that they will provide as to what further or additional 
steps need to be taken in Australia, uh, will absolutely draw upon uh, that work uh, as we draw upon all expert evidence in relation to such important matters. Uh, just in the, uh, the last budget, uh, our government provided a further $571 million over the next five years to our security agencies to keep Australians safe. These are the security agencies that Senator Faruqi rightly quotes in terms of having identified areas of rise in right-wing extremism that we need to confront, uh, as well as having identified other areas of extremism that we need to confront. These agencies, ASIO in particular, has the highest level of funding in its 70-year history. And this year's budget, uh, our government uh, has invested and continues to invest some $300 million to enhance the AFP's capacity to respond to emerging threats. There's no place in our community, no place in our community, for any group or individual order. who seeks Senator to promote Birmingham, disharmony. I've got Senator Faruqi on a point of order. Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr. President, point of order is to relevance. I really ask specifically about the New Zealand Royal Commission report. Has the Prime Minister read it, and when will the government respond? Um, I, I, you, that was definitely the final part of your question, Senator Faruqi. It was a long question. Um, I've allowed you to remind the Minister of that. Um, the Minister has 14 seconds remaining. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. The New Zealand report was not a report to the Australian government, but it is a valued input in terms of an additional source of information that will inform the continued investment and policy making our government makes in relation to these important issues. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, government MPs have repeatedly sought to draw false equivalences between right-wing and left-wing extremism. In its recent submission to the PJCIS inquiry into extremism, ASIO states that the threat from extreme right-wing groups has increased, with groups being more organized and sophisticated than before. Conversely, on left-wing extremism, ASIO states that it is not currently prominent in Australia. Will government MPs stop drawing false equivalences between extreme right-wing and left-wing groups? The question has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, the laws, the policy, the funding, the operation of our security agencies are ideologically agnostic. Whether extremism is right-wing extremism, whether it is religiously motivated extremism, whatever the cause of such extremism, we focus very clearly on dealing with those Order. threats, dealing with the potential criminality, dealing with the risks to Australia. Prevention initiatives that are supported across the country in terms of tackling areas of extremist ideology. Now, I'll take Senator Keneally's intervention. The ideology matters in relation to dealing with the threats and seeking to minimise them, but there is not a singular ideology that poses a threat uh, to Australia. Uh, if you sit down and ask our Order. security agencies, they will tell you that, Senator Keneally. The threats of religious extremism, the threats of right-wing extremism Order. remain Senator very Birmingham, real, very significant the and expired. are expired. Senator Keneally, Sen Senator Keneally, Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, will the government condemn far-right extremism without equivocation? Yes or no? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, as I have done before in this chamber, I condemn right-wing right extremism without any qualification. I condemn religious extremism without any qualification. I condemn all forms of extremism that pose threat or violence or undermine safety without any form of qualification. I acknowledge absolutely the work of ASIO, as I have done in this chamber before, and it is as a result of the record funding and investment and legislative approaches this government has put in place that agencies like ASIO have been in a position to identify those threats, to work to respond to those threats, and that we will continue to support them without any qualification and without any bias towards the threats that are posed to Australia to make sure that they are empowered to continue to do so. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to Minister Hume, representing the Minister for Communications. The pandemic crisis has been a time of heightened stress, anxiety and depression, and has worsened gambling addiction in vulnerable Australians. Online bookies have made a killing during the pandemic. 
In Australia, credit cards can be used when gambling online, but credit cards cannot be used offline in a licensed gambling venue or casino. The UK banned the use of credit cards for both online and offline betting in April last year, recognising that this will significantly reduce the extent of harm to vulnerable people. Why does the Morrison government still allow online betting with credit cards and not legislate to ban the practice as the UK has done? The Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure and the Arts, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Griff, for your question and for your ongoing commitment to vulnerable Australians, in particular in areas of problem gambling. Uh, you're correct. Uh, uh, last year, the UK uh, have banned gamblers um, from using credit cards to pay for bets, and that's for both online and offline gambling. And it also applies to, uh, to e-wallets, which is a new pattern that we're seeing emerging in paying for online betting. Uh, in the name of consumer protection, that's been particularly because of evidence and anecdote of uh, online gambling has increased throughout uh, the period of coronavirus in the UK, and there's also anecdotal evidence that that has occurred in Australia as well. Now, as you'd know, regulation of gambling and gaming is predominantly a state-based responsibility. However, the government is always interested to learn what's being done in other jurisdictions to protect vulnerable communities. And there's no doubt that digital technologies uh, like e-wallets are rapidly changing the way that people choose to gamble. In November 2018, the coalition government, in conjunction with state and territory governments, launched the National Consumer Protection Framework for online wagering in Australia to provide much stronger consumer protections for Australians who are gambling online. And they included things like prohibition of online wagering services from offering credit, uh, to providing credit to people who gamble on their site or on an app. It included things like prohibition of use of payday lenders uh, for online betting. It required customer verification requirements, restrictions on inducement and account closures, including voluntary opt-out pre-commitment schemes, activity statements and Order. consistent gambling messages, as well as staff training and the National Inclusion Register. Now, the Commonwealth will be responsible for implementing measures such as this new online national self-exclusion register, which allows people to self-exclude from all online Order. wagering Senator sites Hume, and apps time in one the answer way. has expired. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, you are correct with gambling falling under states, but credit cards fall under federal, so that's where uh, it's appropriate that it's dealt with here. Now, last year I introduced legislation to ban the use of credit cards for online gambling. I wrote to the Minister for Communications on the issue, and his response was, and I'll quote, the implementation of a ban on the use of credit cards to deposit funds into online wagering accounts is not currently within the scope of the Morrison government's online gambling reforms. End of quote. Why is such a reform not Order, within the scope? Senator Griff. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President, and again, thank you, Senator Griff. I can say to you that uh, in December 2019, the Australian Bankers Association, the ABA, released a consultation paper seeking the views of the public on exactly this issue, the use of credit cards in gambling, and submissions to that process closed in March last year. Now, Minister Fletcher and Minister Rustin, as the relevant ministers, uh, are due to meet with the ABA on this very issue in the coming weeks. As I said before, the state and territory governments have the primary responsibility for the regulation and licensing of providers and the premises also in which uh, gambling products are available. And the government will continue to monitor this issue to determine whether government intervention is required. However, in the meantime, the National Self-Exclusion Register is just one measure of the national framework for which the Commonwealth Government is responsible. And Self-exclusion is a consumer protection tool aimed at individuals who are at risk of or who are already experiencing significant levels of harm from online wagering. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Coalition MP Andrew Wallace has recently advocated for a ban on the use of credit cards for online bets and met with major banks who are all apparently, and I'll quote, in furious agreement that action is needed. And in fact, in the story of a week ago, uh, the ANZ Bank is uh, quoted as being 100% um, uh, in agreement. Has the government met with any particular bank on this issue? And you did state that uh, you were also meeting with the ABA. And what action Order. has been taken? Senator Griff, Senator Hume. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Griff, I personally haven't met with any bank on this particular issue, but as we said, Senator Fletcher and uh, Minister Fletcher and Minister Rustin will be meeting with the a ABA, who represent the banks collectively, and will be discussing this issue further. In the meantime, the National Self-Exclusion Register, as I said, is only one measure. In 2019, legislation passed in this very place to enable the establishment of that register, and the register will allow those who are experiencing gambling harm to immediately exclude themselves from the service services that are offered by all interactive wagering service providers with the click of one button. So the implementation of this register is very much on track. The request for tender is currently underway to select an organisation to operate that register. And although many individual Australian interactive gambling providers currently offer consumers the option to exclude themselves from opening an account with that particular provider, there is no national self-exclusion system available that applies to all providers, so this is a significant leap forward. Senator Keneally. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. In reflecting on the tens of thousands of women who marched for justice across the country, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, not far from here, such marches, even now, are being met with bullets. This morning, the Minister for Women said the observation was, and I quote, an important one. Is the Minister for Women really endorsing the Prime Minister when he tells Australian women they should feel lucky that they weren't shot? Order. I'll call the Minister when they I'll call the Minister when I have the opportunity to hear her. The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Order. Order across the chamber. Reset the clock and I'll commence it when I call the minister again. Order. Order. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. In a democracy, Order. in a democracy like Australia, in a democracy like Australia, Mr. President, there are a number of rights, responsibilities, and privileges that I think many, many Australians overwhelmingly treasure and value. One Order. of those, Mr President, is the opportunity to protest peaceful demonstrations and peaceful exercises like the one that was undertaken yesterday. Unfortunately, Mr President, there are too many countries around the world where those privileges, those rights are not extended. Too many countries Order. where democratic values that underpin Senator our Keneally, democratic Senator system Pratt. are not extended to Order. many, many Sorry, Senator people. Payne, I'm, going to ask you to I'm going to ask senators that when I do use their names to at least have some break before they start breaching standing orders again. Senator Payne. Those democratic values, Mr President, are not extended to their populations. And in that regard, Australia is a fortunate country. Not very far from here, Mr President, in a number of places around and in a number Order. of places around the world where we have seen recent activities of protest and demonstration, we have seen those met by violence from authorities. Order. And Senator in that Pratt. case, Mr. President, the values of the Australian democracy should be at the forefront of all of our minds. Yeah. Yeah. Order. Senator Keneally, I Thank you, Mr. Question. President. Even Senator Rennick, on the minister's own side, said that the Minister for Women should have attended yesterday's march for justice. Is Senator Rennick wrong? And does the Minister for Women stand by her decision not to attend the March for Justice yesterday? Senator Payne. Senator Watt. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I uh, answered that question in here yesterday. I answered that question again last night, and I answered it again this morning. And frankly, Mr. President, uh, I want to reiterate the offer of the Prime Minister that still stands to meet with the organisers of yesterday's protest and order. rally. It's Senator, an offer that Senator the Prime Payne, Minister I have continues Senator to extend. Senator Keneally on a point of order. Um, Senator Keneally. 
Uh, with respect, I'm not sure how the relevance, I'm not sure how the minister can claim she answered a question yesterday to an event that only happened today. That is, that Senator Rennick said today she should have attended the event. Um, is Senator Rennick wrong? Senator Keneally, the question also asked whether the minister stood by the decision they made. And I think, with respect, the minister is being directly relevant to that uh, question. Concluded. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question? Guess we won't know if Senator Rennick is wrong. Political reporter Brett Worthington said this morning, and I quote, for the tens of thousands of Australian women who rallied around the nation, they were looking for signs that the nation's leaders were listening. What they heard was a prime minister who said they should be thankful they weren't shot. When will the Morrison government start listening to women, stop telling them they should feel lucky that they aren't shot, and start taking their concerns Order, seriously. Order, Senator Keneally. Senator Payne. Mr. President, a number of uh, issues in recent weeks in this parliament and elsewhere, uh, including, may I say, some of the very impactful speeches made by people like Australian of the Year, Grace Tame, uh, speeches made, including at uh, yesterday's rally, Mr. President, have have led to a very significant debate in this country about matters that go to the core of a number of, um, of fundamental issues for Australian women. And in that context, Mr. President, we have taken a number of steps as a parliament. And for a period, those opposite engaged constructively and positively with the Minister for Finance, Special Minister of State, uh, in his efforts to ensure that this parliament is provided with an independent review to, to be carried out by the Sex Discrimination Order. Commissioner. Senator Payne, time for the answer has expired. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister advise on how the Liberal National Party government's economic recovery plan is working to support families, households, businesses and jobs as our economy recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic? The minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. And I thank Senator Abetz for his question. I know he's champion endlessly uh, of the opportunities for job creations for Australians across Tasmania but right across our land. And indeed, as Australia continues to recover from the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression, we can be buoyed by the continuing progress that is being made, particularly by the strength of consumer and business confidence. The NAB's measure of business confidence in February remained well above its long-run average level. All elements of Westpac's Consumer Sentiment Index have improved over the last year, and consumer confidence is up some 21.6 per cent over the year, close to a 10-year high. The latest OECD economic outlook suggests Mr. President, that the Australian economy declined by only 2.5 per cent in 2020, a significant improvement on the IMF's October forecast, and indeed a vast, vastly better outcome than, for example, the US at 3.5 per cent decline, the euro area at 6.5 per cent decline, or the UK at effectively a 10 per cent decline. And indeed, our recovery was showing great strength through the final two quarters of last year, and in the December quarter, real GDP increased by 3.1 per cent, leading the OECD to upgrade its forecast for Australia's economic growth in 2021 to 4.5 per cent, a significant lift from their forecast just back in December. Australia is one of just nine countries to have a AAA credit rating from all three of the ratings agencies. And all of this strength in our recovery is translating most crucially into jobs. Jobs for Australians that are seeing employment growth, unemployment decreasing to 6.4 per cent, 94 per cent of the jobs lost at the start of the pandemic having come back, and indeed the more than half of the jobs created in the last eight months pleasingly going Order. to women Senator across Australia. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that good news, especially on the jobs front, and I ask, can the minister also update the Senate on how the government's plan for lower taxes is putting money back into the pockets of our fellow Australians and helping to boost the nation's economic recovery? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, indeed, our, tax, our income tax reforms as a government are a crucial part 
of the economic recovery that is occurring and the ongoing support that will be there for Australian households, not just this month or next month, but ongoing into the future. Our income tax cuts have already put some $9 billion back into the pockets of around 8.8 .8 million Australians, supporting economic recovery, driving consumer and business confidence. The Stage 2 tax cuts brought forward in last year's budget will deliver a further $12 billion boost to hard-working Australian taxpayers over the period from now through until September 2021. This means that someone earning around $60,000 will be paying more than $2,100 less tax compared to 2017-18. That's more money in their household to support spending, to support investment and to continue to drive the economic recovery forward. Order. Yeah. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the government's other measures will further support the transition to the next phase of our rec economic recovery and any risks that Australia faces on our road to recovery. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, our direct economic and health support since the start of the pandemic now stands at some $267 billion. We've outlined the next targeted steps of investment to support parts of Australia, regional parts of Australia, industries in Australia who continue to face difficulties in relation to the pandemic. We have ongoing measures in place, but we are shifting in terms of the temporary and targeted nature to make sure we stick to those principles of proportionality outlined at the beginning. And can I welcome, in fact, the statement of the Leader of the Opposition today, where he said, we obviously do need to shift away. These mechanisms won't be in place forever. That indeed is very correct. The Leader of the Opposition's uh, comments stand in contrast to the member for Maribyrnong, who happened to be out uh, in the media this morning, the former Leader of the Opposition. He said, what's the point of tax cuts? What's the point of tax cuts? Well, Mr President, those on this side understand very clearly tax cuts put more money into the pockets Order. of Australians, give them more Order. capability to Senator support, Birmingham, to invest the and to continue to support our Senator Birmingham. Senator, um, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Minister Colbeck. Minister, Spain, Germany, France, Cyprus, Italy, Portugal, Netherlands and Ireland have hit pause on the AstraZeneca rollout while they look into its potential links to blood clots. Your colleague, Senator Canavan, said today that Australia should follow suit. Why is the Minister for Health telling Australians there's no, there's, there's no need to worry when health officials in eight different countries are putting on the brakes? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Lambie, for the question. Um, as I said earlier in question time today, the government continues to follow the advice of Australia's world-leading therapeutic goods administration, um, and and also the other health authorities that advise us and have advised us so successfully through the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, in this circumstance, ATAGI, who provide advice to us. Um, has put out a statement noting the suspension of AstraZeneca in other countries, uh, but it's also noted as a part of that statement that the rates of throm thrombotic events are not higher in the vaccine recipients than the expected background rate. Now, Mr. President, the, these events are an issue that health authorities do keep an eye on as a part of the process, uh, and our authorities here in Australia maintain and uh, continuous and close contact with authorities in Europe, particularly the EMA uh, and the MHRA, the UK authorities, where over 11 million doses have been dispensed of the AstraZeneca vaccine without seeing an incidence of increase of these sorts of events. So we maintain close contact with those authorities and the government continues to act on the advice of the TGA, ATAGI, and the Chief Medical Officer, uh, Professor Kelly, uh, in uh, continuing a safe rollout of this vaccine across the country, which we all acknowledge is extremely important uh, for the health of the Australian community but also the economic recovery of the Australian economy from the COVID-19 virus. So we continue to act on that professional advice. Uh, and that's the advice that we will follow as the rollout continues and, uh, and the government believes that that's the appropriate process to follow. Sen Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. This isn't just about science. This is about trust. And Australians didn't trust the Minister for Health enough to sign onto the COVID Safe app. He spent $14 million on that app, and half of that was on advertising. A year later, and it's only found a handful of COVID contacts. If Australians didn't trust the Health Minister enough to put an app on their phones, why would they trust him enough to put a vaccine in their arms? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, um, Senator Lambie, in my, through you, Mr. President, uh, in my answer to the last question, my references with respect to who Australians should listen to uh, and who they should trust with respect to this vaccine is the government, but via the advice that we received, that we have all received from the TGA, uh, ATAGI, uh, and people like the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Kelly, and of course uh, ably assisted and led through the Department of Health by Professor Murphy, uh, who is the Secretary of the Department and who has been leading the process of uh, the vaccination rollout, Mr. President. Senator Lambie is quite correct. This is a very, very important process for us. We need to maintain trust in the process, which is why, which is why we continue to rely on the advice of ATAGI, of the TGA, and the CMO Order. in Senator close Colbeck. contact with Time European for the authorities. Has expired. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. People in this building can deny it not until they're blue in the face, but the reality is, and this is the reality, that there's a growing lack of trust in the vaccine that's going on out there. People are saying they're losing confidence that the vac vaccines we have in Australia are safe and effective. Why have we tied the fate of our economic recovery to the success of the AstraZeneca vaccine, to the point where we're all forced to say everything's fine, while the vaccine itself is starting to roll off the rails? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, um, I thank Senator Lambie for the question, but I wouldn't agree with the, the assertion that she placed uh, at the end of her question. Uh, the vaccination process in this country is continuing to ramp up. Uh, we are continuing to receive supplies of uh, both the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccine, and other vaccines may come online to support the vaccination of Australians as the approval process continues. As we uh, get access, say, through the COVAX mechanism, where we do have uh, capacity coming online, Mr. President. And so Australians can be confident. And, Mr. President, I have to say, uh, in my experience and the feedback that I've been getting, for example, from aged care facilities, there is significant confidence and significant Order. demand, Order. Mr. President. Significant Order. demand from senior Australians for uh, the Order. vaccination process, where we have over 40,000 Australians who have currently been vaccinated in over 500 aged care facilities. So there is, there is strong demand Senator in my Colbeck, experience time for the, the vaccination answer has expired. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. The government promised new school teaching materials on consent and respectful relationships back in the 2015 Plan for Women's Safety. But the Education Minister only announced the rollout in classrooms last week, a six-year delay. A student could have started and finished primary school in that time. Has the Minister for Women taken any action to find out why these important materials have been so delayed? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I don't have um, details with me of uh, the education aspects um, of, uh, of that matter. I am aware that uh, the Minister for Education did, in his remarks last week, uh, make reference uh, to these issues and to the bravery of the young women in particular who had come forward uh, as a result of, uh, as a result of uh, the discussion of these uh, very, very difficult issues in Australia, including sexual assault uh, and rape, uh, to uh, disclose their own experiences. As I understand it, we have uh, education materials in relation to the teaching of uh, primary and secondary students uh, about ethical behaviour, about consent and respectful relationships through what is known as the Respect Matters program, uh, and that that material will be freely available for use in all Australian schools in the coming weeks. Uh, the program for Foundation to Year 6, Mr President, is focused on uh, relationships and friendships uh, and managing these through changes and challenges. 
Uh, that is about providing building blocks for later content. Uh, the program for years seven to nine focuses on moving from preteen to adolescence and looks at relationships and power and bullying and bystander action. Uh, and then further, Mr. President, the program for years 10 to 12 uh, focuses on personal and intimate relationships. That includes understanding, consent and decision making, uh, and consent laws and rights. Mr. President, the government understands that this is a much broader issue than just schools, and significant funding has been allocated uh, since 2013 by governments, uh, federal and, uh, and state and territory. Uh, but a billion dollars from the Commonwealth to, pre Order. to prevent Senator and Payne, respond to violence time against for the women and their children. Has expired. But Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. Can the Minister for Women confirm she has failed to implement the recommendations in the 2016 COAG report on reducing violence against women and their children and the 2018 statement from delegates at the COAG summit on reducing violence against women and their children? If yes, why? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As the senator would be aware, um, we as a government, like previous governments, in fact commencing in 2010 with a strong um, multi-partisan, I would say, support, Mr. President, uh, have been supporters of, engaged in, leading on the National Action Plan to prevent violence against women and their children. Part of that is underpinned by the engagement of women's safety ministers from the states and territories with the Commonwealth ministers, Minister Rustin uh, and I at, uh, at, or, and myself at, uh, at this point in time. And that is, uh, that is the framework under which uh, the Commonwealth works and the states and territories work uh, on all of these issues. Uh, in relation to those individual reports, Mr President, if I have anything further to add, I will bring further information to the chamber. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. The CEO of Community Legal Centres Australia has warned that the government's move to abolish the specialist family court model risks, and I quote, exposing survivors of family violence to unnecessary risk. What action did the Minister for Women take to protect women and children from the risk of Attorney General Porter's move to abolish the family court? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as um, senators would be aware, there was a very extensive consultation uh, on the introduction of the uh, reforms to the uh, to the courts that Senator McCarthy has uh, alluded to. And this is a, a a very important priority for the government within the uh, the family law system. I understand there's also been a report released uh, this week in relation to uh, to uh, matters affecting. Uh, the court system and specifically with relation to, uh, to family law. The number of initiatives, uh, Mr. President, which were uh, part of the Women's Economic Security Statement uh, as well in uh, October of last year uh, in the context of the budget, uh, that also went to these issues in the context, uh, of course, at the time, overwhelmingly of, um, uh, of uh, COVID-19. Yesterday, in uh, discussions with a uh, number of community organisation representatives, including uh, uh, Ms Lynch from the uh, Women's Legal Service, if I have her, the title of the organisation correct, uh, in Queensland, a number Payne, of these matters were raised, Mr the President. The answer has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Uh, Regional communities rely on aviation services to support, to support small business, tourism and the residents who live there to access employment opportunities as well as vital services such as medical treatment and education. Virgin has previously withdrawn services from regional areas and in the last week of February, Rex Airlines announced plans to cut some of its regional services. This has concerned many rural and regional Australians reliant on these vital services. Can the minister please outline how the Liberal and National Government is supporting regional aviation to maintain as many of these essential air services, not only for tourism, but also for the viability of our communities in rural and regional Australia? The minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Davey for her question. And, Mr. President, without a doubt, 2020 uh, presented the domestic aviation network 
uh, with the greatest challenges uh, it has ever faced. And, uh, the morrison McCormack government, uh, we were proud to support the domestic aviation network through these challenges. And, uh, that was actually demonstrated again last week uh, when we announced a $1.2 billion package to support the tourism sector, to encourage more Australians to have a holiday domestically, but in particular in regional Australia. Mr President, we know that when the pandemic first hit, aviation, without a doubt, was hit and it was hit hard. The government at that time we put in place key supports to keep essential services running throughout the pandemic, not only to support regional airlines, but also ensuring that they can keep as many jobs as possible, Senator Davey, that are actually supported um, by our regions. Currently, there are around 12 commercial regional airlines which operate regular scheduled passenger services across Australia. It's almost one year today that the government announced its initial package to assist regional airlines to support critical air services to regional and rural communities, securing access to critical medical supplies and testing, securing freight and securing transport of essential personnel through the Regional Aviation Support Program. Mr President, you'd also be aware that the government provided an additional $100 million uh, in funding to directly support the smaller regional airlines if they need it. And the reason we did this is because those regional airlines are critical supports for regional communities, providing critical aeromedical services and links to capital and metropolitan areas for medical appointments, medical freight and locum doctors. Um, and certainly we are committed to ensuring that these services continue. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. So the 1.2 billion Tourism Aviation Network Support Program, or TANS, as uh, my leader likes to call it, um, announced last week and will initially service 13 key tourism regions. But can the minister please outline the future measures that our government will undertake to promote tourism and maintain and the maintenance of key air services in the regions not currently included in that program? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, prior to COVID-19, Australians spent approximately $65 billion on overseas travel in 2019. This presents now enormous opportunities uh, for our regions. That's $65 billion in 2019 on overseas travel. What we are doing as a government is supporting more Australians to back our regions and to support Australians to holiday at home this year. We have announced, as you know, the half price ticket program last week, which will initially operate in over 13 key regions, with the potential for more regions to be added on the basis of consumer demand, consultation and the success of the program. Mr President, in addition to this, the vital domestic aviation policies that are supporting our regional airlines, regional health systems and regional jobs, they will continue for six months from the end of March to the end of September 2021. Again, as a Order. government, Senator we will Cash, always time back for the our has regions. Expired. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Yes. Can the minister please outline how Australians living in regional areas, and not just the holiday makers who live in our capital cities, will be able to access the subsidised airline tickets under the program? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, all Australians, all Australians will have access to these fares through airline websites and booking agents in the coming weeks for flight bookings from the 1st of April. The discounts will be offered on tens of thousands of fares per week across an initial 13 key tourism regions, uh, and the government is working with airlines to increase the number of flights uh, to these tourism areas. Mr. President, not only will regional Australians benefit, but regional airlines regional accommodation providers, regional restaurants and bars and regional tourism operators. They will all benefit from the policy put in place by the government. But in particular, I would encourage all Australians, Order. if you are considering taking advantage of the discount fare, book through a travel agent. Book through a travel agent, not just to support the local business, but also to ensure that you can actually make the Order. most of your travel and experience in terms of what all of our regions have to offer. Uh, doing this will Order. obviously support those local travel Order, agent Senator businesses. Senator Cash, time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
I refer to reports that key components of the Attorney General Christian Porter's job will be delegated to others upon his return from leave on 31 March. Are the reports correct? What responsibilities will be delegated? Why are these regarded as areas in which Mr Porter will face a conflict of interest and who will be assisting Mr Porter? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. I thank the Senator for her question. Um, uh, as, uh, as the Attorney-General announced yesterday, he is, uh, he is exercising the same rights as any other Australian when they believe they have been defamed to initiate uh, legal proceedings uh, against certain organisations and individuals. Uh, to, uh, to uh, ensure appropriate handling whilst the Attorney-General initiates such proceedings, the government has sought legal advice in relation to any issues that may arise as a result of the Attorney-General filing such proceedings. As an interim measure, until that advice is received, the Attorney-General's office will have no engagement with the federal court, uh, which would be expected to hear the proceedings I understand, or involvement with matters involving the federal court or the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. The Attorney-General's department has similarly been told not to engage with the Attorney-General or the Attorney-General's office Order. in respect of matters involving the federal court or the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Order. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you. The um, next meeting of the Attorneys General will be on the 31st of March, the day Mr Porter returns from leave, at which it will discuss two of its priorities, family violence, national information sharing framework and model defamation reform. Will Mr Porter attend the meeting and, if so, how will he manage his clear conflict of interest on two of the meeting's three identified priorities? Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr. President, uh, I'm not aware of what, uh, what Mr. Porter's commitments will be on the 31st of March, and I'll take that on notice. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. It's reported that the Attorney General's portfolio will be restructured to ensure Mr. Porter is able to return to the role while he pursues defamation action. How long will a junior Attorney General be required to assist Mr. Porter to remain in Cabinet? While questions remain over whether he is a fit and proper person to resume full responsibilities. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, as I said in relation to the primary question, the Attorney General is exercising the same rights as any Australian in relation to initiating defamation proceedings uh, in the belief that he has been defamed. Out of an abundance Order. of caution, the government has sought legal advice in relation to the Attorney-General's work as an interim measure until that advice has been received. The steps that I outlined in relation to the primary question will be undertaken. Once that advice is received, if there's any further information to add, I'll make sure that it's brought to the Chamber. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, Senator Keneally. Deputy President, uh, understanding Order 745A, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Sen Senator Birmingham, as to why 108 questions, 108 questions taken on notice since October 2019 remain unanswered. Uh, thank you. Do you uh, Senator Keneally, do you have a list of the questions, or uh, does the Minister not need them at this point? I'll just uh, Senator Keneally, uh, pe people have, other senators have been reading them out, but if you haven't, I do not have a full list. Thanks. But I think the government would know the 108. Okay, the Minister. We, well, Deputy President, I understand Senator Keneally is uh, is seeking this explanation, understanding Order 74.5, uh, in which uh, in which uh, it clearly states that uh, that uh, the senator may ask uh, if uh, questions the senator has asked have not been responded, and may ask for an explanation for such. I am advised that Senator Keneally does not have any questions on notice through the estimates process that have not been responded to. Thank you, Minister. Senator Keneally. I am here today representing— Sir, uh, Senator Keneally, just a moment. Are you, uh, Sorry, just yes. to, if you take your seat, Minister. Senator Keneally, Senator Keneally was not in order in the question that she sought and the explanation that she sought. She had no questions that are outstanding in relation to estimates procedures. And so, Deputy President, I ask you to rule that Senator Keneally's attempt to now take note of an explanation to a question that ought not have been asked is out of order. 
thank you, Minister. So, I'm, uh, as I understand, uh, are you seeking? Uh, sorry, Senator Wong. Uh, Madam Deputy President, um, uh, I can give indication. I can get a senator down here because we have in excess of a hundred questions. All right. Would you like me to seek leave to make a short statement, Eric? I'm happy to do that. Senator, Wong, I seek leave. Um, I'm speaking to the point of order. I know that. I'm, I'm making this point. I, th uh, I think that the Leader of the Government may be technically correct because we, we asked Senator Gallagher Keneally as the Deputy Leader um, to make a contribution in relation to the excess of 100, and I'm Maybe. hoping that someone is going to provide me with the schedule soon, as per my request, um, uh, questions which have been asked by Labor senators but not answered. Um, in, uh, yeah. or, or yeah. for estimates. Yeah. Uh, so we are seeking that she make this contribution as the deputy leader of the um, Labor Party of the opposition here in the Senate. Now, I would take advice from the clerk. I, I can't recall whether or not on behalf of Labor senators mm -hmm. is, has been permitted uh, in the standing orders. And if, if, if the ruling is different, I, I'm happy to just indicate we, we have Senators Polly, Gallagher, uh, McCarthy, um, Green, Hitching. I can go through this myself um, and Wong, many others. If, so, if the government wants yeah. to use the technicality to avoid a discussion about the extent to which they are avoiding parliamentary scrutiny, the, set, the leader of the government can take that debating point. The, the, the point is, the government is failing. Is failing. Well, the standing orders also require you. you you're, you're, well, I'm responding um, to your Senator interjection. Wong. I know you're grumpy Senator today. Wong. I'm responding to your interjection. The Senator standing Wong. orders. Your standing orders, the standing orders also Senator require Wong. you, Senator also Wong. require you I to respond trying. to questions Senator on Wong, notice, and you're refusing you to. Your seat. Thank you. I was going to respond uh, to the point of order, order to the point of order raised by the minister, and uh, inform the Senate that, in fact, Senator Keneally may ask in response to questions she has. Not had answered in the she believes haven't been answered in the required time, and she can ask on behalf of other Labor senators. But she needs to be clear in what she's requesting. Senator Keneally, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am. Standing Order 74.5C. I move that the Senate take note of the minister's failure to provide the answers to the 108 questions asked by Labor senators on notice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here we stand today in this chamber and this government trying to argue technicalities about standing orders. Well, understand this. Standing orders require the government to answer questions on notice and to answer them in a certain time frame. It is not a technicality to avoid accountability. It is your responsibility as a government to be answerable to this chamber. It is a responsibility of the government to be accountable to the questions posed by senators. And it is your responsibility as a government to conform to the standing orders. And the standing orders require the government to answer the questions posed by senators, including on notice. On notice, 108 questions sit unanswered by this government. Since October 2019, I hope that everyone watching this broadcast today understands that Senator Birmingham and the government he represents in this chamber have left 108 questions unanswered. They are turning their back on their accountability. As a government, they are turning their back on their accountability to this Senate. They are turning their back on their responsibility. And they are turning their 
back on the Australian people. Since October 2019, we are just days away from another week of estimates, where no doubt this list I have in my hand of 108 questions that are unanswered by this government, this government led in this chamber by Senator Birmingham, turning their back on their responsibility, arguing a technicality to try and keep me from making this contribution. A technicality, they say, in the standing orders. It's not a technicality for Senator Birmingham and his colleagues to answer the questions put to them on notice. Madam Deputy President, a fish rots from the head down. It is no surprise that apathy towards accountability, a willingness to turn your back on accountability, plagues the Morrison government, and it starts with the Prime Minister's office. I don't hold a hose, mate, said the Prime Minister. He doesn't hold an inquiry when serious allegations of rape are leveled as an attorney general, and he doesn't hold out any hope for this chamber that the questions will be answered. What do we have here today? A government that is turning their back on accountability. A government that's turned around and said, no, we don't hold the hose. We don't hold responsibility. We don't hold seriously our accountability. 108 an unanswered questions, some dating back to October 2019. The Prime Minister is the worst offender. The minister who Simon Birmingham, Senator Birmingham, represents in this chamber is the worst offender in not answering questions on notice. It was Senator Birmingham who just moments ago tried to argue a technicality that I couldn't speak to this. And it is Senator Birmingham who's turning his back on his responsibilities to ensure that the minister he represents in this chamber, the prime minister, answers the questions on notice put to him by senators. As I said, we are days away from estimates. No doubt this list of 108 questions is going to grow. But it doesn't stop with the prime minister. There are another 40 seven questions overdue from the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications, which is led by the Deputy Prime Minister himself. There are another 25 questions overdue from Minister Rustin, who's also manager of government business in this place. We have the Prime Minister. We have the leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham. We have the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure and transport. We have the Minister for Social Services in this chamber, Senator Rustin. These are the three biggest offenders in not answering questions on notice, on turning their back on accountability. Now, we have seen this government turn its back in recent days and weeks, in fact, in years, over seven years. This government has turned their back on the Australian people. They have left the Australian people behind, and they are leaving their responsibility to be accountable to this parliament and through this parliament to the Australian people. They're leaving that behind. Because understand this, a government that doesn't think they have a responsibility to answer questions under the standing orders is a government that no longer thinks it is accountable to this parliament or to the Australian people. Unfortunately, we don't just have the evidence of 108 answered, unanswered questions since October 2019. We also have the evidence of a government that has delivered a dodgy NBN, that has paid $30 million for airport land in Western Sydney that was only worth $3 million, of a government that has presided over sports rorts, handing out taxpayer money as if it is Liberal Party money to marginal seats on color-coded spreadsheets. We have a government that is willing to take the Safer Communities Fund 
and disregard and reject the legitimate safety needs of communities across Australia and instead put that money into marginal and liberal seats to make them safer for the Liberal Party. That is a government that has turned its back on the Australian people. That is a government that has turned its back on parliamentary responsibility. This is a government that promised a National Integrity Commission. Where is it? Where is it? It hasn't been delivered by the Attorney General Christian Porter. It remains in draft legislation because this government does not believe they need to be held accountable. They continue to turn their back on the scandals, on the incompetence, on the corruption. This is a government that can't even answer questions on notice, must, much less set up a National Integrity Commission to ensure that we don't have regional road rorts and safer communities rorts and sports rorts and dodgy land deals and a dodgy NBN. Distressingly this week, we've also seen that this government has turned its back on the Australian people and particularly Australian women. Australian women were out in force here in Canberra and in locations across the country. 110,000 women and men marched to say enough is enough because they want answers from this government. Where is the Respect at Work report and its 55 recommendations seeking to establish greater equality for Australian women. Where does it sit? It sits as work undone, unanswered by this government, like the 108 unanswered questions, the Respect at Work report. The government doesn't think they're accountable for that. They don't think they're responsible for that. We even heard the Minister for Women, Senator Payne, today say, oh, the private sector, the private sector. Is there nothing this government won't outsource to the private sector? Her claim, she didn't really have to get progressing. She didn't have to encourage the Attorney General to get going on that because the private sector had a lot of responsibility here. There are 55 recommendations to the government. Only three of them have been implemented. Only three. So again, we have a government turning its back on its responsibilities. During the last sitting period, the Senate ordered the production of answers to 631 overdue questions on notice from estimates hearings dating back to 2019. 631. Even when compelled by the Senate to finally answer these questions, there are ministers in this government, members of this very chamber, who just plainly refuse to do their jobs, who just turn their back on their responsibilities. And I know senators who have their back turned on me right now can hear me. They should face their responsibilities as leaders, as front benchers, and be accountable to the parliament. The fact that the prime minister is the number one offender when it comes to not answering questions on notice? Not a surprise. This is a Prime Minister who thinks his job is political management, not management of the Parliament, not management of policy, not management of good outcome for the Australian people, but management of his own political fortunes. So maybe we shouldn't be surprised as Senator Pratt interjects that a Prime Minister that is all about marketing and spin and headline and announcement and photo op couldn't be bothered to answer questions posed by the Senate. Because that's what he's about. He's about the management of the, his marketing brand, not about the management of the economy, the management of our community delivering good policy that ensures that women can be safe at work, even when their workplace is the Australian Parliament. This is a Prime Minister 
who offered to meet women behind closed doors rather than go out and cross the street to hear from thousands of women who had gathered here to say enough is enough. Perhaps none of us should have been surprised that the Prime Minister wouldn't cross the road. The Prime Minister won't even do his basic day job of answering questions on notice from the Senate, from the Parliament. I never thought, Madam Deputy President, we would one day long for the leading heights of ministerial accountability under Malcolm Turnbull. But frankly, I say bring them back. Bring them back. Because what we saw from the last Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet was that Dr. Parkinson took his role seriously. He thought the minister should be accountable for a portfolio. No doubt his boss, Malcolm Turnbull, impressed that upon him. Dr. Parkinson thought the Australian people deserved transparency and oversight from a government they elected. So this starts at the top. A commitment to accountability, a commitment to transparency, a commitment to just do your basic job. So what I want to say, as we head into Estimates Week, is a message not just to the ministers in this government, because I think we've made our point here. The ministers in this government have turned their back on their accountability. They've turned their back on this parliament, and they're turning their back on the Australian people. What I would like to say to any department secretaries who are appearing before estimates next week. It is the practice of Labor senators and front benchers to give notice to departments on the questions we want to ask, on the officials we would like to be there, on the matters we wish to explore. And we do that as a courtesy so that they may come prepared. So what I would like to say to department secretaries is to remind them of something I believe they know, that is that they are accountable to this parliament. And while ministers in the Morrison government may disregard and may feel that they are not accountable to the Australian people, they may turn their back on their responsibilities. Next week in estimates, we expect answers to questions not for our sake, but for the sake of parliamentary accountability, for the sake of the standing orders, for the sake of the Australian people. Because governments in a democracy are accountable to the people. Thank you, Senator Keneally. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to taking note of answers. Senator McCarthy. Uh, Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Payne to the questions asked by Senators McAllister, Keneally, and I. I rise to take note of the failure of this government to take substantive action against sexual harassment of women in the workplace and their failure to take real action against the violence and threat of violence women face every single day. They cannot even roll out a school program about respectful re relationships in a reasonable time frame. Not here in this country. These are the words of the Prime Minister yesterday in response to the thousands of women who rallied around Australia in protest against violence and harassment. To say enough is enough to call for leadership, national leadership on this issue, which should be a turning point for gendered violence issues in this country. Instead, we get told we should be lucky, grateful even, that we aren't shot when, we're, when we take to the streets to protest this, that we should be grateful our cries of protest against violence aren't met with violence. Not good enough, not nearly good enough. Because we have a history of meeting calls from women, pleas from women to stop the violence, of meeting these calls with violence, women know this. First Nations women in particular know this. And I'm not going to talk about the statistics because I want to talk about the women. 
the people who, in their own words, aren't just numbers. Some of you may remember a group of First Nations women from Central Australia who came to Canberra three years ago to bring us their message about combating family violence and their calls for support. These women were from the Tungandjura Women's Family Safety Group, and they spent days here in Parliament House meeting with senators, meeting with government ministers, telling all about the work they do on the front line of family violence in Alice Springs. And these women, Madam Deputy President, in 2017 organised the largest women's march in Central Australia to protest against and draw attention to violence against First Nations women. It was sparked by anger and frustration when one of the friends of the family was badly injured by an intimate partner, yet her near death garnered no headlines, no comment, no outrage. However, more than 300 people joined in the Alice Springs action to highlight Aboriginal women and children and families who are living with, injured by or dying from violence. They then made the decision to bring their message here to Canberra and to show First Nations women all over the country that we can stand up and be heard, that we do have the solutions and need to be part of the decision making. These remarkable and strong women came to Canberra and they made an impact. Madam Deputy President, one of these women, a core member of the group, a woman who was dedicated to changing lives to working to combat violence against women. Well, I attended her funeral on Friday. Mm. She was killed earlier this year after being run down in a car allegedly driven by her partner. And she was killed outside the Alice Springs Hospital, a place where people go to seek help and healing. And she was killed despite her work advocating that the voices of First Nations women need to be heard. When she came to Canberra and asked us to listen and stand with her and the other women who flew all the way, and for many of them it was the first time, first time out of Alice Springs, they wanted us to hear their solutions, acknowledge their experience and recognise the important work that is being done on a community level to deal with issues of domestic and family violence. And she urged the government to listen to a wide range of First Nations voices regarding family and domestic violence issues and commit to genuine collaboration and partnerships with women at the community level when making family and domestic violence policies. So yesterday, when hundreds of thousands of men and women marched across this country thinking, reflecting on their own experiences and those of people that they know and love, well, I remembered her knowing that she came here three years ago to ask this government to act. And three years later, we still have a government that won't listen, that won't act and turns its back, just like we saw today. Thank you, uh, Senator McAllister. Senator MacDonald. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of answers. I am going to find it hard to get through this take note today because we, as women of the coalition, have a part of women of Australia, and we all share in the, in the distress, the anguish and the horror of sexual assaults right across this land right across this land. Yesterday, I was scheduled to speak here in the chamber and was not able to be there for the start of the march. I committed to going down, to lending my, my presence to the issue of sexual assault in workplaces right across this land. I listened to the words spoken by Senator McCarthy and I, too, am frustrated and horrified by the ongoing assaults, particularly in Indigenous communities, but right across 
my part of the world in northern Queensland. I spend time with the Women's Centre with Yumba Meta in Townsville, understanding their challenges, the role that they play in supporting victims, both men and women. And yet, I find myself today somehow not quite good enough a woman. Somehow I find myself today not woman enough to be included by the opposition. You would think that our shared experiences would in some way bind us. But instead, I find myself again part of not being of being my voice being taken away and the people I represent being taken away. I weep that we are politicising an issue that should never, should never be in this chamber in somehow holding the people, individuals who have no part in these assaults. Good men, good women, and yet we have to be lectured to on not being woman enough because I do stand with the victims of these assaults. I am horrified and outraged that this should happen, this should still be happening in this land. And it is not just in Parliament, it is in workplaces, communities, homes, hospitals, retirement villages. And yet instead of standing together, instead of being a bipartisan event to try and stamp this out, to, to educate, to uh, provide resources, we are going to turn this into another, another way of dividing us. I am disappointed beyond words because when I go and speak to communities and women's centres and men's centres, this is not the, the story that I want to take back, that we are not united, that there is not a, a deep desire to see sexual assaults in this land finish. And this government has committed funding to centres, has spoken on this, has provided resources in every state and territory. And the next person who seeks to politicise this by making this in somehow the responsibility of some people who are not the right sort not the right gender, not the right colour, not the right party, not the right region, should be ashamed because they perpetuate this attack on the very people that we should be working together with. I thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Um, Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Deputy President. Notes by acknowledge um, Senator Macdonald's attendance and also others from the other side, because where the apology really should be going, and that is to the fact that the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and the Minister for Women didn't attend the rally. And that's where the politicisation has occurred. By not saying this is a bipartisan support for making sure that the voice of women and the serious, serious matters that we're dealing with right now in this place is dealt with appropriately. And as we've seen over the last eight years, the government has once again failed to rise to the occasion before it. Yesterday, hundreds of thousands of courageous Australian women around the country embarked on the historic March for Justice in stark contrast to the limp excuses put forward by those opposite in recent weeks we heard powerful, brilliant speeches by incredible women. Incredible women like Brittany Higgins 
and incredible women like Grace Tammy. And for the 12 million Australian men, whether your job is to listen, our job is to listen, whether you join the protest in the streets around the country or not. But for those carrying in this building, as the Prime Minister chose to do, you need to listen. Because, of course, for men and women in the Morrison government, you have the power to do so much more. But instead of rising to the occasion, instead of seizing this opportunity to take a stand against the pandemic of sexual harassment in this country and in this building, Instead, the Prime Minister has proactively obstructed and undermined those seeking long overdue justice. The Prime Minister refused to meet the rally just outside these doors. The Deputy Prime Minister refused to meet the rally just outside these doors. The Minister for Women refused to meet the rally just outside these doors. Instead, the Prime Minister declared it a triumph that these courageous women were not, I quote, met with bullets. The Prime Minister believes that the women of Australia should be content that they can protest without being murdered in the streets and should be satisfied with that. What a lofty ambition the Prime Minister has of Australia has for the women of this country. And of course, it's hardly surprising. When the same Prime Minister announced he could only sympathise with Brittany Higgins because he is a father. No one will ever say it better than that the Australian of the Year, Grace, uh, Grace Taman, did at the National Press Club. It should take having children to have a conscience. It shouldn't take children to have a conscience. Having children doesn't guarantee a conscience. Indeed, it does not. Because this is a government which sends senior cabinet ministers on indefinite paid leave, hoping that their scandals will blow over, such as the Minister for Defence, who failed her duty of care to her staff member, who mishandled the most serious claim of misconduct of sexual assault, which has ever taken place in this building, who called Brittany Higgins, who has displayed such incredible courage in coming forward, not just for herself, but for victims of sexual assault around Australia, a lying cow. And who only apologised for that remark upon threat of a defamation lawsuit. This is conduct unbecoming any manager or employer, let alone a federal cabinet minister. And of course, speaking of lawsuits, we have the Attorney General who announced yesterday, while on indefinite paid leave at that time, that he was suing the ABC journalist who revealed the allegations made against him. Rather than taking accountability and doing the right thing, rather than standing down the Attorney-General pending an independent inquiry, of course, the government instead is attacking the media. The only legal action the Morris government is taking on these rape allegations is not against the Attorney-General. The only legal action being taken is against a female journalist for having the audacity for doing her job. This is a disgraceful approach, but one which is consistent with the attitude towards women by the Morrison government. In 2003, when the Governor-General, Peter Hollingsworth, was accused of rape, the Prime Minister stood him down pending the investigation. What's happening with the Attorney-General? Thank you, uh, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. People listening into this debate will see a great distinction between the contribution of Senator Macdonald and those from the other side. Senator Macdonald's contribution, poignant, considered and oozing with wise counsel. Very, very considered, not seeking to play the cheap political card. The issues that we are dealing with are sensitive, people's lives are at stake, women's lives and also those that are accused. And we always have to keep that in balance and in mind. And so when Senator Sheldon makes his uh, contribution about the Attorney General, he of course does not reflect on his former leader, similarly accused. And we on this side have accepted the fact 
that it was investigated and the appropriate authorities determined not to proceed with it. The same standard ought be applying to the Attorney-General. Indeed, if it is asserted by those opposite that somehow, because the police haven't proceeded, there should be a judicial inquiry into behaviour, might I add, that is alleged whilst the attorney was still a minor, why not have an inquiry similarly into the behaviour of the member for Maribyrnong? There's no answer to that, is there, from the opposition, because they seek to play politics with this very, very important issue. And, Madam Deputy President, as somebody that volunteered his services to help establish a women's shelter, I was on the inaugural committee, I was the honorary legal adviser for many years and still have an interest in this area, I know the pain and the suffering that is inflicted upon the women folk of this country, and I sought to do something about it from my own resources and my own capacities, along, might I add, with a group of wonderfully dedicated individuals, both male and especially female. Violence toward each other should be condemned full stop. Violence by physically stronger people against physically weaker people is abhorrent, and so it is usually with violence by men against women, and it needs to be condemned outright. Indeed, I've said before, I'll say it again, that talking about domestic violence, I think, demeans that which actually goes on. Domestic violence is actually assault. It's a crime. It should be treated as a crime and not dressed up as something which is sort of somewhat a bit different to an assault because it happened to occur at home. These things need to be considered very carefully, very maturely. And Senator McCarthy, very disappointing in her speech contribution, sought to condemn the federal government as though the Northern Territory Labor government had no legislative responsibility or capacity in this area. It does. We know it does. But why only seek to blame the federal Liberal government for insufficient activity when the problem may well lie in the Northern Territory government? I don't seek to do that. I seek to say to everybody in this chamber and Australia that trying to blame a Liberal government or a Labor government, or this person or that person, is to play cheap politics with a very, very important issue. It demeans those that seek to do it. And I rely again in concluding, Madam Deputy President, on the words, the very wise words, of my friend and colleague, Senator Susan Macdonald, who was able to express her point of view and her disappointment at the way she herself has been handled in this debate and many other good men and women. Let's all work together to achieve an outcome to ensure that everybody is safe in our community, especially our women folk. Thank you, uh, Senator Bitt. Senator Ayres. What the uh, questions today and the answers today in question time really revealed was the entire absence, the invisibility of this Minister for Women. Uh, not, just, not just over the last three or four weeks, but over the last two years uh, of her being in that position. There are enormous challenges that Australian women face. More women than men lost jobs during the COVID-19 period. The new jobs <coughs> that have been created that the government celebrates so much have largely been casual and low-wage jobs, mostly women's jobs. Uh, so not only have Australian women been hit by the biggest impact of COVID-19 in terms of losing their jobs, 
uh, but the jobs that have been created have been low-quality jobs. The gender wage gap persists. Nearly 900 deaths since 208 uh, caused by domestic and family violence. The scourge of violence against women and children, I am not convinced it's got any better over that period. And there is much to suggest that it's getting worse. And just latterly, the revelations of an alleged rape, not very far from the Prime Minister's office, uh, the, the misogyny that exists in some quarters in this parliament, a parliament that should be the exemplar for Australian people, not one of the worst kind of workplaces for Australian women. The unequal position of women in this country diminishes all of us. I absolutely reject the mean-spirited values that underpin the Prime Minister's statement where he said he was all for inequality just as long as men didn't have to go backwards in the process. The great irony of that statement is that the only reason that the gender wage gap has shrunk by a tiny amount is because the Prime Minister's wage policy, his industrial relations policies, have driven the wages of blue-collar men down over the course of the last couple of years. Violence diminishes us all. Unequal pay diminishes us all. Disrespect at work diminishes us all. Misogyny diminishes us all. And where on earth, amidst all of this, is the invisible Minister for Women? Yesterday, 10,000 women and thousands of men gathered outside. Now, I acknowledge those coalition uh, members and senators who came out as well. Where was the Minister for Women? Hiding over there in this chamber, invisible outside, a confected excuse for, sta for staying in here. How can she possibly rationalise the decision uh, to stay away from that rally? She is supposed to be the Minister for Women. She is supposed to be an advocate for change. She is supposed to be finding ways through policy and politics and this place to lift the status of women. But where was she? Nowhere. And there's been plenty of opportunity. The Respect at Work report more than 12 months ago, basic steps, basic steps in that report to elevate the position of Australian women and protect them at work, almost zero. Three out of 55, almost zero response from this government. The events over the course of the last three or four weeks that have laid bare just how weak the government's response is when faced by the kind of allegations that Ms Higgins has brought forward, that others have brought forward, that have been forward, brought forward against the Attorney General in this place. And the government's response has been entirely about political management, not protecting the interests of women, not dealing with issues on its merits, an entirely political response. And where has the Minister for Women been? Entirely invisible. In terms of ministers for women in this place, we've had two years of Tony Abbott as the Minister for Women, two years of Senator Cash as the Minister for Women, two years of Kelly O'Dwyer as the Minister for Women, and now we've had two long years of Minister Payne. And I am not convinced which of those two-year periods has been the worst, characterised by the least action, characterised by the total invisibility Thank of this you, minister. Thank uh, you, Senator Ayres. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator McCarthy to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the response to my question regarding the Christchurch massacre. And sorry, who was that to, Senator Faruqi? Uh, to Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Two years ago yesterday, an Australian man walked into two mosques in Christchurch, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and killed 51 innocent Muslims. This was an attack the New Zealand Royal Commission ended up confirming, driven by an extreme right-wing Islamophobic ideology. I remember exactly where I was that day. 
just as I'm pretty sure every Muslim in this part of the world remembers exactly where they were. It was shattering. Our hearts broke as we came to understand the enormity of the hate-filled massacre. In June of 2019, just a few months after the mosque attacks, I traveled to Christchurch to visit the Al Nur Mosque and meet with communities and families. Two years on, how far have we come to ensure this will never happen again? Not nearly far enough. In fact, we have arguably gone further down the wrong path. Open racism and Islamophobia continue to be tolerated and even encouraged in politics and media. Neo-Nazis and far-right white nationalists organize online, their toxic hatred seeping into mainstream public discussions. Muslims continue to experience racism wherever we go. I have pushed hard against this, as have many advocates, but Australia's lack of progress remains deeply concerning to me. I worry that without substantial political change, the next Christchurch attack will not be a matter of if, but when. I have been disturbed to read the initial submissions to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security Inquiry into Extremism. All key government agencies, including ASIO, the AFP, and Home Affairs, have indicated in their initial submissions to the inquiry that the threat of far-right extremism is growing. However, substantial policy change and political action is nowhere to be seen. The unanimity of federal authorities on the growing threat of far-right extremism stands in sharp contrast to the dismissive rhetoric of government MPs. We heard in the response to my questions earlier much of the same rhetoric, refusing to squarely target far-right extremism. When I put to the minister a very simple yes or no question about whether the government would condemn far-right extremism without equivocation, I did not receive a yes or no response. Senator Birmingham responded by saying he would condemn far-right and religious extremism and all forms of extremism without qualification. The minister would not condemn far-right extremism in isolation. This is the extremism which drove the massacre in Christchurch, and it needs to be condemned. As I said earlier in my question to the minister, ASIO states in its submission to the PJCIS inquiry that the threat from extreme right-wing groups has increased, with groups being more organized and sophisticated than before. Conversely, on left-wing extremism, ASIO states that it is not currently prominent in Australia, but there is no acknowledgement of this clear contrast from the government. In fact, MPs continue to promote false equivalences. The Liberals have completely failed here, not just in their rhetoric, but also their actions. Laws on extremist hatred must be strengthened and enforced. There are still no dedicated programs for tackling far-right extremism in the community and no commitment to an anti-racism strategy or campaign. When MPs have their heads in the sand or even tacitly endorse far-right ideas, it totally undermines the government's response to this threat. The government has been dragged into the PJCIS inquiry, kicking and screaming, and even deflected a clear-eyed focus on far-right extremism and white supremacy. Now, once they have received submissions from our security agencies, they continue to deflect and deny. They have no choice but to look at the evidence and respond accordingly. Thousands of Muslims in Australia and other targeted communities of color are counting on them, are begging them to take this seriously. This week, we remember the 51 lives lost in Christchurch and the many injured and families whose worlds were changed forever in March 2019. We work to ensure that their passing was not in vain. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call for petitions. The clerk. Mr. President, petitions have been lodged as listed on the dynamic red. The terms of the petitions will be incorporated in Hansard. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Hanson-Young.
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting, I will move that the Senate A notes the Attorney General has instituted legal proceedings against the ABC, and B calls on the Prime Minister to recuse the Attorney General from any cabinet deliberations in relation to a the ABC or the funding of, a pu of the public broadcaster. Thank you. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, I shall now proceed to the placing of business as desired to postpone or rearrange the business. The clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. In respect of general business notice of motion number 1064, postponed from today to the 17th of March 2021. I remind senators the question may be put at the request of any senator. There being none, if there are no other matters, I shall proceed to the discovery of formal business and attempt to do it in the most convenient manner for the chamber. I will call on government business matter number one, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to amend government business notice of motion number one before seeking to have the motion taken as formal. Is leave granted to amend the motion? It is, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I amend the motion as indicated in the list circulated in the chamber and ask that the amended motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunning. I move the motion as amended. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I jump to matter number 1060 in the name of Senators Davey and Ciccone? Are we in a position to deal with that? I can come back to it at the end. Okay, I'll come, then I'll jump if I can to one. Oh, Senator, Senator Might Dean be Smith. Able to assist. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1060 relating to Land Care Australia be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. I'll now move to 1061 in the name of Senator Waters. President, on your indulgence, could we just revert back to the original um, uh, motion 1054? The Greens were seeking to move an amendment to uh, remove. Uh, sorry, no, that's not the right motion number. Um, sorry, the Is one that the government business number government one. Government business. Thank you very yep. much. And we're seeking to remove the online safety bill from the um, cut off order uh, exemption I, motion. I, I'll My I'll apologies. Ask the we uh, a minute. I, I have to, I can only do it by leave unless a formal recommittal is moved. I'm looking at the clerk if he nods. Okay. So, so the clerk, I'm seeking leave to put the question with respect to the bills you just outlined, and we'll take the rest. Uh, now, I can only do it by leave unless there's a formal recommitting motion. Is leave granted, or would you like me to come back to it? I'll come back to it. Let the government deal with that. Um, now move to 1061 in the name of Senator Polly. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice for motion number 1061 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. I'll just keep a tally. Yep. Um, I'll now move to business of the Senate matter number one in the name of Senator Gallagher. So Gallagher, sorry. Senator um, Urquhart. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number one, proposing a reference to the Economics References Committee, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. Motion. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr. President. The bill extends the expiry date of existing temporary relief, allowing companies and their officers to meet regulatory requirements in respect of, amongst other things, document execution and virtual meetings using digital technologies to the 15th of September 2021 and makes permanent the temporary changes made to continuous disclosure laws in May 2020, which are due to expire on the 22nd of March this year. The government consulted extensively on these measures, including via submissions, reports and stakeholder meetings on the temporary reforms, hearings as a part of the Senate Select Committee on Financial Technology and Regulatory Technology and a consultation on exposure draft legis uh, legislation. Question is the motion moved by Senator Urquhart on behalf of Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that business of the Senate matter number one be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell off the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, please remain in the chamber. We will be immediately proceeding to further divisions. Can I move to matter number 943 in the name of Senator Dodson? And I'll give Senator Dodson a moment to return to his seat in the division. Senator. Dodson. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I ask the General Business Notice of Motion uh, 943 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dodson. Uh, Mr. President, I move the motion and seek leave to uh, make a short statement after the government's made their statement. Senator Dodson, leave is granted for one minute. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the committee uh, being proposed would uh, begin the long journey to collect data and identify issues and challenges that may arise at the national level for truth-telling and agreement-making, issues and challenges that presently we all speculate and even hold fears about. It would, re it would review what has been happening internationally and identify what legal issues and challenges there may be at our national level if we go down the Makarata pathway. The aim of this exercise is to send a message to those who are focused solely on a voice to the parliament or to government that there are other aspects of the Uluru Statement that are not lost on the parliament. The committee would be taking an initial step to help parliamentarians and the community more generally to become aware of what some of the key elements in truth-telling and treaty-making making might be at the national level. Thank you, Mr President. Senator Dunningham. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr President. The Morrison government does support a process of local truth-telling. However, the matters referred to are matters best dealt with by the state and territory governments, and therefore we don't support the establishment of a select committee on these matters. Senator Thorpe. Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Thorpe. This country was invaded over 200 years ago, and there has never, ever in the history of this nation been an agreement with the colonisers and the first people of these lands. Now, you can roll your eyes at that, but that is the truth that you are in denial of and that we need peace in this country. And the only way we are going to get peace and equality is to go down the treaty path. Treaty is about truth-telling. 
treaty is about acknowledging our past wrongs. It's not about blame. It's not about taking your backyard. It's nothing to fear. It's about creating a new nation that we can all be a part of so that we don't have the haves and the have-nots anymore. It's about protecting each other as a community, protecting our culture, our country and our water. It's time for a treaty and it's time to wake up. The question is motion number 943 in the name of Senator Dodson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The, no. the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 943 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell her for ayes. Senator Smith, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 31. The votes being equal, the matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Can I move to matter number 1054 in the name of Senator Antich? And you can do it from there if you wish, Senator Antich. Number 154 before seeking to leave to have the uh, motion taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Antich. I uh, amend paragraph 2 of the motion by omitting 30 December 2022 and substituting 30 November 2021 and ask that the amended motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Antich. I move the motion as amended. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you. Uh, the opposition won't be supporting this select committee um, and normally uh, we do work collaboratively with all senators in this place around the establishment of committees and, ref and referrals to committees. 
Um, but we have been advised by the government that they are concerned about the level of select committees that are currently operating in the Senate and also about the level of work that references committees have and that select committees are filling perhaps part of the role that references committees have in the past and um, only to be um, given this motion on the notice paper. So um, we won't be supporting uh, this today uh, based on the government's own advice that there are too many select committees at this point in time. Senator Patrick. Bowman. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I just draw people's attention to page 485 of Odgers that says that back in 2009, the Procedure Committee recommended an understanding that there should be no more than three select committees in existence at any time. There are currently nine select committees. If uh, this is voted on today, then there will be ten. I'll just point out also uh, there is a stipend that is paid for uh, by the public in relation to these committees. So the, the a chair receives $23,240 of additional payment. A, chair, a deputy chair receives $11,620. So this is a cost to the taxpayer of $34,000. And uh, uh, at the same time, we are paying a stipend for the reference committee chairs and deputy chairs, and they seem to be being underutilised. I won't be supporting this select committee. I would support it if it were a reference committee. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Leave is granted, Senator McKim. Thank you very much. There is no doubt that uh, we do need an inquiry into the influence of big tech in this country, particularly its impact on our democracy, its impact on our media and the, the uh, way that big tech has allowed for the proliferation of far-right extremism on digital platforms in Australia. However, this motion contains language which concerns the Greens, motion, uh, language, language which is used overwhelmingly by the far-right, including uh, terms like shadow banning and deplatforming. So while we won't be uh, supporting this motion today, we do remain open-minded and of the view that uh, we do need to have a look at some of the impacts of the big tech sector on those areas I mentioned earlier. Question is that motion number 1054 as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1054, as amended, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 32. The votes being equal, the matter is therefore resolved in the negative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber for imminent divisions and to try and keep the noise down during the telling of the votes to make the clerk's life easier. Um, sorry, the, and the whips. I meant to say the whips and clerk's life easier. Could we move to matter number 1055, Senator Roberts? Senator McKenzie. Senator Roberts. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1055 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government supports the rights of individuals to make use of any pronouns or descriptors they prefer while encouraging respect for the preferences of others. The government will use language in communications that is appropriate for the purpose of those communications and respectful of its audiences. The question is that motion number 1055 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1055 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart teller for the noes.
order. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Rice. I seek leave to make a short statement about the motion just passed. Is leave granted? No, leave is not granted, I'm afraid, Senator Rice. Um, Senator. Can I move to matter number 1056 in the name of Senator Ciccone? Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1056, proposing an extension of time for the Senate Select Committee on Temporary Migration to report, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Ciccone. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1056 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes, Senator Smith tell of the noes, and ask for quiet in the chamber for the whips and clerks.
The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 32. The votes being equal, the matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Senator Seawitt, could I come to your matter number 1057? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1057 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. A short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government already has a plan. The Australian Health Protection Principal Committee, the AHPPC, has identified climate change as a health protection priority and asked its Environmental Health Standing Committee and National Health Emergency Standing Committee to undertake relevant work. Further, the government's draft national preventative health strategy recognises the environmental detriments of health, which include climate change and extreme weather events. Senator Roberts. A short statement. Leave is granted <coughs> for one minute. Thank you. We oppose this motion. According to this motion, the World Health Organization is now an expert on climate. That's not a surprise because the Swedish high school dropouts are now experts on climate. The solar minimum is upon us. According to the United, uh, University of Alabama Huntsville NASA satellite data, world temperatures in February 2021 were just 0.2 of a degree above the long-term satellite average and well within natural variation and falling. The Northern Hemisphere is setting temperature records for cold and snow. The Thames has frozen over, as it did in the Dalton temperature minimum from 1790 to 1820. It's called climate variability. There's no proof that natural weather variations are related to human activity. Climate change can have a health impact, in fact, mental impact, mental health impacts, due to the terrorism of the fear that is misrepresented in climate. The question is that motion number 1057 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Can we come to 1058? Senator Urquhart. Asking the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senator Stilljohn will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1058 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. I'll now move to 1059 in the name of Senator Faruqi. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1059 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Australia stands in solidarity and mourning with New Zealand on the two year anniversary of the attack on two mosques in Christchurch. We continue to work through all our agencies with the New Zealand government to protect all people. Australians overwhelmingly reject all forms of racism and extremism. Our strength and resilience comes from our unity as Australians, regardless of our faith or cultural background. The government is strongly committed to maintaining social cohesion. The government announced $62.8 million in funding over five years in the 2020-21 budget to strengthen Australia's social cohesion and community resilience in the COVID-19 recovery period. The 2020 Scanlon report shows strong support for Australian multiculturalism—84 per cent up from 80 per cent in 2019. The question is that motion number 1059, in the name of Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Could I now move to 1062, in the name of Senators Hanson, Young and Waters? Senator Hanson, Young. President, I seek uh, leave to amend the motion number 1062 before asking that it be taken as formal. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Hanson Young. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion as amended. The question is that motion as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1062 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell off the ayes. Senator Smith, tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 32. The votes being equal, the matter is therefore resolved in the negative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber. We have matter number 1063 in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator Urquhart has indicated she is happy to do that on Senator Gallagher's behalf. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 1063 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1063 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell off the ayes. Senator Smith, tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 35. The matter is resolved in the negative. We have a couple more matters to deal with. I understand Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, this one? Yeah, yeah. I, at the request of Senator Birmingham, pursuant to contingent notice, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent the motion number 1060 being moved immediately and determined without debate or amendment. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Patrick, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 64, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that motion number 1060 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. 
Senator Gallagher. To move motions uh, number 1058 and 1061, and that they be determined without amendment or debate. Question: Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move so much of standing orders be suspended as was prevent me from moving uh, motion number 1058 and 1061, and that they be determined without amendment or debate. Question: Is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Lambie teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 62, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I've had a request to put the two motions separately, so I'll first put matter number 1058. Those in support of that matter, that motion, say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1058 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes and Senator Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. The final matter is 1061 in the name of Senator Polly. And I'll put that matter. Those in support of that resolution say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The final matter, Senators, oh, sorry, Senator Dunningham. All the government statements relating to motions 1058 and 1061. Thank you. The final matter, is, with the leave of the Senate, I understand it's been agreed between whips. I'm going to recommit government business matter number one, the matter listing the bills exempt from the cut-off order. And I know Senator Seward has a re request. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to request that the Online Safety Bill 2021 and the Online Safety Transitional Provisions and Consequential Amendments Bill 2021, the question be put separately on that. So, that motion was amended in terms circulated in the chamber. So the motion as amended, not including those two bills just mentioned by Senator Seward, the question is that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is now to include in that motion and in that list of bills exempt the two bills mentioned by Senator Seward. Those of that opinion say to, inc uh, to include it. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Request that the uh, opposition of the Greens be noted. So the opposition of the Greens to those two bills being exempt from the cut-off order is noted. But the motion is carried in the terms as circulated and amended in the chamber. I thank senators. That concludes the discovery of formal business. Let senators leave the chamber before. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 28 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75.
The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Rice proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It's shown at item 12 in today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand the informal, that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the matter of public urgency, which is the urgent need for the Morrison government to respect the thousands of Australians who marched in the Women's March for Justice yesterday, to take urgent action to end gendered violence and sexual harassment, and to establish an independent inquiry into the Attorney General's fitness to hold that position. It's been a rough few weeks in this place. It's been a rough few weeks for women right around the country. I mean, it's been a rough few centuries, frankly. Um, but these matters have been brought to a head in this workplace with the rape of a staffer and with allegations of a historic rape uh, by the Attorney General of a young woman. Now, sadly, we know this happens far too much, far too often in many workplaces, in many homes, on the streets. But the nation's attention is now on this matter. And there is a building momentum for justice and for equality and safety for all women. Now, that was on display so powerfully yesterday. Um, and like some of the people in this chamber, um, I went down to the Women's March for Justice. I was one of the 100,000 people across the country that did that. I felt rage, but I felt strength, and I felt hope that so many people wanted action on this most crucial issue of women's safety and our rights to equality um, and to freedom from violence and abuse. Now, I think every member of parliament should have been there yesterday, and I was extremely disappointed that the Prime Minister didn't make the effort to walk out of this building for a few minutes and to do some listening. Women are hurting and all we see is this government trying to silence us, trying to ignore us and trying to distract the political attention with other announcements that it's so desperate to talk about because it doesn't want to talk about women um, and rape us in its own ranks. Women are not going to be, be placated. We are angry and we are not going anywhere. It was a really stark contrast yesterday with women hitting the streets, young women, old women, uh, men who support women's rights for safety and, um, and equality, a whole spectrum of people, lots of really strong women of colour on the speaker's podium, lots of survivors there. Um, lots of support there. But in this place, in these halls of power, the patriarchy just wanted to protect itself. The status quo just wanted to protect itself. And that was very, very disappointing. Um, we saw when the rape allegations of Miss Brittany Higgins were first made that the Prime Minister didn't know that rape was bad until he spoke to his wife. And she had to say, well, what if this was our daughters? Now, to that I say, Women have value irrespective of our relationship to a man. And the fact that the Prime Minister needed to be reminded of that and didn't intuitively know that was really the start of, uh, I think, a national heartbreak that this guy's in charge and just doesn't get it, so deeply doesn't get it. Now, that, it's just gotten worse since then um, because he had a little chat with Minister Porter, took his word that you know, it was all totes OK, didn't even bother to read the dossier from the woman that alleged that she was raped by a Christian Porter as a teenager, who's now taken her own life, who now, of course, the police can't keep the investigation open because she's not with us anymore and didn't sign her extensive statement prior to taking her own life. The system let her down, and now the system is protecting itself rather than delivering justice. For shame. So that's why women marched yesterday. 
And, um, I was proud to receive two petitions, and I'll be moving a motion tomorrow um, giving voice to those petitions. But they really articulate what women want right now. It's an inquiry into not just the rapes that have happened here in parliament, but inquiries into rapes that happen everywhere. And I want to remind people of the stark statistic, because often we hear from the men, oh, why didn't she go to police straight away? Gee, she must be making it up because she didn't go to the cops straight away. It shows absolutely no understanding of the psychology of rape, and it particularly shows no understanding of the fact that the justice system lets women down at almost every turn. We know that about 10 per cent of sexual assaults are reported because women fear they won't be believed, because they know they'll be re-traumatised, they'll be discouraged from pursuing it. But of that 10 per cent, we know that about uh, 10 per cent of that, so 1 per cent of the total, actually uh, progresses to a conviction. So 1 per cent of the rapes and sexual assaults lead to a conviction. Is it any wonder that women don't seek justice more often? Because they know it's not going to be delivered. We should be fixing that. But instead, the Prime Minister is victim-blaming, is taking the words of alleged perpetrators, not even doing the dignity of reading uh, victims' and survivors' words. And he's trying to just get off this issue as quickly as possible. It's not going away, Prime Minister. I'm so pleased that some of the members of the coalition attended yesterday's march. I'm really pleased that um, folk from many other parties attended as well. But the Prime Minister wasn't there and the Minister for Women weren't there. They should have been there because those speeches were incredibly powerful. And they called for justice for sexual assault survivors. They called for action on those recommendations in the Respect at Work report, which was tabled, what, 14 months ago now, and has barely seen the light of day. I asked about how many uh, recommendations have been acted upon yesterday. I got told a number. Um, today we hear it's three of 55 that some actions have been exerted on. Well, fine, but do better. Three is not 55. Please action all of them. I'm pleased that there's now um, a particular report into sexual harassment and the culture of Parliament House that's been established and that the Sex Discrimination Commissioner will lead that and that it will cover every worker in this building, not just the staff members but the people that work in the press gallery, the people that look after the kids um, in the early childhood education centre, the people that make coffee at Aussies. I think that culture review is going to be explosive, but what I want to know is, and what I want to see is a commitment from this government or the next that those recommendations will be acted upon, because the last ones have been uh, tantamount to being ignored, and it's not good enough. So women are hitting the streets, we are raising these issues, and we don't accept a prime minister that ignores us, that doesn't get the issues, um, and that just closes ranks and stands with his privileged white men to keep their power entrenched. It's not going to fly with the electorate. I know the Prime Minister doesn't want to listen to women, but maybe he'll listen to news poll, and that's already showing that his support and the support for his party is dropping, and I suspect this is one of the reasons why. Um, women vote, Prime Minister. Um, if that's all you care about, well, at least you can reflect on that. So we marched for justice yesterday. We will march for justice every day. We will fight for justice every day. Women belong in this building. We deserve safety. We deserve safety no matter what place we are in. And we stand united to deliver that outcome. Thank you, Senator Waters. I call Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I want to today assure all Australians that the, the Morrison government absolutely respects the thousands of Australians who yesterday attended the March for Justice. We respect their right to protest. And in particular, I want to acknowledge the bravery of survivors of family and domestic and sexual violence who have shared their personal stories. My sincere hope is the words that have been spoken by the survivors of sexual violence will create a real and lasting change to ensure every woman, young or old, is not only safe but feels safe, whether it be in their home, in, their sc in the school or in their workplace. My commitment to these women, survivors and all Australians is that I'll put every effort into doing my job in here, in this place, because I know that I have an incredibly privileged position to be able to affect change. More than 11 years ago, the first national plan to prevent violence against women and their children commenced. It was a world-leading plan, and I acknowledge those members opposite that were part of the creation of that plan. Today, along with the Minister for Women, 
I have carriage of delivery of the fourth action plan under the national plan, which seeks to end gendered violence. And we're seeing a seismic change in the discourse around the issues of family, domestic and sexual violence. This is not a conversation we could have had 11 years ago, but we are able to have it today. As a society, we know our attitudes are changing, and this has been evidenced by the evaluation and statistics, but also by the March for Justice yesterday, which occurred around the country. But there is still so much more to do. And joining with the Minister for Women in saying we are listening, we are acting and we are looking to the future, a future free of violence. One woman is killed every nine days by a current or former partner. One in six women have experienced physical or sexual violence by a current or former partner since the age of 15. This figure increases to nearly one in four women when violence by boyfriends, girlfriends and dates are included. Of concern is the fact that one in four young people are prepared to excuse violence from a partner. Since 2013, more than $1 billion has been invested directly uh, to support the fourth action plan of the National Plan. And this develops, uh, the fourth action plan de work, uh, develops on the work done over the previous three plans. $68.3 million, or 20 per cent of the total funding, has gone to private primary prevention strategies to improve attitudes towards gender equality and stop violence before it begins. I'm incredibly proud today to be able to tell you about the $18.8 million stop it at the start third tranche of the campaign, uh, which was launched over the weekend. It's a campaign which challenges disrespectful attitudes learned in childhood and that, if left unchecked, can escalate to violence. It's a campaign we know is having a real and tangible impact with research revealing that the first two phases prompted 42 per cent of all adults to take action to challenge disrespectful attitudes towards women. Primary prevention must be a focus of the next national plan, but we know we can't do this standing alone. Under the fourth action plan, we committed $82 million to target frontline services, $78 million to safe places to keep victims safe uh, um, in safe places and in their own homes, $7.8 million to work with male victims and perpetrators uh, in family law matters. And also in response to COVID-19, we quickly allocated $130 million in additional funding for frontline services, as well as $20 million to boost the Commonwealth initiatives, including 1800 Respect, a national 24-7 hotline, men's line and to promote our Help Us Here campaign. The way I'm choosing to stand up for women is, by, women is by putting every effort into rolling out significant government investment in primary prevention, early intervention, frontline services and education. Action should unite us all, not divide us, and must be above political point scoring. As a nation, now is a pivotal time for all Australians as we publicly discuss and deal with issues around sexual violence and disrespect towards women. Only yesterday I met with the Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins to discuss these very issues. We are already implementing much of the work that Kate has undertaken with the Respect to Work program, uh, including making sure that the 1800 Respect number is permanently funded into the future. The next national plan will commence in mid-22, and we are focusing on all of the new and emerging issues that weren't in existence when we had our first plan uh, 11 years ago. What we must do is we must have a prevention focus and look towards building the fence at the top of the cliff rather than being the ambulance at the bottom. We must look to what survivors are saying and what we can do to prevent violence and disrespect at the very start. Finally, I want to put on the record that I do not support an independent inquiry into the allegations of a criminal nature. Politicians, like all Australians, have the right to the presumption of innocence. We cannot support a dangerous president to stand down an individual merely on the basis of an allegation. Thank you, Senator Ruston. I call Senator Green. Thank you. Uh, this motion does a couple of things, and um, it's important to recognise that it calls on the government to act to end gendered violence, and it also calls on the government to establish an independent inquiry into the Attorney General's fitness to hold the position of the first law officer in this country. 17 per cent of women in Australia have experienced sexual violence. 16 per cent of women have experienced sexual violence from a man who they know. Eight women have died this year alone, it's March, from violence. But it's not good enough to stand here and read out statistics as the minister just did then. It's about action and it's about leadership. And that is why this parliament is calling on the Prime Minister to show 
leadership in this space. On the issue of whether we need an independent investigation, let's be clear about what we are asking for. We have heard the Prime Minister and even the Minister just now, and I suspect some senators that will speak after me, say words like, that's a matter for the police and for the courts. It, let's leave it for the proper processes. And they try to use these legal terms, I think, possibly to say to people, you wouldn't really understand, this is a really complicated legal issue. Well, this is what members of the public understand it wholeheartedly, that police investigations and criminal court proceedings are the best way, in fact the only way, to determine whether a person should be convicted of a crime and deprived of their liberty. That is the way to do that, to make that decision, to have that test. That is the rule of law that the Prime Minister has referred to on so many occasions. That is the proper process for a criminal conviction. But the rule of law does not prevent the Prime Minister holding an independent investigation into the fitness of the Attorney General to hold office. That is a different test. It does not determine if the Attorney General should be criminally convicted. That is not the independent investigation that members on this side of the House have been calling for. And to confuse the two issues does a real disservice to this very important issue and to the importance of the role that the Attorney General plays in our legal system in this country. The Prime Minister must give himself and Australians confidence that Christian Porter is a fit and proper person to hold ministerial office and not just ministerial office, but the first law officer of this country. He hasn't even read the allegations that have been made against the Attorney General. So how could he possibly decide that there is no th nothing to be investigated? We know that this just won't go away. This isn't something that this government can ride out. What the marchers showed yesterday is that women will not let this go, because we're not talking about one particular case. We are talking about systemic gendered violence taking place in our country. And I've seen people on the other side of politics try to say that uh, the allegations of the Attorney General are being used to um, somehow play out the other allegations that have been made against men in this country, other cases, other instances of violence. That is conflating two very separate issues. But it is important to understand why, when the Prime Minister gets up there and says things like, let the courts deal with it, let the proper processes deal with this issue, why that is insulting to victims in this country, because victims in this country know that the court processes don't actually deliver many convictions. Victims in this country know that court processes eliminate certain evidence, that there is a different test for a criminal conviction. That is why there are low reporting rates. It is why we have low conviction rates. It is why cases of sexual assault through the courts can take up to 40 weeks to be heard. And when the government goes out there and says that they, uh, the rule of law should be the only way to determine whether an allegation is truthful or not, when it comes to the Attorney General, when it comes to ministerial rep responsibility, it dismisses the lived experiences of victims. This has brought up so many issues for women in this country and so much anger and so, much, so many memories of things that people have been through in the past. When I was younger, I, my friend and I were at a pub and we saw a friend of her boyfriend. This man had a girlfriend of his own. He was well known and of course he was well liked. When I walked past him, he grabbed me in a way to make it seem like it was a big joke, but I had to push him off me. 
He followed us home and asked if he could sleep on the couch instead of catching a cab. I gave him a blanket and closed the door. My friend went to sleep in one room and I went to sleep in another. I woke up to the so a sound at my door and this man was half naked in the hallway. He came into my bedroom. I asked him to stop. He did stop, but not because I asked him to. He stopped because we heard a sound outside in the hallway. It was my friend. She was crying, she was vomiting. She was crying and vomiting, vomiting because before he came into my room, he had gone into her room. She woke up mid-rape. He left, I called the police. I sat with her until they arrived. I told her she could not have a shower. I gave evidence in court to support my friend. Mutual friends said things like, we will let the courts decide whose side we're on. Parts of my statement were ruled inadmissible because they were prejudicial to the defendant. It was prejudicial to the defence against the charges that he had raped one woman that he may have tried to rape another. I know what happened because I was there. And I know that sometimes the criminal court system does not find people guilty, even if, even if victims believe the truth of what happened to them. So when the Prime Minister goes out there and says that we will let the courts decide on a matter where a victim is just asking to be believed, then victims all across this country know that they have heard these words before. Language really matters. It really matters to victims. Words matter. Words matter like the words of Ms Higgins. I woke up mid-rape, essentially. That's what Ms Higgins said. I told him to stop. It was dismissed. It was played down. I was made to feel like it was my problem. I was failed repeatedly, but now I have my voice. Some words will never leave the victims of sexual assault. The words that they said to try to make it stop, the words that they couldn't get out of their mouths. These words are burned into their brain forever. They can hear when blame gets shifted. They can hear when accountability is avoided. And they can hear when people in this place say one thing, but they really mean another. The victims of sexual assault are listening very closely to the language being used in this place, and they have very trained ears. So far, this is what they have heard from the Prime Minister of this country and the Morrison government. The marches were not met with bullets. Labor politicians are playing politics with this issue. A rape victim was referred to as a lying cow. How our parliament responds to these allegations is under scrutiny right now. Our words are being dissected. So let's not leave any words unsaid. Let's not just say sorry to victims of sexual assault. Let's not just read statistics out in this chamber. We need to find a way to be able to say to these victims, this will never, ever happen to you again. Thank you, Senator Green. I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the women, the men and the children of Queensland and Australia, I say violence is never okay. The absence of mutual respect creates space for all forms of violence to appear. At every turn, in our families, our workplaces and in society, we can all be champions for mutual respect and self-respect, looking up for others and doing to others as we would want them to do to us. An approach that singles out only one aspect of the problem of violence will, firstly, never fix the problem and, secondly, makes the work to remedy the problem divisive. There's always just a perpetrator and a victim. Rather than recognising the problem is much more complex than that. These are critical relationships, and the people involved need support to find a better way of doing things. 
I reject Senator Rice's attempt to link the gendered violence and sexual harassment to the call for an independent inquiry into the Attorney General. <clears throat> Both issues must be dealt with separately. It's a desperate, attempt, desperate effort from Senator Rice to address violence by latching onto the current media furor, hoping that somehow that's the way to fix the problem of violence and harassment in our community. It's clutching at straws and greatly diminishes the genuine issues around violence, be it in the workplace, our community or at home. We need reminding that parliament makes the laws, police enforce the laws and judges adjudicate on the law. Parliament therefore has no legitimate position to establish an independent inquiry into whether the, the Attorney General ought to hold that position. That's the scope of the police, not parliamentarians. One Nation rejects violence in any form, in relationships, in families and in the workplace. We need a realistic, intelligent, determined and firm approach to addressing the violence we all know exists. We will, though, never keep the women and children safe by focusing just on them and the transgressions against them. They will become safe when we have the courage and the intelligence to deal with the whole package and all the players. These are often intimate relationships. There's much more than the violence at stake here. We will never keep the men safe either, just by focusing on them and the abuse they suffer. We need even more courage to look beyond our biases and the stereotypes of the nurturing roles we give to women. And to be honest, because one in three men also suffer abuse and violence. They too deserve protection. It's a fact that we will never keep the men safe by vilifying the women. And we will never keep the women safe by vilifying only the men. It's not up to us. It's not just up to the government to address the violence in our family units and workplaces. It's up to all of us to take responsibility for the violence and unacceptable behaviours around us. How we model respectful relationships to our children as parents is the starting point. From there, are we doing what we can when our friends are being ill-treated in relationships? In the workplace, are we standing up against those we work with when they have gone too far? How are we supporting those colleagues who have been the recipient of bad behaviour? And those who behave badly, while it is totally unacceptable, they need support to be a better version of themselves. When we alienate the person because of their unacceptable behaviour, we give up any real opportunity to remediate the situation and we run the risk of entrenching the violence and harassment. Expecting the Prime Minister or government to fix gendered violence and sexual harassment by latching onto the current media furor is an abdication of responsibility that we all have towards each other. It's a cheap and ineffective way to address a gravely serious issue of family and workplace violence and makes things worse. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I call Senator Payne. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair, Deputy President. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, this uh, motion from uh, Senator Waters uh, and the Australian Greens uh, raises uh, clearly a number of very important uh, issues, as uh, other speakers have referred to. I also do not agree with or support the uh, joining of uh, the matters relating to uh, raised in relation to the Attorney General in uh, in this re resolution, and I do think that uh, it uh, diminishes uh, the. Uh, addressing of the other issues, uh, Madam Deputy, Acting Deputy President. I wanted to talk uh, this afternoon about uh, the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children 2010 to 2022. It is our key strategic policy and response framework established to build better coordination, long-term effort to reduce violence, including efforts to address the underlying drivers of gender-based violence. We know that violence against women affects the whole community and requires a focus on primary prevention, early intervention, crisis response and recovery. And Madam Acting Deputy President, having been in this place uh, in 2010, when the previous uh, then government of Prime Minister Julia Gillard uh, introduced the national plan to reduce violence against women and their children in conjunction with the states and territories, uh, my strong recollection of that period of time is a degree of, uh, I won't even say bipartisanship, I will say nonpartisanship across the parliament, across both chambers, across all parties and across uh, all members. It seems to me 
uh, that uh, a degree of that nonpartisanship uh, is diminished, is diminishing uh, in, this, uh, in this place. As part of that national plan since 2013, the Australian government has invested more than a billion dollars to prevent and respond to violence against women and their children. And the national plan itself has a strong focus on primary prevention, stopping violence before it starts. Our, the Commonwealth uh, direct investment in the fourth action plan, which runs until 2022, uh, is uh, in the sum of $340 million. It's about uh, funding to improve frontline services to keep women and children safe, funding in support of, um, in support of and prevention measures uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in particular. We do know that primary prevention works, but we also know that it does take time. It is important that it's coupled with well-coordinated responses by the Commonwealth and the states and territories for those who have experienced violence. Uh, the funding for, uh, for operations like 1800 Respect and Men's Line is providing crucial support to women and their children who are experiencing family, domestic and sexual violence and perpetrators who want and must change their behaviour. Uh, in the last uh, uh, 12 months, Madam mm. Acting Deputy President, uh, the National Federation Reform Council uh, has agreed on terms of reference for the Task Force on Women's Safety under the uh, auspices of the National Federation Reform Council. Previous to that, uh, the women's safety ministers uh, were meeting in the context of COAG, as many will, will recall. Those terms of reference for the uh, Task Force on Women's Safety, as agreed by the National Federation Reform Council, I think are very instructive for the way in which we work together in this country. Together in this country as states and territories in the Commonwealth uh, and usually across political divides uh, to address uh, these crucial issues in reducing violence against women and their children. The task force's work will include but not uh, will encompass but not be limited to driving and reporting on actions to reduce violence against women and their children under the national plan, uh, developing and implementing a new national plan, including governance arrangements and a consultation process with a national summit on reducing violence against women and their children that was raised with me yesterday in this place by representatives of domestic violence prevention organisations. Monitoring and responding to issues relating to women's safety, including the impacts of COVID-19 on women's safety, and I'm uh, sure that Senator Rustin made reference to the Commonwealth and the states and territories work together, the funding for that during 2020, and respecting and responding to the the diverse lived experience of women affected by violence. Uh, I am looking forward, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, to the development of that national summit. Uh, it is something in which many of the stakeholders have a strong interest. Uh, and we will be discussing those plans and the uh, work of uh, all of the jurisdictions at the next meeting of women's safety mi ministers. Briefly, Madam Acting Deputy President, I can also advise the Chamber, Thank as I you. did in question time, Senator that the government Payne. is addressing a number of the Your measures called for expired. in the position. Senator Callagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, I listen with great interest to the contribution from Senator Payne and Senator Rushton. And I, I suppose what was going through my mind is they're in a fairly invidious position. They both have a level of professionalism, competency demonstrated over a number of years in this parliament. But this uh, urgency motion is the urgent need for the Morrison government, firstly, to respect the thousands of Australians who marched in the Women's March for Justice yesterday. And I think that's where the Morrison government has really let itself down, because the, uh, the Prime Minister's responses since this uh, procession of very ugly um, revelations have come to light has been, well, in my view, quite bizarre. I mean, if, if I had to go back and ask my wife about a second set of circumstances which I heard about in my workplace, I'd probably end up with a thick ear. It is just quite bizarre that you could come out and say publicly, I asked Jen and she said, what about my daughters? What about our daughters? That is a very bizarre statement. And it doesn't get much better. <clears throat> it doesn't get much better. The, the Minister of Defence had a extremely unfortunate uh, uh, series of uh, explanations and equivocations and denials and, and ultimately 
Her own office said enough's enough and started leaking on her. And uh, you know the, the the lying cow stuff is, you know, it's it's unforgivable. It is unforgivable that a you run an office where this is capable of happening. That's unforgivable. And b you can't handle it. Doubly unforgivable. And then you blame the victim. I mean, there are many, many good officers in this place. There are many places where people are treated with respect, where there are proper rules, where harassment is not permitted, not, a, not in any way, shape or form. But to have a minister's office where this, um, this person is capable of being employed and exploiting situations with vulnerable workers is a failure of leadership. It's a failure of leadership in that ministerial office. And a failure to recognise it by the Prime Minister is also quite unfathomable. You have that great honour of leading this great nation. And one thing we know over the years, and there have been many Prime Ministers who have been capable of it. John Howard came up and stood in front of people and said, you're going to lose your guns, because he knew it was right. Here we have a Prime Minister who goes, the rule of law will take care of all this. By the by, you know, there's some other things going to happen, and I'm not going to investigate it. To the general public, this is very bizarre behaviour from a person they elected to lead them, to lead the nation, and to show empathy and courage when it's required. And I don't think he's shown any empathy, and he certainly hasn't shown any courage, because it might have been traumatic for him to go out there on that uh, steps of parliament. On March the 4th, there may have been people heckling him, but it doesn't matter. You're the Prime Minister. It's your job to lead from the front with empathy, with courage, and state the programs that you've put in place. Defend your government's uh, position. You don't say, oh, you can have a private meeting with me and I'll get you a cup of Earl Grey tea and we'll all put it to bed. This is not going to bed. It's not going to bed. This parliament is going to change. And I do say this. There are plenty of officers where really good high standards on both sides of the chamber, any side of the chamber, exist. And those who transgressed should be rooted out and dispatched from this place. If you cannot provide a safe working environment for your staff, you shouldn't be here. And if you need training on that, I don't know how the hell you got here. The first bit of training I had on equal opportunity and sexual harassment was at a course in 1988. This is not new stuff. This is not new stuff. And you know if you've got vulnerable employees that you need to be watchful. You need to give guidance. You need to make sure they're looked after. And it's been a complete failure, particularly in the Minister of Defence's area, to look after her workers. That's unfathomable. Unfathomable to me. And I really do think that uh, you know, the parliament will change for the better, and the sooner it happens, the better. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. <coughs> I call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this matter of incredible public importance and urgency. Safety of our women in this country. I think that's pretty important. Yesterday, thousands of women marched for justice across the country. We marched outside this place, demanding change and accountability from this government, from this parliament, from this nation. We want accountability from all of the self-congratulating men who look at themselves in the mirror and tell themselves that they're good people, while defending rapists in their offices and workplaces. Yesterday, we demanded that the Prime Minister come out and see us, hear us all and act. Instead, he told us that we should be grateful we weren't getting shot. Women of this country heard this. You, can't, you can get raped in this very building, but at least, the Prime Minister says, you won't be shot protesting it. The Prime Minister is wrong again. Miss Joyce Clark, a 29-year-old mother of one and a proud Aboriginal woman, was shot in the stomach while having a mental health episode. 
by a Western Australian police officer who is now charged with her murder. Miss Jew died in a Western Australian police cell. One of the last things she heard as she was dying was a police sergeant, Rick Bond, whisper in her ear, you're a effing junkie. Auntie Tanya Day died in a police cell in Victoria because they refused to give her the medical care she needed after Victoria Police targeted, targeted her for having a couple of drinks and then falling asleep on a train. Miss Veronica Nelson cried this, this, sorry, Miss Veronica Nelson Walker cried out for help twelve times but was ignored. She died in her cell alone. The list of black women who die at the hands of, this, of the state in police or prison custody just goes on and on and on, and, it, and the lists will grow longer. Despite this being the 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, more and more of us are being targeted and imprisoned. Women who live with disabilities also need to be heard. Where's their voice? Given there is actually no data on our sisters experiencing violence. And can you believe the Victorian Labor government wants a treaty with our people, despite it being open season on our bodies? Our women are being locked up more than any other person right now in Victoria. Treaty with that. Black women, we move through the world with the two great big targets on our backs. Not only do we have to deal with the never-ending sexism as we move through the world or even as we move through this very house, but black women, we also have to wade through the never-ending cesspool of systemic racism. The patriarchy hates us much more not just because we are women, but because we are black women. The most underappreciated, undervalued, most disrespected, most neglected and most targeted people in this country. And still we rise. We are strong and we are powerful. We have always been here and will always be here. Yesterday was so uplifting to see so many thousands of people, largely women, come together, united in our message that rape, sexism, violence and misogyny is not a women's issue. It's an issue for our entire society to reckon with. The Black Lives Matter movement is no different. We need all of us all of us who are outraged with the continuing hurt and trauma inflicted on the First Nations people of this country, especially black women, to be part of this change. I looked out on the march yesterday and saw so many people from all walks of life who had never marched or gone to a rally before. We are all in this together, and I look forward to welcoming all of the thousands of women and allies who marched yesterday to our own Black Lives Matter rallies. You know we show up with you. We ask that you show up with us. If you scanned the crowd yesterday, you would have seen plenty of deadly black women leading the charge. I was there with my colleagues, proud Yamaji Noongar woman Dorinda Cox and proud Waka Waka Wali Wali woman Dr Janara Garang. I was also very happy to see the deadly Senator McCarthy and the member for Barton, Ms Burney, holding up our flag at the rally. Black women, we show up and we speak out. We are on the front lines of all the marches. We are some of the first to turn up for our sisters and allies. Hopefully the Prime Minister keeps his promise and we don't get shot in the street. In conclusion, the biggest irony of the parliament of this country is that it is lawless. Despite the laws coming from this place, the parliament itself 
is absolutely lawless. The thousands of men in skinny ties and pointy shoes and their bosses that crowd these corridors act as if the rules don't apply to them. They act as if they have full permission over our bodies. If the Prime Minister was serious, he would immediately, without any delay whatsoever, implement the full recommendations of the Respect at Work report by Commissioner Jenkins not just three out of 55 recommendations, WTF, for those young people who understand what I'm talking about. So I invite all of those who marched yesterday to join us at the next Black Lives Matter protests around this country, because we fight with you. Come fight with us. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. I call Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The issue of violence against women and their children is persistent, it's real, and it's deeply troubling. It goes to the heart of how many women in our community experience life, because women must be safe at work, at home, in their community from abuse by others. It's understandably emotional. I can see why people get distressed about it. But I want to make a sincere commitment here today to women who are dealing right now with the pain of scars, physical, mental, emotional. We hear you. We value you. And we are working to make things better for you. There's been a lot of politicking on this issue, and I think that's wrong. No party in this place has a perfect record on this most important of issues, and instead of thinking politics, we should be thinking about humanity. After all, those in glass houses shouldn't be throwing stones. But this motion talks about yesterday's march, and in a way, it shows every reservation I had about it. It draws a connection between the march and the desire quite well held by good people to see an end to sexual violence and then tries to use it as an excuse to string up the Attorney General in circumstances where he wouldn't get any of the protections that we would expect, indeed demand, for any other member of our community. Basic evidence, the rule of law, the presumption of innocence, these are not small things. Senator Rice's motion calls for the Prime Minister to listen and to respect those people who marched yesterday. Well, the Prime Minister offered to meet with and listen to a delegation from the march. That invitation was refused. Minister Payne also offered to discuss the issues. That offer was refused. The Prime Minister and Minister Payne offered to sit down and engage constructively with the organisers of the march to truly understand the issues they came to talk about and start working on solutions. Attending a march outside with all the yelling and the cheers and the chants wouldn't have resulted in a productive conversation. I think everyone who's serious about what we do in this place knows that that's true. There is more than one way to listen, to care and to act than to go to a rally. And I have nothing but confidence in this government's sincerity to assist women dealing with this difficulty. So the motion calls for urgent action. So I really want to outline some of the key actions we've taken of late. Since 2013, this government has invested more than a billion dollars to prevent and respond to violence against women and their children. An independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces is underway, led by Kate Jenkins, our Sex Discrimination Commissioner, and will report by November of this year. We've established 24-7 support services for staff, past, present, in any area for any party. Stephanie Foster, the Deputy Secretary to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, 
is working with the Prime Minister right now on making sure we can drive cultural change. There's been a lot of talk about the Respect at Work report, and I'm proud to say that's become my responsibility. Already this government has acted upon nine, some people say three in this place, but it's nine, <laughs> nine recommendations of the Respect at Work report, including, I'm proud to say, we've established the Respect at Work Council and it has its first meeting this Friday. It will be leading the implementation of this very report. We've funded the establishment of online platforms, training and education resources to provide um, the materials that are needed for employers and employees to know how to get the justice and safety and respect that they should have in their workplaces. And we are working through every single one of the remaining recommendations diligently in partnership with government, in partnership with the private sector, to make sure we leave no stone unturned. And we took an active role in developing and ratifying the ILO's Thank Convention you. on Eliminating Senator Violence Stoker. and Harassment. Your time's expired. So well, much Senator out. Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It was indeed an honour uh, to join the thousands of people, girls and women, strong girls and women, uh, yesterday who gathered outside this building, along with the tens of thousands who marched throughout Australia. But I'm tired, like so many others, tired of the fact that we are still marching and I'm tired of the fact that women in Australia need to still call for justice. I listened to the contribution of the previous speaker and it's with great disappointment that I remind her that Mr Morrison is our Prime Minister he is the Prime Minister of every single one of those people that marched for justice. And they deserve for him to come out and join them and listen. Listen to what they had to say. These are sad, sad stories <laughs> and indeed brave. But for every one of those stories, can you imagine how many stories are still deep down inside people? that have not yet found a way, for, a way forward to tell their stories. They deep, they, they're deep down and they never go away. They never go away. It will catch you at an, a moment that it just springs up on you, a moment that you would be unaware of. It comes back. And again, you have to start that long journey to put it behind and try to go on, keep going, because that's what we need to do. That's what women and girls need to do. We can't let, we can't be beaten by this. And unfortunately, unfortunately, the prime minister has taken a wrong turn here. He has set a path for himself that is absolutely the wrong way to go. And so is the, the Minister for the Status of Women, the Minister for Women. I, I truly do not know why they couldn't go out and just listen. That's what people were asking for. This is a, we're talking about people who have had some of the most horrific um, assaults made against them in their workplaces, in, out in the community, in their schools, in their homes. And all they were asking is for their representatives, they, the Prime Minister's their representative, the Minister for Women, are there, is there, are their representatives? They're asking for them to come home, out and listen, to respect their voices, to respect their voices. And quite frankly, I heard one of the one of the um, coalition members that did um, actually go to uh, the rally, 
saying it was really, really exciting to meet the Prime Minister. Well, I can tell her thousands of people were out there willing to meet the Prime Minister, but he didn't show up. He didn't show up. And all those uh, girls, women, and all the, the supporters out there willing for this Prime Minister to show the way forward, because we all know language means everything. His actions mean everything. The way the community enters this debate is based on the way they see their Prime Minister. We know that. But what do we get? We get met with, you know, at least you can do it without, you know, being threatened by bullets. We get, we get, you know, at least, you know, it, the offer still stands. The offer still stands. This is an appalling. If, if only they could hear what they're actually saying to people. Enough is enough. Thank you. Enough is Senator enough. Senator Brown, I call Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to add my voice in relation to the matters raised by Senator Rice following yesterday's March for Justice. Senator Rice's motion covers a number of issues, so I intend responding to each separately to ensure these important topics are not confused. And starting with respecting the thousands of Australians who participated in the March for Justice, both here in Canberra and around the country. I attended yesterday's rally, along with a number of my coalition colleagues, as I believe everyone deserves to feel safe and supported in their workplace. That includes right here in our workplace, Parliament House. I also firmly support everyone's right to be heard and to protest against injustice. I must admit, however, that I have been disappointed with the way the important issue of workplace safety has been conflated with other matters. Minister Payne stated yesterday that the March for Justice was an exercise in open democracy. That is true, and it is something we can confidently and safely do here in Australia. And I acknowledge everyone who joined the events across the country to have their say. All Australian workplaces, including Parliament House, should be safe for all who work in them. This should not be politicised, and it must be the responsibility of all who work there, regardless of gender, to work together to provide that safety. As you are aware, and as mentioned earlier by Senator Stoker, over recent weeks, the government has taken a number of steps to address the concerns raised by current and former staff and by parliamentarians. And this includes establishing an independent and confidential 24-7 telephone service to support current and former Commonwealth ministerial, parliamentary and electorate office staff and those who have experienced serious incidents in any Commonwealth parliamentary workplace. Announcing an independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces led by Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins and the Deputy Secretary of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, Stephanie Foster, will assist and advise the Prime Minister on how to improve processes to support people, in particular staff, when serious incidents arise. On the matter of ending gender violence and sexual harassment, you will recall that I asked the Minister for Families and Social Services about this topic in Senate question time yesterday. As part of the national plan outlined by Minister for Women earlier, the Minister for Women, the third stage of the Australian Government's Stop It at the Start campaign was launched, launched last week to coincide with International Women's Day. Stop It at the Start aims to prevent family and domestic violence against women and their children. Ads for the third phase of the campaign began airing on national television on Sunday night. This is one of the several measures we have introduced to ensure members of the public have the tools and the confidence to call out disrespectful behaviour when they see it. Stop It at the Start challenges disrespectful attitudes and behaviours that can often be learnt in childhood and could escalate into violence if such behaviours are left unchecked. We are asking Australians to speak up if they see disrespectful behaviour. We want people to unmute themselves. Do not ignore disrespectful behaviour and definitely do not excuse it. Speak up and call out disrespectful behaviour. Research shows that four out of five Australians agree that violence against women is driven by disrespectful behaviour. 
We all have a role to play in making sure that every one of us feels safe. This can be achieved by taking small steps and showing respect whenever we have the opportunity. As Senator Rustin said yesterday, we know that not all disrespectful behaviour results in violence, but all violence has started with disrespectful behaviour. Early intervention is key to making sure that all Australians feel safe in their own homes, their workplaces, their communities and online. In relation to the Attorney-General, it has already been noted that it would not be appropriate to hold an inquiry because New South Wales Police has closed the matter. Australian law enforcement agencies are responsible for investigating criminal matters. Under our rule of law, the presumption of innocence applies to all of us, regardless of the position we hold. It is up to law enforcement agencies and courts to determine such issues, not the parliament. And finally, as we have dealt with matters relating to domestic violence, sexual assault and situations where people feel unsafe, I think it pertinent to end this debate by noting that if anyone listening to the contributions today is impacted by sexual assault, domestic or family violence, please call 1800 RESPECT on 1800 737 732 or visit 1800respect.org.au. It is so important to reach out. We all deserve to feel comfortable and safe at work, at home and within our community. Thank you, Senator Askew. Your time has expired. So the question is that the urgency motion as moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I shall now uh, proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page five of today's order of business. Senator Urquhart, you're seeking the call. Yes. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I uh, take note of the, um, the government response to the Community Affairs References Committee inquiry into the current barriers to patient access to medicinal cannabis in Australia. Um, we had a hearing in Melbourne on the 29th of January uh, 2020. <coughs> sorry, Senator Urquhart, I think I've jumped the gun. Oh. Um, sorry, I'll come back to you and I'm, my apologies for interrupt, interrupting you, but uh, it's my mistake. So we're at consideration of docs. Um, Senator Seawitt. To uh, seek leave to table a non-conforming petition, which I have circulated to the whips. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. A non-conforming petition? Yes, which I yes. believe has been circulated. Okay. Uh, it's about the, um, the coup in Burma. So. Thank you. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. I present the government's response to the report of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. Uh, in, on its inquiry into the regulator of medicinal cannabis bill 2014 and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McGrath? Oh. Right. Two. <laughs> so I'm going to call Senator McGrath. On behalf of the Chair of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into provisions of the Aged Care Amendment Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020. And, um, on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I present the 194th report of the committee. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Um, Senator Fiavanti Wells. Thank you, um, Madam uh, Deputy President. I present the report of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation on the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight, and I move that consideration of recommendations 8 to 10 of the report be made a business of the Senate order of the day for 16 June 2021. I indicate to senators that after the question on this motion is put, I will then move a motion to take note of the report. Uh, thank you. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Fiavanti Wells be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I move that the Senate take note of the report. I rise to speak to the tabling of the final report of the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee's inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. 
Last year, 299 pieces of delegated legislation were exempt from disallowance. This means the parliament was prevented from scrutinising and having the opportunity to veto 299 laws made by the executive. This is problematic, not only because it undermines the ability of the parliament to fulfil its constitutionally mandated role as, Lord as lawmaker in chief. It is also problematic because delegated legislation, which constitutes about half of the law of the Commonwealth by volume, has the capacity to affect the daily lives of Australians in profound ways. For example, last year the parliament was unable to scrutinise laws that imposed international travel bans on Australian citizens. Uh, laws which increased the federal government's debt ceiling to $1.2 trillion and laws that changed Australian content obligations that apply to commercial television broadcasters. Just a very random example. In theory, delegated legislation should only deal with purely technical or administrative matters, but this is no longer the case. In practice, delegated legislation now often deals with matters of policy significance. An already unsatisfactory situation is becoming intolerable. The committee's interim report, tabled in December last year, focused on the exemption of delegated legislation made during times of emergency from parliamentary oversight and used the Biosecurity Act 2015 as a case study. The interim report also examined some of the systemic factors that contribute to the exemption of emergency delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. The report made 18 recommendations uh, whose implementation are necessary to ensure appropriate parliamentary oversight of delegated legislation in times of emergency. The final report that I have just tabled broadens the discussion beyond times of emergency and examines the framework for the exemption of delegated legislation from disallowance. It makes 11 recommendations that, when implemented, will ensure appropriate scrutiny and oversight of delegated legislation. The functioning of the disallowance mechanism is ultimately about the role and responsibilities of the parliament and the substance of a parliamentary democracy. It is through debate and scrutiny that the principles of accountability and transparency are manifest. Whether exemptions from disallowance are constitutional, and there are certainly differing opinions discussed in the report, the practice certainly challenges the constitutional principle of executive accountability to the parliament. Over time, the parliament has whether intentionally or not, accepted a range of rationales for exemptions from disallowance. It has done this by passing primary legislation that provides for instruments to be exempted from disallowance. The parliament has even passed legislation that allows a regulation to exempt other pieces of delegated legislation from disallowance. The committee considers that this is totally unacceptable. The committee's final report examines a number of rationales for exemption and finds the majority cannot be supported and should not be accepted by the parliament. I speak now to one particular rationale, that the making of laws has to be separated from the political process. This type of pejorative framing of politics suggests the parliament is not a representative forum and that the people's voice expressed through their representatives should not be heard. This is contrary to constitutional principle and offends the very substance of representative democracy. It cannot be accepted as a rationale to avoid parliamentary scrutiny. It is worth noting the alternative to politics is unaccountable governance, and this is fundamentally at odds with democratic principles. Should the executive be concerned about the potential for parliamentary disallowance, it should be assured it is not the disallowance mechanism that might frustrate legislative plans. It is rather poorly conceived 
legislative instruments that do not adhere to the committee's scrutiny principles, that undermine the constitutional role of the parliament, or are not in accordance with the intent of the enabling legislation or the parliament that will frustrate legislative plans. Around 1,500 pieces of delegated legislation are tabled in the parliament each year, and because scrutiny on the floor is limited to disallowing the legislation, it is the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee that assists parliamentarians in their examination of this legislation. The committee examines all disallowable delegated legislation against 11 technical scrutiny principles and brings any concerns to the attention of the Senate. Over time, the committee's work has established important precedents that have improved the quality of delegated legislation put before the parliament. Ministers and agencies regularly agree to amend legislative instruments and their explanatory statements to ensure they comply with the committee's scrutiny principles. However, the committee is not currently able to undertake this essential scrutiny on instruments exempt from disallowance. The committee must have the ability to scrutinise delegated legislation exempt from disallowance because without this ability, the parliament is not informed and if not informed, it cannot meet the constitutional requirement that it remain the ultimate lawmaking authority. As such, the committee recommends changes to the standing orders to allow the scrutiny of delegated legislation exempt from disallowance and to add an additional two scrutiny principles. The final report provides very clear guidance to departments and agencies on the grounds that might justify an exemption from disallowance. These are vanishingly small. In summary, the committee considers that delegated legislation should be subject to disallowance and sunsetting to permit appropriate parliamentary scrutiny and oversight, unless there are truly exceptional circumstances. And any claim that circumstances justify exemption from disallowance and sunsetting will be subject to rigorous scrutiny with the expectation the claim will only be justified in rare cases. Can I stress that point? Only be justified in rare cases. When we sit in this place, we are not just politicians, but we are also parliamentarians, constitutionally responsible for the laws that are made to benefit all Australians. Insisting that the role of the parliament is respected is not a judgment on the content of any piece of legislation or the legislative agenda of any government. It is rather the application of the rule of law to the role of the parliament in a constitutional democracy. Without the ability to scrutinise, the parliament cannot make policy or even technical judgments on proposed laws. With these comments, I commend the committee's report to the Senate. Senator uh, Fiavanti Wells, um, would you like to seek leave to continue your remarks? Uh, no, uh, Madam Chair, uh, although I do believe that there may be other speakers. No? So the, quest so the question is uh, as moved by Senator Fiavanti Wells and that the Senate take note of that report. All those in favour? Uh, against? Did you? Okay, so I'm calling that carried. Senator, um, I think uh, I'll go to Senator Ma uh, McCarthy because I think she's just presenting a document. Senator Hanson. Senator uh, McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, on behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee of Senators' Interests, Senator Billick, I present the committee's first report of 2021. Thank you, uh, Senator McCarthy. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System, I present the committee's second interim report and move that the Senate take note of the report. When Labor leader Gough Whitlam introduced the Family Law Bill in 1974, its purpose was to eliminate, as best possible, the high costs, delays and indignities experienced by so many divorced couples under the existing Matrimonial Causes Act. The bill was passed by parliament and became known as the Family Law Act, 
1975. For anyone who has been through the divorce court since, the Family Law Act is regarded as a failed piece of legislation that has destroyed too many lives, separated children from their parents and allowed lawyers to feed off the bones of families like vultures. The countless inquiries that have previously been conducted all agree the system does not meet the needs and expectations of many of those who go through it. Over a period of 46 years, the Family Law Act has been amended more than 110 times, yet rather than make it better each time, the changes have only made it more complicated. The current family law system has created a lottery of winners and losers. When someone loses their family, their children and everything they have worked so hard for, it brings about enormous suffering and an increase in suicide numbers by those people who are victims of the family law gamble. For the past 25 years, I have advocated for change to this unjust system. The Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System received over 1,450 confidential submissions. The evidence received was nothing short of heartbreaking. Many participants knew there was nothing the committee could do to help their past cases, but I want to thank those people because their focus was to ensure no other family or child would feel their same pain. There was also a wealth of evidence given regarding domestic violence. Let me make it very clear. Domestic violence is unacceptable and won't ever be tolerated. But this inquiry has convinced me domestic violence must be broken down into three categories. I've suggested those categories include domestic har harassment, domestic threat and domestic violence. As the definition of domestic violence stands, it carries unintended consequences for separated parents, blue card holders, police, military and the livelihoods of anyone requiring a gun licence. The current definition differs between states and territories and simply stating that you are in fear can constitute domestic or family violence. Such allegations are increasing adversarial hostilities in our courtrooms and fueling greater divide between non-custodial parents and their children. The committee is of the view the Council of Attorneys General should review the definitions of domestic violence at Commonwealth, state and territory level to bring about a uniform definition. It brings me to another point made evident by inquiry participants. Domestic violence allegations are increasingly used as a means to avoid the legal requirement for mediation. I'm very strong in my belief children have a right to see both parents unless a parent has demonstrated violent or abusive behaviour towards the child. Children must not be the collateral damage of marriage breakdowns. Parents must look past self-interest, pain and vindictiveness. I am fed up with feminists and organisations pushing their agenda that paints men as the only ones capable of domestic violence. I accept that men account for 75 per cent of this behaviour, but we cannot ignore the 25 per cent of domestic violence committed by women. The truth is domestic violence should not be tolerated by either sex. And the same applies to filicide. For those unaware of the term, it's a name given to the killing of a child by their parents. Again, there can be no excuse for heartless action taken by parents who murder their own innocent kids. On the government's website relating to filicide statistics, between 2001 and 2012, 76 per cent of the 284 children killed by a parent 46 per cent were by the custodial mother, 29 per cent by the custodial father, 14 per cent by a step-parent and 10 per cent by a non-custodian. We need to stop demonising men because perpetrators come in the form of women and men. The plight of grandparents must be, mustn't be overlooked. The rights of the child must also be considered when addressing regular contact with extended families. 
I have recommended grandparents be granted a mandatory five hours a month in person contact or at least very least contact via Skype or phone with their grandchildren. On the subject of legal costs, submissions throughout the whole inquiry were scathing of lawyers' fees. One case reported five and a half years in the courts and a legal bill above $700,000. Another 635,000. Another 950,000. This is ridiculous. Many legal costs were around 50,000 to 100,000. The evidence stated a belief that lawyers are dragging cases out and stinging clients with exorbitant fees. When the New South Wales Bar Association was questioned, they stated legal costs vary between $8,000 and $20,000 a day. My reply to them was, "I'm on pretty good money." But I couldn't afford you. Disappointment fees are another contentious issue raised many times throughout the inquiry. This is the fee charged by some lawyers if they put the day or time aside for the client and the case doesn't proceed. The committee recommends the pro prohibition of the use of disappointment fees in all family law matters. Also, the committee believes the court should better case manage and encourage the resolution of matters to avoid excessive legal costs. This includes a provision setting the maximum costs and disbursements at $50,000 or 10 per cent of the combined value of the party's property and super superannuation, whichever is the higher. We also heard evidence of perjury, false allegations and a lack of avenues to fight it. The law states perjury is an offence, but only one case has been brought against the person who perjured themselves in family law. Former Chief Justice Diana Bright believes people don't commit perjury. Instead, she is convinced witnesses believe what they are saying. On the other hand, retired judge of 14 years in the Paramount of Family Court, David Collier, said, quote, Allegations of child sexual abuse are becoming increasingly invented by mothers to stop fathers from seeing their children. The worst are those mothers who direct false allegations of abuse against former partners. End of quote. Proven false allegations and statements must be dealt with. Allowing false allegations to go unchecked destroys our justice system. People must have faith in the courts. Hence my recommendation and belief that the government should set up an independent judicial tribunal where people can take complaints of perjury and not wait in the hope that the courts will report it to police. The panel could also take complaints about judges. In my office, I have had eight individual complaints and allegations about one judge. They have fallen on deaf ears from the Chief Justice and the Attorney General. Under the Australian Constitution, judges in the federal court are appointed till 70 years of age. No other profession is guaranteed a job for life. A judge can only be sacked by both houses of parliament. If the authorities won't deal with rogue judges, then let the people have their say through the review tribunal. Due to COVID-19, the committee was set back in its efforts to bring down recommendations in the child support system. We are hopeful to address this by June 30. It is my opinion that this system is failing many parents. We must develop a fairer system. I believe it should be based on a standard of 38-hour working week, not including overtime or a second job, and based on a person's net wage. People should have incentives to move forward in life and, in some cases, building new lives for themselves and their families. If the cost of raising children was better shared, we would see fewer people withholding children from the other part for financial gain through child support. I also believe more parents will work instead of opting for the dole to avoid paying child support. I encourage all Australians to work out their differences without the heartache of family law proceedings. No one wins, especially the children. Many have said they would not wish their experience on their worst enemy. Others have lost their lives by way of murder or by, the ha by their own hand, only to leave confused and grieving families and children behind. I am grateful for the opportunity to spearhead this inquiry. The committee's recommendations are far more than what I have mentioned here today, but in truth, the Family Law Act has been band-aided too much and, in my opinion, needs to be thrown out and replaced by a simpler act. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Polly. I rise to speak on the Joint Select Committee on Australian Law System Second Interim Report, Improvements in Family Law Proceedings. 
I do that after we received 1,700 submissions to this inquiry. We had, uh, I think it was 12 public hearings and 13 in-camera hearings. But this report makes 29 recommendations to the government to improve the family law system in Australia, 29 recommendations which I urge them to take seriously. Since its exemption, the Family Law Act 1975 and the family law system has been the subject of ongoing review and reform. In fact, there have been almost 70 reviews of the family law system that has been undertaken since 1974. These reviews reflect the growing diversity of family structures and changing views in contemporary Australia. The work of this committee has followed two recent and extensive inquiries into the family law system. The House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs inquiry into how Australian law, family law system can better support and protect those affected by family violence, which tabled its report in 2017, and the inquiry of the Australian Law Reform Commission, which delivered 60 recommendations and was tabled in 2019. Two years on, and the government has not responded to the Australian Law Reform Commission's 2019 report, despite it being on of the most comprehensive reviews of Australia's family law system since the commencement of the Family Law Act. Instead of responding to the report, they established this review with a political agenda and as a cynical payoff for support on a legislative program. This government has a complete lack of regard for expert opinion and despite the immense efforts of the current inquiry where, as I said, there are over 1,700 submissions we received, I question their propensity to respond to this report. As was clearly demonstrated just weeks earlier, they rushed through legislation before the release of this report to merge the Family Law Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit Court of Australia, ignoring expert opinion in pursuit of their own agenda. The Attorney-General continues to cite the findings of a six-week desktop review of data by two accountants from PricewaterhouseCoopers as ample evidence to progress the merger. This Liberal government has made the most radical change to the family law system in over 40 years based on a short desktop review by two accountants. A review, by the way, that has been widely panned and thoroughly discredited. What is clear from this inquiry and the plethora of information from previous reviews is that the family law system does not meet the needs and expectations of too many of those who use it. What we uncovered, but might I add, not exclusive to this review, is that the costs are too high. The extensive delays in the court system causes undue harm and stress and ad adversarial nature of the family law courts is not suitable. The role of family consultants, expert witnesses and independent children's lawyers needs also to be evaluated. Another important issue that needs to be further evaluated is the impact that family violence is having on proceedings and the interaction of the family law and family violence jurisdictions. It is clear that this system needs overall, and the very appropriateness, appropriateness of the legal framework must be assessed. And the Morrison government's standard of response of setting up an inquiry after an inquiry when they've had the Family Law Commission's reports, and what have they done? Nothing in relation to those, uh, those matters and recommendations. The issues of delays in the family court is not new. It is not new. As highlighted in the first interim report, the Australian Law Reform Commission's report found that one of the key themes emerging from its inquiry into the family law system was that it was too slow. Access to courts and services was so delayed that people told us they had to wait excessive amounts of time to receive assistance or take steps towards resolving their dispute. Many felt frustrated by this, and some said that their dispute 
escalated and or they were left in situations that were unsafe for themselves and their children while awaiting access to courts. The key reasons for delays are the lack of resources of the courts, so that matters simply cannot be transitioned through the court process in a timely manner. This has occurred due to chronic underfunding funding from consecutive Liberal governments of the family law system and failure to make timely appointments of judicial officers and registrars. This has created a backlog of cases, produced delays and frustrated the proper management of the resources that the courts have. The government has given itself a big pat on the back by announcing four newly budgeted juries jurisdictional positions on the Family Circuit Court, but they haven't filled these positions. Disgracefully, the Morrison government won't even invest the resources that it has committed. Right now, in my home state of Tasmania, there is currently only one judge to preside over family law matters. One judge. The Morrison government has failed to appoint another judge to hear family law cases, and this is causing delays across the whole state and exacerbating the anguish and frustration of families who are already in very difficult circumstances. Now we have a situation where that one judge is doing the work of three, and this just should not be accepted. It's unacceptable. And the acting Attorney General, Michaela Cash, would not even say when the replacement of both judges would be appointed or if the government would do anything at all to alleviate the pressure on the sole remaining judge. These courts are dealing with parents, parental arrangements, financial settlements, and the delays are putting more and more stress on people's lives. And at the centre of this is always the children that are involved. And we have heard gut-wrenching evidence about the impact that going through uh, family breakdown has on children and on those individuals. But when there's delay after delay through the family court circumstances, then in terms of the mental health of these young children, it has an absolutely devastating effect on them. Now, we know nationally there are five vacancies in the Federal Circuit Court, five empty chairs that the Morrison government is either too lazy or too callous to fill. Allegations of family violence are present in most matters that reach the family court. Now this inquiry was set up because there were grumblings from some members and senators that claims of violence was not always true. Although there are problems with family violence orders, their value in providing protection should not be underestimated. What we found is that there is no imperial evidence to support notions that false allegations are widespread in the family law system. And that has to be emphasised. There is no evidence to say that women go to court and lie about family violence. If anything at all, women are hesitant to raise domestic violence and family violence. The research shows that false allegations are much, much rarer than the issue of victims and survivors not re reporting abuse and minimising and denying abuse by men who use violence. That's the reality of the circumstances. As addressed in this final report, it is, it's the delays in the family court proceedings, and if they're not addressed, what we will see is drawn out more devastated families, children who will continue to self-harm because of these outrageous delays and the lack of funding that's there to support these families going through these breakdowns. We have had enough reports, we've had enough recommendations. It is actually time, it is time this government was to act. This is no longer about photo opportunities and a Prime Minister who's full of spin. What we want to see is a properly funded court system that can deal with these family circumstances as quickly as possible for them to be resourced, to have the registers, to have the expert judges that can sit in deliberation of these important issues. That's the responsibility of the federal government to provide that, and we are calling on them to act on this report. Don't allow it to go gather dust like the other reports, like the family law you, deserves Polly, so much expired. more. Senator Waters.
Thank you, President. And I too rise to speak on the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System Second Interim Report. The Greens opposed this inquiry from the outset, not because we don't acknowledge there's problems in the family law system, but because these problems have been the subject of numerous comprehensive inquiries in the past, and no action has yet been taken to act on or implement any of those reforms. This politically motivated inquiry sought to relitigate those issues. It sought to delay implementation of previous recommendations. It emboldened, in my view, domestic violence offenders, and it re-traumatised victim survivors and their children. Experts and service providers opposed this inquiry. They noted that survivors would not feel safe given the predetermined views expressed by the deputy chair and tacitly supported by the government. And the Law Council withdrew its initial support uh, for the inquiry following early hearings. The then president, Pauline Wright, said, we are now concerned the inquiry is being used for political purposes to undermine domestic violence claims made by women and thereby putting vulnerable families at further risk by inciting hatred and excusing domestic violence." End quote. The government should have prioritised evidence-based strategies to make family law safer for victims and survivors of family violence, rather than allowing this compromised inquiry to proceed. Uh, I want to place on record our strong disagreement uh, with recommendation 12 of the committee re report regarding perjury. The idea that women routinely weaponise the family law system against their ex ex-partners and concoct or exaggerate domestic and family violence was the explicit basis on which this inquiry was formed. The tacit acceptance of this idea by the government is incredibly dangerous. It sends a message to victim survivors that they won't be believed. It emboldens abusers and it can lead to women to agree to inappropriate parenting arrangements to avoid the risk and the trauma of a court hearing. Many submissions and the bulk of relevant expert evidence to this committee contradict the prevalence of false allegations in family law proceedings and noted that women often under-report violence because of concerns that disclosures of violence will disadvantage their case and jeopardise the safety of their children. I want to quote uh, from No to Violence. It's an organisation uh, focused on men's behaviour change. They said to the committee, and I quote, there is an often broadcast belief that mothers in the family court fabricate allegations of family violence to help their family law cases. However, the evidence shows that this is not the case and that women are disinclined to raise family violence allegations due to a fear of not being believed. The research shows that false allegations are much rarer than the issue of victim survivors not reporting abuse and the minimisation and denial of abuse by men who use violence." End quote. The Queensland Law Society held a similar view. Um, so rather than supporting the need uh, for tougher responses to perjury, as we see from the deputy chair and from the committee report, these observations demonstrate the importance of ensuring that family law matters are actually heard by experienced, specialised judicial officers um, with uh, actual understanding and training in the dynamics of family violence. And of course, this specialisation is what's at risk with the now uh, passed through this chamber merger of the family court and the federal circuit court. We strongly oppose that merger, which is essentially just an abolition of the specialist fa uh, family court. Now, um, we heard evidence during the inquiry that increased efficiencies between the Federal Circuit Court and the Family Court were already being achieved uh, through administrative pro uh, processes and practices, such as harmonising the rules, without the need for a formal merger. And in fact, the, the formal merger of the courts would simply divert resources from the implementation of those efficiency practices and other reforms recommended by previous inquiries. But crucially, the merger will also reduce specialisation in a court that relies on specialist expertise to navigate complex matters and to ensure the safety of children. And while a number of the judges on the Federal Circuit Court have some family law experience, they don't have the detailed expertise, the jurisprudential experience or family violence training to preside over complex family law matters. So that's why the first recommendation in our additional comments uh, to this uh, committee is that the merger uh, be unwound, uh, and we will continue to oppose that. 
Now, funding and resources was the next crucial issue that I think we all knew before this inquiry was even, uh, even begun and the government seems to still um, willfully not listen to. But the significant um, delays that are experienced in the family court system are due to the complexity, they're due to the prevalence of family violence matters uh, in the family court, and they are, of course, due to the under-resourcing and the understaffing of those courts. Review after review has confirmed that the entire family law ecosystem is overstretched and under-resourced. This was echoed in so many submissions um, and evidence to this inquiry. Now, I want to note that we are broadly supportive of the committee report's recommendation for more registrars, but it is crucial that those registrars have the necessary family violence training and practical experience to identify risks. And the res uh, resources for additional registrars must not come at the expense of specialist judicial appointments. Many family law matters simply can't be resolved in a way that ensures the safety of children without a judicial hearing. There are limits to what a registrar can achieve. So we strongly support the appointment of more uh, family court judges and a clear process to quickly fill future vacancies with appropriately qualified judges to manage the specialist expertise, uh, to maintain the specialist expertise that's needed for these complex family law matters. Uh, judicial resources should be directed uh, to registries based on need, not based on special deals with the crossbench to uh, pass a law that uh, will result in uh, reduced access to justice for many women and children. Um, and we acknowledge that there are currently nine vacancies and more than 10 additional upcoming retirements, so the government needs to get its skates on. Um, on the question of funding, of course we need to ensure that legal aid and community legal centres are properly funded, uh, and we welcome uh, a small amount of increased funding through that National Legal Assistance Partnership, but more and secure funding is essential to meet existing demand, let alone predicted demand. We need adequate resources for family consultants, report writers and independent children's lawyers to support the court's work in finalising matters. And of course, we need significant capital, capital investment in the courts so that they have the appropriate infrastructure, hearing rooms, meeting rooms, um, staff spaces to both meet demand but ensure that there's sufficient space for safety. So we made a number of recommendations calling for the urgent appointment of specialist family law judges to fill current vac vacancies and to add five more. We need extra judicial capacity. Uh, we want those future vacancies to be filled in a timely manner. Um, we recommended that there be additional uh, resources for the appointment and retention of experienced registrars, family consultants um, and other staff to provide culturally safe wraparound uh, responsive support to parties uh, for the court. We uh, call for at least $310 million a year in funding for legal assistance, which is what the Law Council has said we need in order to make up for the cuts that have been wrought down on um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services and other community legal centres. And we're calling for $12 billion over 12 years, that is a billion dollars a year under the upcoming National Action Plan to reduce violence against women and their children, um, to fund proper prevention programs and, of course, to fully fund frontline uh, response services. I'll finish my remarks shortly because I know my colleagues have some uh, comments to make on other matters, but we particularly support uh, the recommendations in the committee report about accreditation and ongoing professional development for family law professionals, for judges, for registrars, for family consultants and for report writers. Um, that, uh, particularly in, re in regards to family law report writers, there needs to be decent accreditation and oversight and ongoing training, um, given the influential role they play in the system and the delivery of justice and the keeping uh, children safe. Um, just one final point. We support the committee recommendation for a harmonised definition of domestic and family violence, and that must have regard to the growing uh, understanding that coercive uh, control and coercive behaviour, um, we should have that harmonised approach nationally. But we strongly oppose the proposal, not by the committee, thankfully, but by Senator Hanson, that domestic violence somehow be categorised into levels of seriousness. The evidence is showing that coercive control, which is non-physical violence, 
um, actually leads most likely to lethal outcomes, um, more so than physical violence. So um, strongly reject that assertion and thank goodness this thing's finished. Right, thank you, Senator Waters. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Uh, is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Um, I think that takes us to the end of tabling its consideration of committee reports. So we'll now go back to the documents on page five and I'll uh, go to Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Look, I won't, um, I won't take a long time, but I just want to respond to the government response to the Community Affairs References Committee 2020 inquiry into the current barriers to patient access to medicinal cannabis in Australia. Um, we had a hearing in oh, Melbourne on the 29th of January 2020. Um, the evidence we heard there, and I just want to focus on one particular recommendation and one area in this, and I'm hoping that Senator Seawert, when she's finished, will seek leave to continue her remarks so that I may want to come back at some time. But um, the evidence that we heard was regarding Tasmania's non-participation in the scheme that was designed to streamline access to medicinal cannabis in appropriate circumstances. Um, that evidence was from the president of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, uh, and he stated that the college found it odd that in Tasmania GPs were not able to prescribe medicinal cannabis, as were GPs in other jurisdictions. In fact, Tasmania only, in Tasmania, only specialists could prescribe medicinal cannabis. The report was tabled in March 2020. Uh, again at that same hearing, adjunct professor John Skerritt stated that Federal Health Minister Greg Hunt had committed to making access to safe medicinal cannabis medications available via those mechanisms to all Australians, but that at a COAG meeting of health ministers, unlike other states, Tasmania had not signed on to the scheme at that time. Um, following that hearing, Senator Billick, who was also on the um, inquiry with me, uh, and I wrote to the Tasmanian Health Minister, Sarah Courtney MP, in relation to our concerns around this issue. That letter was sent on 31 January 2020, so a couple of days after we had the hearing in Melbourne. Nothing was received from Minister Courtney. No acknowledgement or receipt of the letter, nothing. On 14 July 2020, I sent a copy of the same letter to Minister Courtney, reminding her of the letter and requesting a response. I did at that time, I think it was the same day or the day after, get at least a recognition uh, that they had received the correspondence. But here we are in March 2021 and still no solid response to that um, correspondence. So now we've got the federal government response to the recommendations contained in the inquiry report. There were 20 recommendations in that report, and of those 20 recommendations, eight were noted, six were accepted, one was not accepted, and five were accepted in part. And the one that I want to refer to here is today's recommendation 11. And that recommendation says, the committee recommends that the Tasmanian government immediately join all other jurisdictions in participating in the Therapeutic Goods Administration single national online application pathway of accessing unregistered medicinal cannabis and reducing state-based requirement for medicinal cannabis approval. So that was the recommendation. The government response noted the recommendation and said, the Commonwealth has a standing offer for Tasmania to join the online scheme subject to Tasmanian agreeing to process applications within a 48-hour time period. This condition was outlined to all jurisdictions upon the creation of the online portal in 2018. All jurisdictions currently participating in the online scheme agreed to this requirement prior to joining. Participating jurisdictions have been processing applications in a timely fashion, in some cases in a matter of hours. The decision whether or not to take part in the national scheme is ultimately one for the Tasmanian government to make. The Commonwealth stands ready to work with the Tasmanian government on join, of joining the online scheme subject to the conditions outlined above. On 9 March 2021, so just a few days ago, I wrote again to Minister Courtney regarding this and have requested an urgent response to my correspondence, given that it has now been well over 12 months since I initially wrote to her and have had no substantive correspondence. And this is not the only piece of correspondence that I have written to Minister Courtney on over a number of issues and have not had the courtesy of a response. 
So while I've been waiting for that response from Minister Courtney, many, many Tasmanians have been waiting for the relief that medicinal cannabis might bring to them. It seemed like, at that time, Minister Courtney didn't care about the suffering of Tasmanians, that they had to go to a specialist to get a, G, uh, to get a prescription for medicinal cannabis, which was one uh, out of the realms of any cost of, of those individuals to try and get, let alone get a specialist appointment to do it. Well, finally today, guess what? The Premier of Tasmania, in a State of the State address, has announced that GPs in Tasmania will be allowed to prescribe medicinal cannabis. So I do look forward to the response from Minister Courtney now. Maybe she'll get to work and write a letter and respond to me outlining that, outlining this, the details of the scheme, which I understand will commence from the, the 1st of July this year. So I am pleased that that is now happening in Tasmania, but I am very disappointed that the many, many Tasmanians have had to wait for a very long time. And I like to think that the num numerous letters and prompts that I have sent to Minister Courtney may have actually had some action on this. Thank you, uh, Senator Urquhart. Um, Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy President. I too rise to make a, a contribution on the government's response to the Senate Community Affairs References Committee on Barriers to Patient Access to Medicinal Cannabis. Um, I uh, chaired this inquiry and was quite frankly shocked by um, some of the evidence that we received and the impact it's having on Australians' access to medicinal cannabis. I'm pleased that the government has finally handed down this response and um, because this report made a number of what I consider very important recommendations that will help to improve the lives of many Australians uh, looking for um, support looking to be able to use medicinal cannabis to address their very significant um, uh, issues. Throughout the inquiry, the committee received evidence of inequitable access to medicinal cannabis across jurisdictions, with patients in rural and remote communities finding it particularly difficult to access medicinal cannabis in their local um, in their areas, particularly if their local health professional is unwilling to consider prescribing it or does not have sufficient knowledge of it. The committee also received significant evidence from patients who were unable to meet the costs of travelling into cities to access health services or having to relocate to other regions in order to access medicinal cannabis. The lack, of patient, the lack of patient access is having a detrimental impact on the mental and physical well-being of patients and their families. This is a postcode lottery for many Australians who shouldn't um, have to be going through this in Australia. Um, there were many barriers to access to medicinal, medicinal cannabis, despite the fact that there is supposed to be now better access. I was disappointed to see that the government only noted a number of important recommendations, including recommendations one, two and three, on training and accreditation processes for doctors. Recommendation one recommended that the department develop targeted uh, education and public um, awareness campaigns to reduce stigma around medicinal cannabis within the community. Globally and here in Australia, COVID-19 has shown us that working through dis digital innovation has achieved positive outcomes, providing access for education, training and service delivery via telehealth and other platforms which are cost-effective and efficient in connecting Australians, regardless of geographical distances. The government has no excuse not to look at how we can develop training programs to ensure doctors are equipped to prescribe medicinal cannabis, because this is one of the significant issues that we heard about was doctors' uh, either reluctance to, um, to prescribe medicinal cannabis or a lack of understanding, particularly as some doctors were trained before this became uh, medicinal cannabis became uh, known and was um, uh, so they didn't, uh, and for its uh, medicinal purposes and uh, use, and and or are sceptical about the evidence, and they certainly need to uh, understand better the evidence around medicinal cannabis. Under recommendation three, the committee recommended that the Australian um, Medical Council make mandatory the inclusion of modules on the um, endocannabinoid system and medical cannabis 
uh, sorry, medicinal cannabis in curriculums delivered in medical schools. Again, because we need to ensure that doctors uh, uh, have training and awareness of uh, medicinal cannabis. Doctor education is critically important, both medical student, for medical students during their studies and for practising doctors seeking more information and training. And we believe the government should be supporting this. I am particularly disappointed to see that the government did not accept Recommendation 5, which stated that if the TGA failed to address barriers to regulation, then a new independent regulator should be considered. The TGA has not fixed the barriers to um, regulation, and it's still a hodgepodge in this country. It is clear that we haven't fixed the issues around regulation. Patients are still needing to rely on the black market to get access to this essential medicine. I'm calling on the government to either fix this mess pronto or overhaul the system and put in place an independent regulator immediately. Patients can't wait any longer. We heard a lot of evidence. We had a day's uh, hearing, as Senator um, Urquhart has just articulated, and we got a, num a number of submissions that articulated very clearly the problems on access and the fact that the current system makes access so expensive that people have to go to the black market, and people don't want to go to the black market. But people are suffering. People on low incomes in particular are not able to access medicinal cannabis easily and it's very costly if they can, and we heard um, a great deal of evidence about that. This needs fixing. The re government's response to this is inadequate because they fail to see the urgency of the need to fix access to medicinal cannabis. The regulations across the country are hodgepodge and uh, are nonsensical in many areas, including where fences are required, the use of the, the particular um, plants if they're um, for medicinal, cannibal per uh, medicinal, medicinal cannabis purposes or for other purposes. Same plant, different size fence. You know, those sorts of things are just ridiculous. We need an independent regulator immediately, immediately. Other recommendations only noted was, recommend, for example, recommendation 18, which recommended the implementation of, implementation of a compassionate pricing model for patients facing significant financial hardship in, in accessing medicinal cannabis products to treat their health conditions, which goes to the point that I was just making. So many people cannot afford medicinal cannabis, and they have to go to the black market. And people were very distressed about having to do that and, of course, about the consequences for doing that. Cost is a hugely prohibitive factor for many, many patients. And we heard from, recall we heard from our parents who are, um, talked about their um, sons or daughters' um, access to medicinal cannabis and the fact that um, they were uh, having to go to the black market. That is appalling. We need legal medicinal cannabis products through a regulated system to be available, to be readily available, and government needs to ensure this happens. Um, there is a lot of concern around this in the community, the fact that this isn't fixed and the fact that the government needs to do better and they have it in their remit to do it. I urge the government to particularly relook at that recommendation five, which talks about the need for independent, uh, an independent regulator, and the Greens will continue to pursue this matter because it is urgent. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Is leave granted? Uh, there being no objection, leave is granted. So we've got two other committee reports on page five. Um, under committee reports presented out of sitting. No one's seeking those. We will now go to ministerial statements. Minister. I thank you. I table documents relating to the order of the production of documents concerning aged care cases of COVID-19. Thank you. 
Uh, and I table responses to questions taken on notice during question time on 4 February 2021, asked by Senator Green relating to the tourism industry, and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Minister. And I believe there's some committee memberships. <coughs> The President has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. I seek leave to have a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Thank you. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Oh, no, more messages. Yes, thank you. More messages. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment supporting Economic Recovery Bill 2024 concurrence. Minister. Uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the. Uh, the question is that um, the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to consumer credit and consumer leases and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, have another one. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead, Minister, please. Thank you. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. Yes, beg your pardon, that was my bad. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Treasury Laws Amendment reuniting a uh, more superannuation bill of 2020. Um, I think call the clerk. Business of the Senate Order of the Day number one, Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee report relating to the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment banning dirty donations bill 2020. Uh, Senator Brockman. On behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee, I present the report of the Committee on the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Banning Dirty Donations Bill 2020, together with documents presented to the Committee. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Call the clerk. Government Business Orders of the Day number one, Fair Work Amendment Supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Urquhart. In the very short time that I have left, Madam Deputy President, um, I would like to just um, finish, off my <coughs> finish off my contribution with some words from some real people out there who have been, been, were listening earlier when I spoke about the effect of the, uh, uh, the bill that the government is before us today in relation to casual workers. Some of the comments I've received through the tweeting has been, I have nothing but painful memories of labour hire, nearly two years unable to get a house loan, a car loan through shonks, a wife and two little ones depending on me. Boss said he'd love to put me permanent, but only if another permanent leaves. Another comment was, laid off uh, at Christmas for two weeks, to, turned into two months. Nobody chooses labour hire. Another one that I got was, I don't qualify for a home loan on a disability pension, even though I have an impec impeccable record. Irony is my rent is more than my son's mortgage. Or even a smaller loan for a car, even with an excellent credit record. Another tweet from uh, another uh, person out in, in the real world. 
Over-casualisation of the workforce has created inequality and is tearing at the social fabric of Australia. Another one, the amount of evidence and information I had to provide to get pre-approved for a home loan this year as a freelance freelancer was ridiculous. I can only imagine how much harder it would be for casual workers. And the last one, just that I'll go out, given that I'm, I'm running out of time, was thank you uh, for pointing out how impossible it is for casual workers to get home loans. The IR omnibus bill will not entrench this injustice. Uh, sorry, will entrench this injustice. These are messages from the people out there that I think the Prime Minister Scott Morrison should have spoken to. As I said earlier in my contribution, he should have got a remit from the Australian people before Thank he put you, this Senator legislation Urquhart. to the Your parliament. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Madam Deputy President, I'm very pleased that Senator Urquhart spoke about labour hire before I rose to speak on this bill because it actually triggered a few memories. Uh, in my mind with respect to labour hire and the tradition of labour hire companies actually donating, donating to members of the Labor Party. And I'd like at the outset to read from an article dated July 8, 2015 from the Sydney Morning Herald. And the title of this article is, and I quote, Bill Shorten failed to disclose $40,000 donation from labour hire company Unibuilt to his 2007 election campaign." End quote. He, he forgot. Oh, he's done it now. Senator Farrell says he's, he's done it now. How long did it take him, Senator Farrell? How long did it take him, Senator Farrell? How long did it take him? I'll continue. I'll continue order, to quote. Order. I'll continue to quote. I'll continue to quote from the uh, Sydney Morning Herald article. Senator Farrell has shown his in keen interest in reliving these memories, and I'm happy to accommodate him. So I'll continue to quote. Opposition leader Bill Shorten failed to declare a political donation of about about well, a thousand here, a thousand there, forty thousand dollars from a labour hire company he received in the lead up to the 2007 election campaign. In his much anticipated appearance before the Royal Commission into Trade Unions on Wednesday, Mr Shorten admitted the donation was only declared to the Australian Electoral Commission in recent days." End quote. Recent days. Now, Senator Farrell, this, uh, this news article was dated 8 July 2015, and this donation of about $40,000 was made in the lead-up the lead the lead to the 2007 election. In the lead up. Order. So by my figuring, by my Order. by my figuring, that's about an eight year delay. Now I'm sure Senator Farrell, knowing you as I do from being in this chamber for the last over the last year and a half, that you would not, you would not, I'm absolutely sure that you would not omit to make such a declaration. Absolutely sure. But Senator Bill Shorten did, the opposition leader at the time, Bill Shorten, he uh, he just well he forgot. And the article continues in relation to a few other matters, including, of course, uh, and I'll again quote, Mr Shorten also faced questions about his knowledge of the paying conditions of workers at Melbourne cleaning firm Clean Event and how the firm's employees became members of the AWU. End quote. Now, can I say to you, Madam Deputy President, that if I were in the position of one of those workers, I'd much rather, I'd much rather be represented by Senator Farrell in his previous days or Senator Ciccone from the Shoppies Union. I'd ma much, rather, much rather be represented by Senator Farrell or Senator Ciccone. And I should note, um, I, I, did admire, I did admire in my teenage days the fact that the Shoppies Union did reach out to the Solidarity Movement in Poland, reached out to the Solidarity Movement in Poland and actually formed a bridge, a bridge across a bridge from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere and supported the solidarity unit. So I, I admire that. I admire far less, my far less uh, Bill Shorten, then opposition leader, failing to disclose a $40,000, about $40,000 donation from uh, a labour hire company. A labour hire company. There you go. Evil, evil. Mr. President. In speaking of this legislation, I'd like to make some preliminary remarks with respect to the reform process generally. And I think it is a shame in this country today that when we see a reasonably modest, a reasonably modest and sensible proposed 
uh, bill containing uh, some amendments to Australia's current industrial relations system, there is such resistance, resistance from those opposite. And it is a shame, because this is not a bill which has been presented on any ideological basis whatsoever. One of the speakers opposite, I think it was Senator Urquhart, actually in terms of her uh, earlier contribution, said that this reform, and actually I think Senator Farrell made comment of this too, that this reform was coming out of the government seeking to take advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is simply, Mr President, that was simply untrue. Untrue. And the reason I can say that, the reason I can say that with some authority is that so many of the elements contained in this amending piece of legislation were, were uh, referred to by the Productivity Commission in its report in 2015. In its Productivity Commission report in 2015, a lot of the issues that are addressed in this bill were referred to in the Productivity Commission's report in 2015. And so it is really base politics. It is base politics to actually try and characterise the elements of this bill as being some sort of ideological warfare. It's far removed from that, absolutely far removed from that. It is simply a modest suite of, rec of uh, principles and proposed changes to Australia's industrial relations system to take into account real inefficiencies. Real inefficiencies. Now, I'd like to walk through a number of elements of the changes. The first, dealing with casual employees. And just to provide some context to this, just to provide some context to this, the fact of the matter is that in cer certain circumstances where there is uncertainty, genuine uncertainty with respect to the pattern of work, the hours which an employee is going to be able to be given in a workplace, that it is appropriate. It is appropriate for that work, uh, that employee, to be considered a casual employee. So the first, the first element of the suite of amendments introduced in this legislation deals with providing a definition of a casual employee. Now, Mr. President, you wouldn't have thought, you would not have thought that this would be an earth-shattering proposal. You wouldn't have thought this would be an earth-shattering proposal, that we should actually have a definition of what it means to be a casual employee. Because that was something, that was something that those sitting opposite failed to provide for, failed to provide for when they introduced the current provisions. And how earth-shattering is our definition that's proposed of casual employee? Let me quote it. An offer of employment made by the employer to the person is made on the basis that the employer makes no firm advance commitment to continuing and indefinite work according to an agreed pattern of work for the person. I fail to see anything controversial, anything controversial in relation to that definition. And then there's a proposal, then there is a proposal contained in the bill that would actually clean up, clean up an issue that has arisen with respect to uh, the legal system determining that someone was a casual employee when the employer, in good faith, considered that uh, they had hired someone uh, not on a casual basis, I should say, not on a permanent basis. And there was a court decision in the Workpack case which provided that an employee could effectively double dip in that situation. So the employee has been hired on the basis that the employee on the on the basis that the employee on, on the basis that the employee was a casual employee. They were being paid on the basis they were a casual employee. They were given loading. They were given loading to cover the entitlements which Sen Senator Farrell is referring to. They were given loading. They were given loading, and then it was and then it was determined that they were not a casual employee, so they could keep the casual loading but also get the benefit of the entitlements. You can't have it both ways. You can't have you can't have the double dipping. You can't have the double dipping because the impact of that is now there are thousands of Australian employers across this company across this country who've had to provide for contingent liabilities in an amount estimated to be $39 billion because of the uncertainty, because of the uncertainty which is now in the system. Because of the uncertainty which is now in the system. 
It needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed, and this bill achieves that. The next issue I'd like to move to is that with respect to the modest proposals in relation to the award system. And there's no doubt, there's no doubt that with the COVID pandemic there still needs to be some flexibility provided in the retail and hospitality sectors. And the Act, the bill provides again for some relatively modest proposals in that respect. Again, these proposals are only intended to uh, continue for a further temporary period of two years. And that is certainly in keeping with the temporary targeted and proportionate approach the federal government has taken with respect to all of its measures. There's also a proposal which would allow employers and part-time employees to agree, to agree that a part-time employee would undertake further work at their relevant rate without attracting overtime rates. And the whole purpose of that, the whole purpose of that is to avoid a distortion which is occurring, a distortion which is occurring where employers are not able to provide those further hours to part-time employees because of the higher rates. So those part-time employees are losing out on those hours. And the whole gist of this bill is to provide circumstances and a situation where employers and employees can agree, can come to an agreement, the employer and the employee coming to an agreement that's in their mutual best interests so that the part-time employee can get the benefit of additional hours. And I should say in that regard, there are also a number of checks and balances, safeguards to protect employees, to protect employees. And those include a maximum number of continuous days of work, the part-time employee has to be working at least 16 hours a week, and there are protections with respect to employees under the age of 18. And that's clearly appropriate. The third area I speak to is that of enterprise agreements. Now, this country needs more enterprise agreements, not less. It needs more enterprise agreements so that employers and employees taking into account the specific circumstances of a relevant enterprise can come to a mutually beneficial agreement which maximises their collective positions. We need more enterprise agreements, not less. The fact of the matter is the current law, as it's been interpreted, is actually driving employers away from negotiating enterprise agreements. And that is against the best interests of both employers and employees, and it's also against the best interests of Australia as a nation. The fact of the matter is that enterprise agreements pay on average 69 per cent or $540 per week more than award wages. $542 per week more than award wages. So why would we possibly have a system? Why would we have a system that drives employers back to the award when enterprise agreements on average provide 69 per cent per week more than award wages? There's something wrong with the system if it's driving employers away from negotiating enterprise agreements with their employees. And there's a number of modest proposals which would address some of the issues in that regard, and I believe would lead to better outcomes for both employers and employees. Schedule 4 of the bill deals with greenfield agreements and provides that greenfield agreements could last for a term of up to eight years as opposed to four years. And can I tell you, coming from the mining industry, where in my role I used to conduct due diligence with respect to prospective investments all over the world on five continents. I counted them before this speech. I looked at industrial relations systems on five continents when the company I was working for was trying to determine will they invest a capital dollar in this country or will they invest it in Botswana, in Chile, in Laos, wherever. And one of the issues, one of the issues that was always apparent in terms of the Australian industrial relations system at the moment was that uncertainty created by enterprise agreements only lasting for four years if the time to construct a major project extended beyond that four-year term. Because if we've learned anything over the last few years, the fact of the matter is that when unions, lawless unions in particular, and I don't talk about the SDA here, but in particular the mining division 
construction division, I should say, of the CFMMEU, the construction division of the CFMMEU has any leverage, has any leverage, has any leverage, or will use that leverage and hold a gun to the head of those who are trying to get a major built, project built on time and within budget. And can I just say this notion that in some way the interests of the employers and the employees have to be out of alignment is simply incorrect. Is simply incorrect. If you're building a major project, you are absolutely incentivised to keep the employees who started working on the project with the project for the duration of the project. That's the first point. You want that continuity of employment. And secondly, you want the project finished within budget and on time, and you'll be prepared to incentivise the employees who are working on the project. So with that concluding comment, Mr President, I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Green, it being 7.20, I propose that the Senate do now adjourn, and I call Senator Brockman. Thank you very much, Mr President. I rise tonight to make a brief contribution to acknowledge the extraordinary outcome for Australia of former Senator Matthias Cormann uh, being uh, chosen as Secretary General of the OECD. Yeah, yeah. Now, obviously, many of us in this place know Matthias well. Perhaps I, uh, as well, I won't say more than anyone, but as well as anyone, having uh, worked for him both in his electoral office uh, in opposition and in his ministerial office, and obviously serving, albeit for only a relatively short while, in this place. And it really is an extraordinary achievement personally for Matthias uh, to uh, achieve this outcome, but uh, perhaps more importantly, I think for all of us in this place, it's an extraordinary achievement for Australia. It's a recognition of the fact that we do, to, to use uh, the, the, the proverbial phrase, that uh, we do punch above our weight in international affairs. And I do thank those opposite. Uh, for their support. No, not, not all those opposite. And, and occasionally it was grudging, uh, we, we must admit, but we do thank those opposite for their support. Not, not you, Senator Ciccone, um, not, not you, Senator Farrell, certainly, but uh, we, as, 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 as Australia, we have achieved an extraordinary outcome. And I can think of literally no better person than Matthias to take this role. He has that combination of policy and politics that will enable him to lead the OECD with distinction. The, the union of the democracies, the, the free market democracies of the world, is never, has never been as important or more important than it is today. We do enter very uncertain geopolitical times. We do enter very uncertain economic times uh, thanks to the impact of a once in a hundred year uh, global pandemic. Uh, being able to take that highly uh, technical knowledge of the international uh, arrangements to do with uh, the economics of, of, the, of the globe and to uh, combine that with a very astute uh, and deep understanding of the personalities and the politics involved uh, in the international decision-making forums gives Matthias a unique uh, uh, position and a unique opportunity to make a real difference uh, both for Australia but also for that wider union of Western capitalist democracies. And it's good to see uh, support for the decision from right across the globe, uh, whether it's from, from the US, who's obviously one of our key allies, but also countries like Turkey, countries throughout uh, uh, OECD members throughout Southeast Asia, who have welcomed the appointment of uh, former Senator Cormann to this role, and I think it is a, a remarkable outcome for this country. I thank uh, Foreign Minister Payne and obviously the Prime Minister for the work that they put in to secure this exceptional outcome, and I wish Matthias all the best in his future role. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr President. The announcement of Grace Tame as Australian of the Year prompted the beginning of a movement across Australia. Her powerful rendition and harrowing details of the grooming and repeated rape by her history teacher outraged Australians. 
potentially unbeknown to her, but the power of her raw recount and the courage of giving a voice to the voiceless, empowered women across Australia. Women are coming forward, we know, with their stories over the past few weeks, and whispers and stories are emerging of the inappropriate uh, behaviour in workplaces, both in this place, but it is reverberating right across our country. It has boiled to a point where Australian women have said, enough is enough. Yesterday was an important moment in time when women have said no more. We can't fix a problem that we don't discuss. And Mr Morrison and his government seem completely tone deaf by not acknowledging there is a problem. I joined the march with many of my colleagues to campaign for change. Unfortunately, Scott Morrison just doesn't get it. He didn't even show up. The Minister for Women didn't even show up. These scandals have dominated the headlines for almost a month now, and I found myself entering different stages of rage, disbelief, sadness and outright anger over how this has allowed to happen. What have we seen as a response from the Prime Minister? Cover-ups and deflections, not wanting to take responsibility for the behaviour of his members and staff and not even making the time to attend yesterday's rally. What sort of message is he sending to Australians? There's been a constant rhetoric that we must leave it up to the legal process, but this is a culture problem. This is a problem when so much power is used to enormous pressure is placed on individuals to stay silent. It seems that Mr Morrison is happy with brushing these issues under the rug and burying them at all costs, ignoring women across the country who have legitimate grievances. He's one of the most powerful people within our democracy, and he wouldn't pay them the courtesy of even meeting them on the lawns of Parliament House. What message does he send to the women and to the girls within our communities? These scandals are coming at a time when Australians' dissatisfaction with democracy is at its all-time low. In 2019, just one in four voters trusted people in government could be trusted to do the right thing. This is likely as a result of the increasing amount of scandals and rorts that are outpouring from this Liberal government. There has been an erosion of trust and confidence, and this has implications for our democracy. We need change, but it requires a collective input, not just from the top down, but it needs to be a cultural shift. The processes of transforming needs to be inclusive and all-encompassing and a wide-sweeping reform agenda. It shouldn't be just about people feeling safe about institution, instituting respect and common level of behaviour. Accusations should not be stifled for fear of limiting your career or your political future sabotaged. Victims should feel safe to speak out and to seek support without any negative repercussions. Women in this building and elsewhere should not be looked at or viewed as prey. Every woman, every woman deserves respect and dignity, whether they're at home, whether they're in the workplace, whether they're in our schools, whether they're on our streets. We need social change, and women are saying enough is enough. There needs to be change. And I am sick and tired of hearing how brave these women are that are telling their stories. They, they shouldn't have to be brave. We should have a system where women are respected and there's processes to protect them. The laws need to be changed. We need these women to come forward so that they be helped with their trauma. Enough is enough. It is not too much to ask for our Prime Minister to lead by demonstrating that women deserve to be respected. They need to have dignity and they need to be safe. No more harassment, no more abuse and no more violence against women. Order. Enough is Senator enough. Polly, Senator Seward. It's people on income support and people who are looking for work with disdain 
and contempt. It implements policies that makes their lives as difficult as possible, and they have invented a punitive employment provider system that prioritises compliance over genuine assistance. They have just come up with their next brilliant scheme for their next punitive approach, which is, of course, the job seeker, uh, the job in a job seeker, or as now it is called, the job seeker line. But also, they now intend to look at people's job applications to see if they are appropriate and if they are genuine. Now, when there's one job for every nine people, job seekers know that they are told to embark on a process that is a waste of their time through a system that is not meeting their needs. And of course, I am talking about the job active, the employment service process, the job active system, and the disability employment services system. Now, it's no use complaining through the official system because they don't get adequate responses. And so people don't complain to the, to the, through the official system, but I tell you what, they certainly complain to us politicians and certainly to me as spokesperson for the Greens. And I have, for the last uh, number of adjournments, been reading out people's lived experience to try and get through to the government that this system fails job seekers and people in the disability employment system. So I'm going to tonight let people know of people's lived experience yet again so hopefully we can get th this message through to the government that the system doesn't work and it needs reform. So one person that wrote to me said, in the 18 months I have been engaged with a DSP employment service, or they have been, I have never been offered a job, including employee, employers with, with which they have professional relationships. And another person said, has written to us, job service providers are of no use to job seekers. They are just an income stream for them. I had my payment suspended because I didn't turn up for an appointment on the 4th of January, although I did, and the office was closed. 150 kilometre round trip. I was able to secure a job on my own after doing a TAFE course, which I paid for myself, again a 150 kilometre round trip to attend TAFE. When I did get a job, they threw money at me for petrol, work clothes, etc. Another person, I had my at full capacity. They had me at full capacity despite my multiple disabilities and, f and refused to help me organise a work capacity assessment. I only ever had one appointment when I needed to sign a new mutual agreement. And my regular appointments consisted of a group where they would just go through the mutual agreements and tell us to check their job board in brackets, which never got updated. Close brackets. They keep pushing me to apply for manual labour despite me having my disabilities on my file and repeated telling them that I can't do manual labour. Another person. I'm a social researcher with a bachelor's degree in social, services, uh, social sciences. I needed professional help for writing selection criteria so I could be of more, more successful when applying for a position. They were not able to provide professional assistance. They were also sending me advertisements and wanted me to apply for jobs unrelated to my qualifications for which I would not even be considered, such as a psychologist, occupational therapist, solicitor and similar. They have suggested I go for an, uh, from organisation to organisation and give my resume in person. Yet that approach is obsolete as all applications are required to be submitted online. My personal impression is that they are not adequately qualified and trained on how to provide meaningful support. Um, just break the quote there. That is what I hear very, very regularly. He go, this person goes on to say, it seems they do not have up-to-date knowledge of the job market functioning, but they are well instructed on how to impose punishments for non-compliance. That's what this system is about, is about punishment and compliance and demonising and stigmatising people. It has to be reformed. 
Senator Antic. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise this evening to speak in relation to the urgent need to stamp out the ever-present corrosive and divisive scourge known as identity politics. Now, identity politics is the phenomenon of basing one's own worldview as the oppressed group and then constructing one's identity around a supposed membership of this group. The cult of identity politics preaches universal and common interest between a group of persons based on ethnicity, race, culture or sexual orientation. And the absurdity of this ideology calls for Australia to be recast not as a nation united but rather as a confederation of identity groups divided by loose connections of sameness. Identity politics is the dastardly love child of political correctness and postmodernism, and it's the bane of good decision making. It walks in lockstep with its equally cancerous cousin, gesture politics. Fuelled by instant social media adulation and a desire to prove their worth, many politicians have become focused on gestures rather than outcomes, pandering to the woke mob in the process. Straight from the Marxist playbook, identity politics showcases a manipulated conflict between the oppressor and the oppressed. It seeks to manufacture conflict where there is none. Pursuant to this worldview, people must be victimised by the system, and the system needs to be dismantled. Personal responsibility is not required here. The unreasonable and unre unrelenting and unfettered criticism of our institutions, such as family and the church, make it easier to tear them down and replace them with the dystopian and oppressive bleak world that those who prosecute this claim want. So why do we continue to indulge it? Why do we continue to allow it? And why haven't we woken up? Uh, why haven't we allowed our precious tax dollars to be squandered at the altar of identity politics? Our universities have fallen to this curse. They have become obsessed with that which divides us rather than that which unites us. A 2017 survey of the titles and descriptions of 746 history courses offered across 35 Australian universities revealed that there are significantly higher occurrences of gender, environment, identity and sexuality in the courses than there are enlightenment or reformation. But the prize for the worst exponent of using public monies on left-wing identity politics must surely go to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. The ABC harbours the most virulent haven of taxpayer-funded identity-based dialogue in this country. It's become little more than an identitarian, taxpayer-funded left-wing activist group at war with mainstream Australian values. It's segmenting our community into small groups, and it's doing so with your money. It's a complete joke. Most of the left-wing identitarians are not champions of the working class. They are not themselves people living in socio low socioeconomic co conditions. They are simply those revelling in a liberator complex. But what will these socialists do when the revolutionaries come for their champagne? Standing up to the ideologues of div divisive identity politics appears hard because the voices are loud. It appears hard because of many of your institutions have done nothing but wave the right flag, and it appears hard because politics has shown little more than jelly-backed weakness in the face of the onslaught. And people have a right to feel let down. It's now up to everyday people, people who are frustrated by the political class, to fill the void. The only thing more powerful than speaking the truth is speaking the truth in numbers with like-minded friends. So let's all start speaking the truth and let's start pushing back at those who seek to divide us. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Australians are appalled at what they're seeing happening here in Parliament House. Women and men around this country were shocked when they heard the incredibly brave account from Brittany Higgins of her story of being raped in this building, in her workplace, just metres from the Prime Minister's office. Following Brittany's story, the extremely serious allegations that have been made against the Attorney General, Christian Porter, have rocked the nation. I received, Madam Acting Deputy President, the dossier of evidence and the account of the accusations put forward by the woman at the centre, alleging that Christian Porter had raped a 16-year-old girl when he was 17. Tragically, that woman has now taken her own life. Women across Australia have had enough. We've had enough of the violence enough of the harassment, enough of the excuses and enough of the boys' club. Yesterday, across Australia, more than 100,000 women and decent men 
rallied to call for an end to violence against women, an end to harassment, sexism and abuse. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, refused to join, refused to come and listen, refused to witness the rally right here on the steps of Parliament House as thousands of women called to be heard and for action. The Prime Minister has even refused to read the brief of evidence that he too was sent from the friends of the woman who alleges that she was raped by Christian Porter. The Prime Minister has refused to listen to her, to read her own words and to hear her story. A collective voice is now growing to call out those who refuse to listen, to call out those who refuse to take seriously incidents of sexual harassment, assault and abuse. This collective voice is calling for action, for accountability, and they're calling for an independent inquiry into the allegations of whether the Attorney-General is a fit and proper, proper person to hold that position right here in the Australian Parliament. I've been asked many times in the last two weeks whether I would detail the allegations made by the woman at the centre of the incident she alleged happened at the hands of the Attorney-General. I won't be doing that here tonight, but what I have pledged to do is to put on the record the names of Australians who want to see change, the names of Australians who want to see accountability upheld in the highest office of this land, being the Attorney-General and, of course, uh, the Prime Minister. Names like Karina Nutt, Tammy Jo Sutton, Rebecca Bayliss, Emily Harron, Bonnie Keats, Yasmin Matz, Josie Stockdall, Josie Presh, Aaron Teepe, Aaron Wilson, Abby Belton, Abby Brown, Abby Fenton, Abby Hay, Abby Steele, Abdul Aleem, Adam Abdul Razak, Adam Dantel, Adam Tanata, Adela Brent, Adele Field, Adele Heyman, Adele Van Winden, Adrena Garasha, Adrena Beck, Adrian Paley, Adrian Price, Adrian Woodhouse, Amelia Hopley, Afreya Farini, Angus Kersey, Aidan Off, Aidan Parisi, Aylan Walsh, Elisa Drent, Ainsley Hewitt, Ainsley Ashton, Ainsley Vizaka, Alexis Nicholas, Alexis Simmons, Ali Bowen, Ali Can, Ali Jansen, Ali Mitchell, Ali Rausch, Alice Golter, Alice Hansaka. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Your time Can has I, expired. Madam Acting Deputy President, I would seek leave to incorporate the rest of my remarks into Hansard. Uh, leave is granted. Sorry, leave is not granted, Senator Hanson Young. Um, Senator Stoker. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Madam Acting Deputy President, one of the things I feel really strongly about is making sure that women like me, the, the working mums who are juggling all the competing demands of getting their work done, paying the bills, getting kids to school and to swimming, making sure homework gets done, making sure appointments are attended, that they have the confidence that while they are occupied with making sure their family is getting ahead, they have here in Canberra and throughout the country a Liberal national government who has the values, 
that mean we've got their back through all of the challenges of their every day. Because I know, because I've got girls of my own, but also because of all the people I speak to in our community, that on a day-to-day -day basis, families aren't thinking about what goes on in this place. They're thinking about how are they going to get through the day's work without the um, attack of the mother guilt. They're thinking about um, how are they going to make sure that uh, their child gets the help they need, either with speech pathology or with a bit of occupational therapy? Um, how are they going to help them make sure they're learning to swim in a way that keeps them safe as summertime approaches? These are the things that occupy the minds of our families, but they need to know we've got their back. And so it was really good this um, International Women's Day and in the week that followed it to to talk to, to appreciate and to really showcase some of the great women we're backing as they do their very best to improve the lives of others. Jo Mason from Workhaven is an incredible lady. She's a senior marketing professional, but she found herself shocked to be in a domestic violence situation. Having lived through that terrible experience, She's used it to develop new ways to break the cycle of domestic and family violence. She's produced a tool that allows women emerging from that experience to be supported, assisted and encouraged for a three-year period following that traumatic event, giving them all of the information and tools on everything from their legal situation to safety to housing to health that will help them keep moving forward even once the crisis resources uh, might not any longer be with them. It's about helping keep these women in work, get them back into work if they've fallen out, because we know that that economic security is really important to helping vulnerable women move forward. I was so impressed by Jo and the work that she's doing um, that it was a matter of moments before I knew I had to connect them with the Attorney General's Department to find ways to help them to scale their service delivery so they can be helping more women get ahead. Another great woman, I, woman I've been working with recently is Selena Gummersall. Now, Selena, 10 years ago, was a Brisbane-based psychologist. And she was invited to provide intensive support to a group of women and children in far north Queensland. Ever since then, she's been working tirelessly with bush communities to develop a unique model that empowers people in the bush to take control of their physical, but even more so, their mental health. Out of that experience, Outback Futures was born and is delivering results that break the mould of what we expect for rural health. It helps people in remote communities understand the services available to them, to seek them out, to advocate for their own mental health. Outback Futures works with people in the bush to help them understand the services they need, make sure they're available, and tailor programs that work to the needs of that individual and their families. Their model is so effective that every Western Queensland community that they have worked in has a council so enthusiastic that it's not only given their endorsement, but all the neighbouring councils are begging them to come to town and help. The evidence-based impact of what they're doing is massively changing the lives of all people, but particularly women and children throughout rural Queensland. She's no stranger to my office, and I've loved bringing her down to Canberra this week so she can share her great work for Queenslanders with this entire nation, its women and its children. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, aviation has a special place in the national psyche in Australia. It's the Royal Flying Doctor Service touching down on a red dirt airstrip. It's the iconic flying kangaroo adorning the world's safest airline. Our unique remoteness to our regional communities, between our major cities and to the rest of the world, means that aviation is embodied in our national character. Yet aviation was one of the industries hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. In recent months, I have served on the Senate inquiry on the future of aviation in Australia. We have heard hours of harrowing evidence on the toll this pandemic has taken on the health of workers behind this iconic sector. 
The toll has taken on their families and their futures. They have not faced a global pandemic. They have also not only faced a global pandemic, pandemic but they have also been confronted with a government which has abandoned them in the greatest time of need. Flight attendants insisting on a diet, existing on a diet of instant noodles to pay their rent. Ground handlers hospitalised after suffering massive panic attacks. Workers forced to draw down on their super to pay the bills. Workers who feel they'll never financially or emotionally recover. But even through the hopelessness, through the anxiety and the depression and the loneliness, what was the most striking was the pride the people in aviation take in their work, their genuine passion for aviation. They aren't, as the government suggests, looking for a handout. These are skilled, experienced, proud aviation workers who want to get back on the tools. Workers like Damien Pollard, who has worked as a Qantas baggage handler for 12 years. Well, his wife is a hard-working nurse and he has two sons. He has spent the last year fighting against Qantas as it tried to outsource his job and the jobs of dozens of his workmates in the middle of this pandemic. But despite all that, here is what, here's what he had to say. I'm really proud of my family and I'm really, really proud that I worked for a company like Qantas. I was going to stay with Qantas until I retired. That was the plan. I've worked seven out of nine Christmases, but I've spent them with my work family. That is what Qantas was. Damien has every reason to be resentful, but what he dem demonstrated at the public hearing was pride for his work and concern for how the loss of skilled workers with decades of experience could result in safety catastrophe. This pandemic has hit the aviation sector harder over the last year, and there is still a very long way to go. But what is driving the real long-term damage to the sector is the indifference of the Morrison government and the greed of executives like Alan Joyce, Australia's highest paid CEO. The aviation sector has historically offered its skilled and experienced workers secure work and pay, fair pay. This is the reason why we have, had, have the safest aviation sector in the world. But the Prime Minister and Alan Joyce have a clear vision for the future of aviation. Outsourced work, less pay, less security and worse conditions. And when the Prime Minister cuts the parachute for aviation workers when JobKeeper ends in 12 days, he is finishing the job Alan Joyce started. Workers with decades of experience will be lost to the sector forever. In their place will be the churn and burn workforce which the government is spreading like wildfire across all sectors of the economy. You lose their skills, you lose their experience and you lose that safety record. It's that simple. So I want to remind the Prime Minister that Qantas is not Alan Joyce. Our aviation sector is not the CEOs, nor is it the banks and fund managers who own them. It is the pilots, flight attendants, baggage handlers, engineers, cleaners, catering staff and thousands of other workers who have dedicated their careers to the aviation in Australia. It will be a sad day for us all when the government abandons the, these workers, their families and their communities on the 28th of March. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I recently had the great pleasure of travelling to the south of Adelaide and visiting a great South Australian success story. Red Arc Electronics is a remarkable organisation which has had an incredible journey of growth, not just in size, but importantly in its capability to deliver increasingly advanced and sophisticated products that are now desired by our defence sector. It is a credit not only to the vision of Anthony and Michelle Kittel, who purchased the business in its early days, but also to their unrelenting commitment to excellence, as well as their desire to invest in and develop their staff. Red Arc Electronics was founded in 1979 and named after Red Arc Spark, developed in the first ignition system it manufactured. In 1997, they operated out of a tin shed with only eight staff. Since then, the company has become a world-class, advanced electronics manufacturer serving domestic and international markets 
having now grown to 275 employees across three locations in Australia. Anthony and Michelle Kittle bought into the business in 1997 before purchasing 100 per cent of the business in 2002. The firm is engaged in the research, design, development and manufacture of a range of electronic equipment for vehicles such as voltage converters, battery chargers and brake controllers. In other words, their products are attached to any vehicle that uses a battery. In more recent times, Red Ark launched their defence systems arm, which has grown and now proudly supports many of our nation's defence partners, including working on the Hunter-class frigates as well as a number of land projects. The great work being carried out by the Red Ark staff has meant that the company has been awarded almost 400,000 from the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre Fund for their smart factory project and receiving 150,000 Defence Global Competitive Competitiveness Grant to support Red Ark's export capability. I had the privilege of being guided on my tour by Anthony Kittle and the Defence General Manager Mike Hartis. It was great to see how the Commonwealth funding can transform businesses and in turn create amazing job opportunities for our graduates. Red Ark has taken on 60 new staff within the last two months alone. The company, or should I say community, because that is what it feels like when you walk the floors and engage with staff, has a unique team culture. Employees are inspired and celebrated and their skills are recognised and nurtured. The result is that the average length of service of employees is almost six years and is credited to Red Ark's overall vision and values, which include integrity, quality, innovation and respect for the environment. I was also incredibly impressed by Red Ark's substantial and long-term commitment to supporting local community organisations such as Catherine House, the Red Cross Blood Service, as well as a number of southern sporting teams. Red Ark has been recognised with multiple awards for their innovation, culture and success. These awards include being named Telstra Australian Business of the Year in 2014 and being named Australian Manufacturer of the Year in 2015, 2017 and 2019. As a South Australian, I think it is critically important to bring to prominence these organisations which are providing opportunities for our youth. They partner with all of our key educational institutions. It is because of the innovation and success of companies such as Red Ark, coupled with crucial support from the Morrison Liberal government, that South Australia's place as our nation's defence state remains secure. The next frontier for the company is the space sector. I wish them every success. Red Ark's mission is to ensure that Red Ark product and service is the benchmark by which the competition is measured. The company is achieving its mission. Senator D. Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight in the Australian Parliament to condemn, in the loudest of terms, the military coup that is taking place in Myanmar and to add my voice to the voice of many people in Australia and around the world who are disappointed, frustrated, angry that Myanmar's path to democracy has been so forcibly interrupted by the ruthless actions of the military regime. Tonight, I want to assure Burmese people in Myanmar, in Australia and around the world that their protests are not in vain, that here in Australia especially, we stand united with their aspirations, with the aspirations of all people in Myanmar and their pursuit of justice, freedom and the restoration of democracy. In Australia, we have been a strong and consistent champion of democracy in Myanmar. And in these challenging times, we remain more committed, not less, more determined, not less, more willing, not less, to champion for Burmese people the rights and freedoms that are enjoyed by so many people around the world, the right to elect your own government, the right to be protected by the rule of law and the right to protest without fear. The United Nations reports that as many as 120 people, including many women and children, have already lost their lives. This brutality demands a resolute response from Australia, from our ASEAN neighbours and indeed from the whole world, a resolute response that can be sustained for as long as it is necessary. I'm proud of the position the Australian government has taken thus far. 
The decision by Australia to suspend our limited bilateral defence cooperation with Myanmar is important. The decision to redirect Australia's development program to address the humanitarian needs of the poorest and most vulnerable is critical. The decision to prioritise the most pressing humanitarian and emerging needs and continue to ensure our humanitarian engagement remains with and through non-government organisations and multilateral partners is very, very welcome. And maintaining autonomous sanctions on Myanmar, including a long-standing arms embargo and targeted sanctions on a number of senior military officers which have been in place since 2018, are all important features of Australia's response thus far. But let me be very clear. This must be Australia's first response, not its final response. In this parliament, in this government, I will continue to make the case for more targeted responses that don't harm or imperil Burmese people, but instead are aimed and targeted at the military and their families and their supporters. Today, in this Australian parliament, I was pleased to present petitions on the behalf of many Burmese people in Western Australia, petitions that called for the support and immediate unconditional release of State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi and the elected representatives and political activists detained by the military, a petition that called for support for reconvening the democratically elected Burmese parliament in accordance with its constitution and to abide the rules of law and principles of democracy, a, a petition that called to recognise, respect and acknowledge the result of the 2020 general election, and a petition that urged foreign governments and international organisations like the United Nations, the United States, China, the European Union, Japan and Singapore to refuse to recognise the military self-appointed government or to legitimise its representatives. Now is the moment, the moment to demonstrate our commitment to democracy in the region, our commitment to repel military force and brutality so that we can again nurture and support Myanmar's path to full democracy. Thank you, Senator Smith. Um, I might give the, the call to Senator Ciccone and then I'll go to Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. We know that uh, workers all over Australia are doing it tough right now. And tonight I'd, I'd like to speak in particular of the circumstances confront, confronting around 150 workers in Portland whose jobs are teetering on the brink in my home state of Victoria. We often hear a lot in this place and places like it all throughout the country of the great virtues of renewable energy. Now, whatever you might stand on the question of Australia's future energy mix, should it be by coal or gas, solar, or dare I even suggest nuclear, it is not my intention to debate that topic tonight. But I would hope that those on both sides of this chamber would agree that regardless of what method of electricity generation that we are talking about, the importance of ensuring that there are opportunities for Australian workers in this industry is paramount. As we speak, workers at Keppel Prince in Portland, in my home state of Victoria, are facing a terrible, uncertain future. For those unfamiliar, Keppel Prince is Victoria's only manufacturer of towers for wind turbines. Down at the plant, they use Australian steel from Blue Scope to build towers upon which a nacelle of a wind turbine sits. One might think that, given their line of work, that it would be boom times for a company like Keppel Prince. Alas, it is not. Whilst many may celebrate the seemingly endless fields of wind farms being built across Victoria and Australia, I'm afraid to say that very few consider where these turbines are actually made. The truth of the matter is that often Australian wind turbines are hardly Australian at all, with the tower, the blades and the steel within them often come from overseas. In Portland, 
The port of Portland is where many of these items land, carted off the foreign ships that haul them here. These items are almost ceremoniously paraded through the town on their way to the wind farm that they are destined for. Workers at Keppel Prince, Australian workers, make a fine product from Australian materials, have to suffer the injustice, the humiliation of seeing the trucks roll through their town loaded to the brim with the very same product that they are making in town at their factory just a few minutes down the street. Mr Acting Deputy President, this situation is simply not good enough and it is something that is entirely within the purview of this government to fix. You see, many of these turbines are being constructed at a brand new $360 million wind farm, of which over half of the electricity to be generated will go to the government's own Snowy Hydro scheme. As the wind farm's single largest customer, it is entirely within the capacity of the government to mandate the use of Australian-made materials in the build, and yet the government has done absolutely nothing about it. Whilst Australian producers of all types languish, locked out of the Chinese market, in Australia the government continues to roll out the red carpet to discount steel made by overseas workers on lower wages with substandard conditions. Ultimately, those who will pay the price are the 150 workers at Keppel Prince, whose jobs are at risk tonight. And I can also tell the Senate tonight that 12 workers have lost their jobs this evening, and a further 26 will be made redundant this coming Thursday. But it's not just them. It's the scores of other Australian workers who find themselves in the situation all over the country. This isn't good enough and it needs to stop. That's why I'm standing on the side of these workers and their representatives at the AW and the AMW, and it is why I'm calling on this government to mandate the use of local materials in projects such as these. Putting Australian workers first, surely Surely it is the very least that they can do. Mr Acting Deputy President, just on, a, uh, on another subject matter this evening, um, I just wanted to briefly uh, acknowledge uh, quite a few people who attended the inaugural meeting of the ever first federal parliamentary friends of Landcare. Uh, Perrin, uh, Davey and myself were honoured to uh, be the co-chairs of this parliamentary friendship group and host here this evening outside uh, in, the, in the gardens of Parliament House. I uh, just wanted to acknowledge Uncle Wally Bell, a traditional custodian of the Ngunnawal lands on which we meet, and he's also a, a great member, a fond member of the ACT Landcare. And uh, I must say it was a very touching um, Welcome to Country by Uncle Wally, and I really wanted to acknowledge him formally in the chamber this evening to say thank you very much for his contribution uh, at tonight's event. Um, we also had in attendance Min Minister Littleproud and Minister Lee, as well as Shadow Ministers Collins and Butler, uh, along with the Chair of the National Landcare Network, Patrick O'Connor, and CEO Jim Adams as well as the Chair of Landcare Australia, Doug Human AM, and CEO Shane Norris. There were many members of boards of many Landcare networks and groups that attended this evening, uh, mainly from the ACT, but also from New South Wales and some from Victoria. And I really wanted to say thank you for the Landcare networkers that came from Victoria uh, to enjoy and to get to know the other networkers in the uh, friendship group, and I'm sure there'll be many, many more uh, events to come. Landcare in Australia is a very proud legacy of Bob Hawke, who established it with a purpose of bringing environmentalists and landholders together to improve biodiversity, build resilience in Australia's food and farming systems, and create stronger regional communities. As a Senator for Victoria, I also want to acknowledge the important place 
that my home state has in the Landcare story, with Landcare first evolving in Victoria through an initiative of former Premier, the late Joan Kerner, who was then Minister for Conservation, Forests and Lands, and Heather Mitchell, OAM, then the first female president of the Victorian Farmers' Federation. And I did want to acknowledge Tony Ma from the National Farmers' Federation, who was also in attendance tonight, and I know that him and the NFF are great supporters of Landcare. In fact, before the Hawke Labor government established Landcare nationally, the very first Landcare group was launched in a very small town in central Victoria in 1986, through a collaboration between government, farmers and environmentalists, which continues to endure to this day. Over the past 30 years, Lank has developed into one of Australia's largest volunteer movements with over 6,000 groups and 100,000 volunteers. That is just amazing and well done to everyone involved in Landcare. The Landcare model has been so successful, it has even been adopted in over 20 countries around the world. Nonetheless, Landcare's greatest asset has always been its people, the members of local groups all throughout Australia who freely give up their time to advance the objectives of the movement. It's these people that we are here today to celebrate, and I especially want to acknowledge the members of the many Landcare groups that have been able to join us this evening. Certainly, what makes Landcare so special has been the way it has been able to bring together stakeholders from all places landholders, farmers, environmentalists, conservationists, industry, science, government and, of course, our traditional custodians of the land. It is this unity which will be central to the movement, meeting the challenges that lay ahead of us all. And I wanted to thank again um, Senator Davey for her friendship and also for her asking me to join her in establishing the friendship group. Oh, thank you. Senator Scar. Mr Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak this evening to pay tribute to Mr Peter Zwang, who was the Liberal National Party candidate for the state seat of Stretton in, in the election held in Queensland on 31 October 2020. Now, people might be questioning why is it at this hour that I'm rising to pay tribute to Mr Peter Zwang, given the state election in Queensland was held uh, some months ago. And the reason is this, that on the weekend that just passed, the Daily Mail Australia published an apology to Mr Peter Zwang in relation to an article which it published on 28 October 2020. And I think it is extraordinarily important that we place this apology on the record. So I'm not going to read the content of the article that appeared in the Daily Mail on 28 October 2020, only a few days prior to the state election. I'm not going to read that article. I will comment that I query who actually provided the information and the briefing to the Daily Mail Australia with respect to the article, but I don't want to give the article any more currency. I note that it was shared some 12,000 times, so I'm not proposing to share the article this evening. What I will share is the apology to Peter Zwang, which was published by Daily Mail Australia on 13 March 2021, and I note that has 64 shares as opposed to the 12,000 shares that the original article had. And I read it and I quote, on 28 October 2020, we published two articles about Peter Zwang, who was a Liberal National Party candidate in last year's Queensland state election. We acknowledge the articles were potentially damaging to Mr Zwang. Further, some readers may have inferred from the article that Mr Zwang was influenced by and associated with the Chinese Communist Party, is pro-Beijing and supports an aggressive expansionist China. We have been asked to make clear to make clear, the post referred to in the article was a satire piece posted on Mr Zhuang's social media platform written by the well-known Chinese comedian Brother Sui. The piece was sarcastic and highly critical, highly critical of the Chinese Communist Party and China's aggressive expansion. 
We accept that Mr Zhuang has not been influenced by and is not associated with the Chinese Communist Party. He is not pro-Beijing. He supports any country in dealing with policies in a peaceful way. We apologise. We apologise to Mr Zhuang for any suggestion that the articles may have conveyed to the contrary." End quote. That's the apology that appeared in the Daily Mail Australia to Mr Peter Zhuang, who was a candidate for the Liberal National Party in the state seat of Stretton at the Queensland election held on 31 October 2020. Mr Acting Deputy President, it grieves me, it profoundly grieves me that a loyal Australian of Chinese heritage who puts his hand up, puts his hand up to participate in our democratic processes, has to go through months of legal proceedings to establish and procure an apology when his loyalty to this country and his views are questioned. It grieves me. We should be encouraging all Australians of all backgrounds, whether they be of First Nations heritage, following the great footsteps of some like Senator Dodson and others who are in this place, whether or not they're new Australians, like Mr Peter Zhuang, who moved here from mainland China and established a business in this country, built a family in this country, raised a family in this country and participated in community affairs, bringing people together in his community, bringing people together in his community. We should be encouraging people like that, not trying to drag them down, not trying to drag them down. In my home state of Queensland, the Chinese have a great, have a great connection with our state through the whole gamut of its history. Out in the town of St George, there's a memorial to the Chinese shepherds who came out from mainland China in the 1850s, who were promised the world, lured to come out here to Queensland to act as shepherds. None of them made their way back home, not a single one of them. Not a single one of them. They came to this country and they forged relationships in this country. Many of them actually formed relationships with First Nations people because they belonged to another group that was ostracised at that point in time from some of the European settlements. But they made their home here. They made their home here. And they're as Australian as anyone in this place, as anyone in this place. There's a memorial at the Sunnybank RSL, which commemorates the contribution of Australians of Chinese heritage who have fought for our nation in wars, all the way back from the Boer War to the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, who've, who've paid the ultimate sacrifice, paid the ultimate sacrifice for their country. That should be celebrated. It should be celebrated. And when people of any ethnic heritage decide to put their hand up, decide to put their hand up to participate in our democratic processes, they should be celebrated. They should be congratulated. They should not be torn down for base political motives. They should not be torn down for base political motives. And what happened to Mr Peter Zhuang, in my view, was an absolute disgrace. And I think those who were behind the briefing of the Daily Mail in this regard, the Daily Mail wouldn't have gotten the idea to publish its article back in October 2020 off its own bat. They would have been briefed. They would have been briefed to write that article about Mr Peter Zhuang, the Liberal National Party candidate who stood at the state election. They would have been briefed by someone. And I say to those people, you should hang your heads in collective shame. Collective shame because it sends such a negative message. It sends such a negative message to Australians of Chinese heritage that when you put up your hand after you've built a life in this country, you've, you've made a life for yourself, you've raised a family here and you want to contribute to our democratic processes and you make that commitment to nominate for parliament or local government or wherever it is, it sends a message to them that they're liable to be attacked on the basis of their heritage. And that is absolutely disgraceful. And I think everyone in this Senate should unite against that sort of attack. I think instead of attacking, instead of attacking uh, people of ethnic heritage who, who run for Australian par parliament, we should celebrate it. We should celebrate it because that's what this country is all about. When I was sworn in as a senator in this place, 
I couldn't help but reflect how remarkable Australia is by virtue of the fact that the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate and the Leader of the Government in the Senate were both born overseas and had come to this country and ultimately stood for the Senate, were elected and then elevated to some of the highest leadership positions in this country. That should be celebrated, absolutely celebrated. So I congratulate, I congratulate Mr Peter Zhuang and I congratulate all Australians of Chinese heritage who, who, can, who choose to participate in the democratic process, regardless of what party you stand for. I congratulate each and every one of you. And I say to young Australians of Chinese heritage, I say to young Australians of Chinese heritage, do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged because the vast majority of Australians, the vast majority of Australians want to support you and celebrate you. Celebrate you if you decide to make that great contribution to the Australian community by seeking election to this place. Finally, I would like to place on the record my tribute to Mr Peter Zwang's family because whenever any of us seeks election in this place, it can be quite a brutal process. And Mr Peter Zwang went through a terribly brutal process, terribly unfairly. I pay tribute to your family. I also pay tribute to all the members of the LNP who stood by Mr Peter Zwang when he went through this. I'm really proud to be a member of a party which has such great members like you who stood by Mr Peter Zwang through this. His close friend, Mr James Wang, Mr Paul Shee, and also, if I can place on the record my tribute to Mr Denny Williams and Mr Michael Rooms, Mr Denny Williams and Mr Michael Rooms, who were men in pre-poll when they were confronted with TV cameras, TV cameras seeking to make a story out of Mr Peter Zwang. I really do pay tribute to you because, in my view, you represent all that is good, all that is good about Australia. Okay. Senator, I was going to go to Senator Hume next. Senator Patrick, Senator Hume. Thank you. In, uh, in September 1881, a 260 metre long petition was tabled in the Victorian Parliament. The petition, which was glued to fabric backing, and, uh, and secured with cardboard spools, recorded 30,000 signatures of women from all walks of life. And that's equivalent to 1 per cent of the population at the time. Now, every single pen to paper was a separate call for the right for women to vote on equal terms as men. Now, a document of such size, in both significance and in physical form, is a testament to the enormous change that was spurred from collective effort. It was four years before South Australia gave the first woman the right to vote, and 1902 until non-Indigenous women across Australia were granted equal voting rights as men. The gender equality timeline is marked by events of immense passion, collective determination and often gruellingly slow change. This is the reality that we are faced with, historical moments petitions, uprisings, marches and speeches. These moments ignite the flame of progress, but from there it's a slow and steady burn to reform. The weighty mechanics of our society and of our institutions do not change overnight, but continuous and united efforts spark incremental change that leads to transformative outcomes. In 2021, we marked the centennial of Edith Cowan's election to the Legislative Assembly. Now, her influence is still felt in the House today. In dark and uncharted waters, she was the light that guided the women who have worked tirelessly under this roof for the last 100 years, and her legacy remains strong. Today, there are more women in Parliament than ever before. All of these women play vital roles in the mechanics of government, and many are leading our most critical portfolios. Ministers like Maurice Payne, Linda Reynolds and Ruston, Karen Andrews and Michaelia Cash, among others, have been at the coalface of this government's successful response to the unprecedented challenges brought on by COVID-19. Time and time again, we have borne witness to great government policy and politics depending on both men and women being at the table. In the 2019 federal election, 50 per cent of the newly elected coalition members and senators to join the Morrison government were women. 
In September 2019, the Senate overall achieved gender balance. Yet on the 100-year anniversary of Edith Cowan's election, we are in a climate of heightened focus on inequality. And we are reminded that although we have come so far, there is still so much more to do. Today, men still make up 141 of our 227 seats, which is just over 62 per cent of our federal parliament. In 2021, Australia's gender pay gap was 13.4 per cent, uh, and men on average earn around $243 more than women. One in five women have been sexually assaulted in their adult lives. In 2018, 97 per cent of incidences of sexual assault were committed by men. Data forms a hard and empirical foundation to galvanise rational policy developments and reform. In Parliament House, my friend and colleague, Minister Reynolds, has quietly tracked the progress of women in government. Her data mine tracks the progress of all Australian political parties over many years. It tracks seniority and promotion timelines and pipelines. It tracks the gender pay gap. It tracks our position compared to our international counterparts, where we have gone right and where we have fallen short. Minister Reynolds compiles this data to provide frameworks for reform, data and facts that feed and signal priorities. Minister Reynolds does this because she has, she is, and she has always been a fierce advocate for women, for women's rights and for women's progress. These critical moments in history, like we have seen in recent weeks, are diluted by political agendas. Sexual assault is not a political issue. Throwing stones at parliamentary figures does not address the rot. Gender inequality, sexual abuse, these are societal issues. As Brittany Higgins bravely said yesterday, these are human issues. The collective momentum that we see today is the same momentum that led to women gaining the right to attend university, to vote. In 1962, we righted the wrong of excluding Indigenous women and, indeed, all Indigenous Australians from the right to vote. That same momentum carried us to 1972, when a million Australian women were granted equal pay. In 1976, decades of marches and protests led to states across Australia beginning to decriminalise rape in marriage. In 1994, the introduction of the Sex Discrimination Act, and in 1999, the Equal Opportunity for Women in the Workplace Act. In 2011, the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children. The list goes on. In 2018, the Women's Economic Security Statement, the first inaugural Women's Economic Security Statement, provided more than $100 million dedicated to practical measures to support women's economic empowerment. And in 2019, this government delivered $340 million in funding to the National Plan to reduce violence against women and their children. These are issues that have been fought by brave women collectively. The changes we have seen in this country have been at the hands of different governments, different leaders, different organisations, different community groups, different ideologies and one clear direction forward. This government and all of its ministers stand with Australians to make change, to continue that momentum that we have witnessed across history and to make Australia an equal place for women. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, and thank you, Senator Urquhart, for letting me go before you were. But you're going to love this. Trust me. It's all about Premier Gutwin, and I know you're just going to love it, because I know you and I have those spirits up our end. So the Tasmanian government had a bit of a whoopsie moment yesterday. Would you believe it? After keeping us all waiting for eight months in Tasmania to hear what's happening with the new ships for the spirit. They announced their decision to go back to square one and have them build overseas. You've got to hand it to the Tassie Liberals. It's not often that you see a government announce a major project, have a contract fall through and have to find a new shipbuilder, delay getting started for eight months to consider their options, set up a task force that they completely ignore, 
completely, absolutely ignore, backflip back to the original plan and, ups and upset a world-class industry leader all in one go. How about that? COVID must be over. The pressure's on for the Libs. Full credit to the Tasmanian government, eh? It's not every day you're able to claim the full bingo card of bureaucratic stuff-ups. You'd better be happy because while you've been stuffing around, businesses and councils have been waiting to hear what's going to happen with their jobs and their communities. New businesses have put up off opening their doors while the owners wait to see if the new ships and the tourists they're meant to bring will ever actually arrive. And so also the Premier could run a review into the ships that doesn't include the input of the company that runs the ships. After eight months and more than a hundred thousand bucks, yeah, hundred thousand bucks, now he's decided he doesn't actually want to want to listen to the, what the review says, and he's just doing he's just going to do what the company planned to do in the first place. How about that? What's the point? Where's the sense in what's been going on in the last 12 months? Absolutely none. Now, I want to be clear. The instinct to try and build the ships in Australia was the right one. The Tasmanian government were probably trying to do the right thing here. And it does take time to do an honest job of finding out if it's possible to build them here in Australia. So fair is fair. I'll give him that much. The heart was in the right place. No problems. But how do you set out to do the right thing and end up getting it so, so wrong and upsetting so many people? How did it take so long to figure out what to do? The indecision and the towing and throwing creates uncertainty for tourism businesses in Tasmania right when the industry is suffering the most, like they haven't been through enough with COVID. Not to mention that they're about to get their JobKeeper cut off. Yay! And instead of knowing the new ships will be coming next year, those businesses are going to have to wait now until the middle of 2023 for them to arrive. And I have to say, I don't hold much hope of that happening either, the way this has been playing out. It's a whole year of lost opportunities for our struggling businesses and communities. And once again, I just about put a whole month's wages of my own on that they will not be done by 2023. They will not be done. And in the meantime, it could cost our state's economy 350 million bucks that we certainly do not have as a little state. We're not Western Australia with all those resources. I can tell you that much. How many cafe owners, family-owned businesses, regional tourist, tourism operators, farmers, producers will miss out because the Premier couldn't make up his mind on this project? If all of this wasn't bad enough, here's the cherry on the top. The Tasmanian government has alienated a world-class industry leader right here in our very own backyard in Tasmania. In cat, make world-class catamarans that are used across the globe. And founder Bob Clifford employs 500 people in Tasmania. That's the kind of person we want to stick around, not have them thinking they should bugger off overseas because they're not appreciated here. Which, by the way, that's exactly how he's feeling right now. And the Tasmanian government says that they want to support INCAT, even though they didn't back them on this project. Well, someone should probably grab a dictionary and teach them what support means, because this is not support. This is not what support means. I was doubtful about this project the moment it was announced in 2017. It seemed like a cheap pre-election promise and nothing more. Four years on, and it's pretty clear that the Tasmanian Liberals never really knew what they were doing with this one. And frankly, they've wasted a lot of time and taxpayers' money on it in the meantime. And it's scarce, that taxpayers' money in Tasmania. Let's hope they can get these negotiations with the overseas shipbuilder wrapped up by their deadline in 30 days. Once again, I reckon it'll need a magic wand and an absolute miracle. Otherwise, they'll be going back to the drawing board again. And I don't think that's going to be good being 12 months out of an election. And if that happens, it will take another four years to get that underway. Who knows? I think I speak for Tasmanian tax taxpayers when I say I would hope not. But I can tell you what has been a waste of a lot of time. It is very disappointing. Um, something that should have been so simple has not been done and they've had more than enough time.
Now I want to talk about nuclear power. Are the energy wars getting you down yet? I wouldn't blame you. I'm tired of it too. For as long as I've been up here, people in this chamber have been bickering about whether climate change exists and what we should do about it. Some of them reckon Australia should run 100 per cent off sun and wind. They want to see coal gone in a matter of years. They don't like gas. And don't you dare mention carbon capture and storage. Others see coal as the holy grail of the Australian economy, capable of keeping any number of regional workers in a decent job. For them, any move to wind back our reliance on coal is as welcome as a slap across the face. But once you leave the politics behind, the reality is that our coal-fired power stations are on the way out, and we have to be honest about that. And the reality is that renewables aren't up to the task of replacing them yet, so we're going to have a gap. This is where we're at. While we're all up here fighting over yet another Greens motion to lock people up for a crime of wanting to open a coal mine, or yet another Nationals motion to start a raffle where the winner gets a free coal mining licence, there are workers out there who are wondering where they're going to go when their power station closes. And I think we're forgetting that. They're at the coal face, literally. We saw it just this week when Energy Australia told us that they're pulling out of Latrobe Valley earlier than they had planned. Those workers don't need emotion. They need action. They need compromise. They need big ideas. They need jobs to go into. So here's something I've been thinking about. Maybe Australia should look at investing in nuclear power. Nuclear energy has almost totally zero emissions, so it would help us meet our climate change goals. It's really efficient. One kilo, of one kilo of uranium gets out as much power as two million kilos of coal. And we have heaps of it here in Australia. What do you know? It's one of our resources. 28 per cent of it. Actually, 28 per cent of it, I believe, Senator Patrick, in your hometown of South Australia. How about that? It will give those coal workers something to move on to and into and open up new horizons for the new horizons for the mining industry in our country. Now, I know there are some drawbacks on this idea. Nuclear costs are a pretty penny, and to be sure, it's cheaper than building a whole new coal-fired power station. But if I'm being honest, it's not by that much. It also takes us a while for us to be able to make that switch from coal to nuclear. If we started today, it'd still take at least 20 years to replace all our coal-fired power stations with nuclear reactors. Of course, the other thing people worry about is whether it's safe. We'd have to figure out where we'd put the waste and the reactors would become, more, would become important points for our national security. No one wants to chance a nuclear meltdown. But on these issues, Australia is well placed. We have the sort of country that makes sorting waste much safer than it is in places where you get earthquakes, and that also means we're much less likely to see a meltdown caused by a natural disaster. At the moment, nuclear power is banned by the federal law. So we'd need to get the changes through Parliament to make it happen. I'm not wedded to the idea, but I think it's worth talking about and we need to talk about it more. Maybe it's a way through the energy wars that's a win-win for both sides. But we need to start talking about it. I'd like to know what you guys think. I've got a survey on my website where you can tell me what you reckon. Jump online and tell me what you think, because we're not getting anywhere by not talking about it. So I really want you guys to start talking about nuclear. Like I said, when you've got 28 per cent of you, the, the word uranium sitting in South Australia, and we're not using that, and we're importing it to other countries to use for probably not the right things, but for nuclear weapons instead of nuclear power, then we really need to start talking about this. This is not an evil thing. Nuclear power is in our own backyard. And I've told you I'm sick and tired of wasting our resources. It's sitting there in front of us. It's in our own ground. Let's start using it, guys. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to talk about a scandal in relation to water purchases. I will reveal what the government has recently found out, but which it has not yet made public, that the government paid $13 million more for a water purchase than it was advised to by way of independent valuation. Senators, one 30-cent phone call could have saved the taxpayer $13 million. How? Let me explain. Back in February 2016, Eastern Australia Agriculture offered to sell water from their property at Clyde for a cost of $2,200 per megalitre. The person they wrote to was Miss Mary Colreevy, 
and Assistant Secretary in the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources. Following uh, that um, offer, an independent valuation was commissioned properly to establish what a reasonable price might be for the water at Eastern, uh, Eastern Australia Agricultural's properties at Clyde and Kiora. Now, if those names ring a bell, it's because they should. They are the properties at the centre of the Angus Taylor Watergate scandal. The government required a valuation which provided a single point value and a value range. The valuation was delivered to the department in September of 2016. In December 2016, a brief was presented to the then minister, Mr Barnaby Joyce, by Ms Colreevy, to propose the purchase of 15,000 megalitres. Approval was given to explore the purchase. Now, the valuation uh, that was received was invalid after three months, and so a further valuation was sought sometime in the new year, in 2017. It was received by the government in March 2017. Mr Joyce um, was briefed a few days later by Ms Colreevy, initially requesting the purchase of uh, 14,000 megalitres of water. The minister placed conditions on the approval and asked that final approval be sought once the conditional, the con, uh, conditional uh, uh, approvals had been met. On, uh, sorry, in May 2017, two months later, Ms Colreevy had engaged with Eastern Australian Agriculture uh, and put a further proposal to the minister, this time for uh, 28,700 megalitres. An offer was then made to Eastern Australia Agriculture in June 2017. A more senior official, Mr Paul Morris, relying on the work of Ms Colreevy, signed off on the purchases uh, in, 2000, in July 2017. A contract was signed and the water was purchased at $2,745 per megalitre. So remember that number. Now we're blind to what happened behind the scenes. Uh, the reason we know what happened was because on my second day in the Senate, on the 16th of November 2017, I sought an order for production of documents for documents relating to strategic water purchases. A significant number of doctors, uh, documents were provided, including valuations, but the valuations were redacted. I challenged those redactions, both privately with ministers and publicly through estimates. How could Water valuations for water already purchased by the department be considered commercial in confidence. How could water valuations that were invalid three months after they were issued be considered commercial in confidence? In response to a question on notice in May 2018 uh, at estimates, I was given the following answer uh, about the price paid. This is, uh, and I quote from the hand, from the uh, Quan. In August 2017, the price paid for 28.7 gigalitres of in overland flow entitlements in the condo mine below Boulogne was $2,745 per megalitre. This price was consistent with the market valuation. In this case, the price paid by the department was above the, standard, uh, the estimated standard market value range, but below the maximum price the independent value advised uh, we should expect to pay. The valuation advice stated that the department should be prepared to pay 10 to 30 per cent above the standard market rate for quote, properties of a high standard that have achieved above average levels of water use efficiency in this region. The agreed price was within this wider range and reflects the well-developed nature of the property from which it was purchased. Unsatisfied with the lack of transparency in the valuation, I did what I always do. I FOI'd the valuations. The department refused to give me the, the data. That's, uh, that's standard, uh, pr uh, standard um, practice. No surprises. I appealed it to the Information Commissioner. In the meantime, I had this discussion with Ms Colreevy at Estimates in March last year. Ms Colreevy, I want to go back to a statement you made about Watergate purchases. In your own words, you said it's a dynamic market and prices change all the time. You said that you had disclosed a whole bunch of information by way of OPD. Um, one of the things you didn't disclose in that OPD was the valuations, the nominal valuation by the valuers, colliers, and indeed the valuation range by colliers, on the basis it was commercially sensitive. In your own words, you've just said that the pricing is dynamic and it changed from year to year. Can I ask you to provide me with the nominal valuation and indeed the valuation range, noting what you've just said? 
Ms Colreavy replied, I can refer you to my answer in Hansards and questions on notice previously that those values were redacted for commercial reasons. I went on to caution Ms Colreavy. I said to her, I think in some sense you are withholding information from the Senate and I foreshadow if the Information Commissioner agrees with me, I'm pretty sure I'm on fairly solid ground, I will seek a referral to the Privileges Committee for contempt because I think you are being overly secret on information which should be in the public domain. Now, on the 12th of uh, July, uh, a parallel process, the auditor completed an audit uh, into water purchases, where he stated of the purchases of the water at Kiora and Clyde and others, and I quote, these purchases achieve value for money with the price being paid at or below the maximum price identified by the independent market valuations. So there we have it. Even the auditors agree that uh, everything is in order. However, on the 13th of August, before the Information Commissioner made her FOI decision uh, on, the, on my uh, review, uh, the de department released the documents to me. They revealed the truth. A point value of $1,500 per megalitre and a valuation range of $1,100 to $2,300. That was the maximum price to be paid, $2,300. Yet we paid $2,745 for the water. So on the 3rd of November last year, I wrote to the Auditor General seeking an explanation. How did the, dep did the department and order to come to the conclusion that the price paid was within the range. It was clearly $475 per megalitre above the maximum price. Now I got my response last week from the Auditor General, and here it comes. The Auditor General has advised me that, and I quote, subsequently the valuer has advised the ANAO that he does not consider the application of the premium referred to in the val in their valuation report to the range provided as reasonable. The valuer has said it was not reasonable for them to pay the price they did. The Auditor-General has now discussed this with the department and they are reviewing the material that has led them to believe it was okay to pay $13 million above the independent valuer's maximum price. Now, I don't need to tell them what the cause of the error I don't need them to tell me what the cause of the error was. I know what the error is. Incompetence. Incompetence on behalf of Ms. Cole Reevey. She had carriage of this sale from start to finish. How she came to the conclusion that $2,745 per megalitre was an OK price to pay when the valuer had clearly stated the maximum was $2,300 per megalitre is beyond comprehension. If she had just made a 30 cent phone call to discuss the valuation report with the valuer, taxpayers would have an extra $13 million to spend on useful things. Now we can't have these sorts of mistakes just being brushed off as oh well. We can't have officials thinking it doesn't matter. It's only taxpayers' money. It does matter. And people serving in senior positions must be held accountable for their mistakes. Miss Cole Reevy must resign. If she does not, she must be fired. She has demonstrated incompetence beyond her post to the, to the tune of thirteen million dollars. And if her departmental secretary, Mr Andrew Metcalf, uh, does not see that she is removed, then he should go as well, because the standard you walk past is the standard you accept, and this sort of incompetence is quite unacceptable. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. The Australian Greens believe that universal human rights are fundamental and that they must be respected in all countries and in all regions and for all people. And that's why it's so important that we use this platform that we've got here in the parliament to highlight the attacks on human rights that are occurring both here in Australia and around the world. And we must call out those attacks on human rights and highlight the incredible work of activists, campaigners and those who are fighting for justice in every country. I want to start tonight here in Australia, where Australia is currently undergoing its universal periodic review through the UN Human Rights Council. And last time I spoke on human rights in this place, I mentioned the campaign to raise the age of legal responsibility. And another crucial issue that I want to touch on tonight is the protection that Australia offers to LGBTIQ communities. And commenting on the recommendations that Australia received in the current Universal Periodic Review, Equality Australia said 
The UN has praised Australia for delivering on marriage equality, but heeded our call that no LGBTIQ person be left behind. Amidst a review into its overall human rights record, Australian governments have been told to lift their game on equality for LGBTIQ people, particularly for trans and intersex people. And among the recommendations that Australia received were to end harmful practices, including forced and coercive medical interventions to ensure the bodily integrity of children with intersex variations, to ensure free and timely access to appropriate health care for all, including LGBTIQ people, children and adolescents, where the young person has sufficient maturity to provide informed assent, consent, and to ensure that in gender reassignment cases, appropriate measures are taken regarding the identity do documents. And it's very appropriate that tonight I draw attention to these because of the shameful motion that was passed through this Senate today that was an attack on the human rights, an attack on the very identity of trans people. And it was the sort of garbage that I could expect from some senators in this place. I did not expect the government to support it. It was appalling. It was that condoning of transphobic and completely unsupportive language. And so it it was just an appalling attack that I think our, this government should be ashamed of yourself for supporting that motion today. And it was particularly tragic that it happened on the day that we also had a gathering of the Parliamentary Friends Group of LGBTIQ plus Australians, which was a wonderful gathering this evening, and it had politicians from right across the political spectrum. It was our first gathering in over a year. So it would have been so lovely to have been at that um, gathering this evening without the pall of that appalling motion that passed through the Senate this afternoon hanging over us. I now want to move on to the human rights situation in Cambodia, which has been devastating for human rights and democratic freedoms. And sadly, the dictatorship in Cambodia has taken advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic to tighten their grip on power, not to care for the populace. This is what Human Rights Watch had to say in their recent summary of the situation there, that Cambodi Cambodian authorities filed unsubstantiated charges of incitement, conspiracy and other offences to enforce its crackdown. And activists, union leaders, online critics and others faced escalating intimidation, threats and arbitrary arrests. And over 30 opposition activists were detained as of November 2020, while between July and September at least 14 youth and environmental activists were charged with baseless incitement charges for peaceful protest activities. I want to use tonight to call on the Cambodian authorities to abandon their repression of public and democratic voices and to stop attacking peaceful opposition parties. And the Cambodian government should be working for the welfare of its citizens, including doing everything possible to vaccinate as many citizens as safely as possible. And if the Cambodian government is receiving international assistance to address this crisis, well then those international aid organisations as well as their government must assure that that assistance goes towards responding to the pandemic and must not be diverted inappropriately. I now want to move on to the situation in Bangladesh. I had the privilege recently of meeting with the members of the Bangladeshi diaspora community here in Australia, and they were incredibly concerned about the human rights situation in Bangladesh. And again, Human Rights Watch summarises the situation as saying that Bangladeshi authorities are arbitrarily arresting government critics under the draconian Digital Security Act, stifling civil society, independent media and human rights activists. There are serious and numerous allegations of torture, extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances by security forces that continue to operate with near complete impunity. So I want to call on the Bangladesh government to respect and protect its citizens and residents and their human rights. It, again, it must support democratic debate, not stifle it with arbitrary arrests and torture. And in turn, here in Australia, there is action that we can be taking. We must progress swiftly our proposed Magnitsky legislation so that we can create a human rights sanctions based sanctions regime with clear implications for those who are undermining human rights including financial asset freezes and travel bans as appropriate. And now I want to move to the Philippines. 
And in my role as the Australian Greens Foreign Affairs spokesperson, it's been a great privilege over the last few months to have been participating in a project called the Investigate PH project, which is an initiative of peoples from all over the world concerned about the state of human rights in the Philippines. They, we have been holding independent investigations on the human rights violations in the country to further substantiate the landmark, um, United Nation, landmark 2020 report of the United Nations High Commissioner for, the, on, uh, for Human Rights on the Philippines' rights situation. And tonight, I met. I have been a commissioner overseeing this project, and tonight I met with other commissioners on the project and with members of the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet. And the first report of the Investigate PH project is being launched tonight at midnight. And this report highlights three areas of concern. The political repression by state forces has actually intensified and become more brazen since the UN report of June last year. That the newly passed Anti-Terrorism Act, which was enacted in July last year, as well as the National Task Force to End Local Communist Armed Conflict, which was established by executive order in December 2018, have provided institutional mechanisms that facilitate these human rights violations and that domestic remedies and mechanisms to address violations continue to be lacking. And I just want to share with you one story from the report tonight, amongst the many which have been meticulously documented by researchers um, talking to people and families and survivors um, of the extrajudicial killings and arrests. And this is the story of Zara Alvarez. And she was a human rights defender. She was a paralegal for Karapatan, a human rights organisation, and a research and advocacy officer for the Negros Island Health Integrated Program. Her work involved assisting with legal cases of political prisoners and documenting rights violations in impoverished communities. She was arrested on trumped-up charges and imprisoned from October 2012 to July 2014. Eventually, the charges were dismissed for lack of evidence in March 2020. And after her release, she continued her human rights work. But in 2018, she was tagged as a terrorist on a list of 648 49 names in a court petition to designate individuals as terrorists. And on the list were many human rights defenders, including a UN special rapporteur. And Alvarez's name and all ex uh, except two were eventually removed from this list. But afterwards, she continued to experience threats and intimidation. And then her name appeared on a police hit list in 2018. Four others on the list were then murdered. And because of these threats, in 2019, she applied for a court protection order, which was denied by the Court of Appeals. And then, on August the 17th last year, she was shot and killed by an unidentified assailant who fled by motorbike. She became the fifth person on the hit list murdered and the 13th human rights worker of Karapatan slain under President Duterte. And minutes after her death, the regional secretary-general of Karapatan um, received a text message from an unknown number saying, don't worry, you're next. This is what's going on in the Philippines at the moment. I really want to thank Peter Murphy, the chair of Investigate PH, my fellow commissioners and all of the researchers who contribute to this work. And I want to say to the people of the Philippines that we see you, we hear you and we share your, pa your pain. We will not give up on you and I will continue to use my platform in this place to highlight the extraordinarily awful situation currently in the Philippines. Thank you. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about the current wave of COVID-19 infections and deaths amongst the Palestinian people and to implore the State of Israel to do more and do better when it comes to the health and wellbeing of Palestinians. Two days ago, Palestinian record, re, Palestine recorded 2,142 new coronavirus cases in the previous 24 hours, 15 deaths and 2,169 recoveries. That was according to the daily update by the Palestinian Ministry of Health. To date, so far as we can ascertain, amongst Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, there have been 209,304 confirmed COVID cases and 2,268 deaths. With the number of people falling ill, the number of hospitalisations and the number of deaths increasing on a daily basis, in February and early March, Palestinian authorities were forced to take unprecedented measures. 
In February, a new lockdown was imposed across the West Bank as Palestinians face this fresh surge of coronavirus cases and, con and continue to wait for a proper vaccine rollout. World Health Organisation data shows that among Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza and East Jerusalem, the case fatality rate is 1.1 per cent. That's the proportion of reported infections which result in a person dying. In Israel, it is far below that, at 0.7 per cent. The Reuters news agency reports that Palestinian hospitals are over full and intensive care units operating at 100 per cent capacity with coronavirus patients in some areas of the Israel-occupied West Bank. The Palestinian Prime Minister blamed the lockdown on the struggle to get vaccines delivered to the territory. To date, Palestinians in the West Bank have received 10,000 doses of Russia's Sputnik vaccine. A separate delivery of 20,000 Russian vaccines has been delivered to the other Palestinian territory, Gaza. The International COVAX scheme, the global initiative backed by the World Health Organization to get vaccines to poorer nations, should cover up to 20 per cent of vaccine requirements for the Palestinians, but has yet to provide any. Delivery is expected soon. None of these eff efforts at vaccination are going to come anywhere near vaccinating the Palestinian population, estimated at around 6 million people. Palestinian leaders say they can't afford either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines. And as Palestinian hospitals fill up, in Israel, bars and restaurants have reopened. With 4 million of its almost 7 million adult population fully vaccinated and another 1 million awaiting their second dose, Dose, media outlets described Israelis in Tel Aviv as immersed in a carnival of post-pandemic rebirth that has left its citizens giddy with their new freedoms, restaurants are fully booked, bars are packed, traffic has returned to its infamous snail pace and life, dreary and frightening for a year, is back to normal. Because Israel has one of the world's fastest vaccination campaigns, indeed, Israel right now has the highest proportion, proportion of vaccinations in the world, and of December the as of December 22, it had administered the first dose of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine to 83 citizens out of every 10,000. By March 14, it had fully vaccinated 46.5 per cent of its population, and 57 per cent had, released, had received at least one dose. Almost 90 per cent of Israelis over the age of 50 have been fully vaccinated. The program has inoculated more than 4.6 million people with at least the first injection, the fastest per, per capita pace of any country. It's an extraordinary undertaking. The Israeli government has acted with swift determination to curve a serious wave of disease and death and stubbornly high infection rates, a determination that puts the Australian government to shame. Such, such, so much for us being at the head of the queue. Infection rates and hospitalisation rates in Israel have plummeted. One study has found a 41 per cent drop in new COVID cases among those over 60. Hospital administrators have confirmed that fewer elderly people are flooding into COVID wards. The number of COVID patients in one facility has declined by two thirds in, one in two, two months. But in the midst of this extraordinary effort, Israel has distributed a tiny 7,000 vaccine doses to Palestinians living under Israel occupation in the West Bank and Gaza. This is 1 per cent of people. A further 10,000 doses arrived from Russia, but Israel delayed them getting into Gaza, holding them up for days at the border. In coordination with Egypt, Israel maintains a strict blockade on Gaza. In mid-February, during debate in the Knesset, some Israeli lawmakers said the government should only allow vaccines into Gaza in return for concessions from Hamas. Ahmed Tabi, a parliamentarian from Israel's Arab minority, said even a discussion about withholding vaccines from people who needed them was shocking. Your children will be ashamed, he is reported to have said. Your children will be ashamed. In Palestinian territories captured by Israel in the 1967 war, the vast, mass, vast majority of the population has yet to be inoculated, and Israel has faced criticism at home and abroad for not providing more vaccines. In the last few weeks under pressure, it has begun vaccinating Palestinians working in Israel, workers that are needed to maintain the Israeli economy, but not their families. 
and after international pressure, Israel agreed just recently to transfer just 5,000 Moderna vaccine doses to Palestinian medical workers in the West Bank. It's not enough, and it is tragic. A report by the World Bank says that Palestinians will need more financial and logistical help in order to cover 60 per cent of the population. In recent weeks, the Israeli government has faced criticism from UN Human Rights Council, US Democrats, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty for failing to meet its obligations as an occupying power. The United Nations human rights body has released a statement saying it's Israel's responsibility to provide equitable access to COVID-19 vaccinations for Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. The Fourth Geneva Convention states an occupying power has responsibility for public health and hygiene in the occupied territory, with particular reference to the adoption and application of the prophylactic and preventative measures necessary to combat the spread of contagious, contagious disease and epidemics. The UN body says differential access is morally and legally unacceptable under international law laid out in the Geneva Conventions on the regulation of occupied territories. Members of the Israeli government point to the 1993 and 1995 Oslo Accords, which Israel signed with the Palestinian Liberation Organisation. They say these accords give the Palestinian Authority oversight of public health under the principles of self-determination. And the Palestinian authorities point to another part of those accords, which says Israel and the Palestinian side shall exchange information regarding epidemics and contagious diseases, shall cooperate in combating them and shall develop methods for the exchange of medical files and documents. But international law takes priority over these accords. Despite Israel's position on the issue, the Fourth Geneva Convention is specific about the duty of the occupying power to provide health care. There are around six million Palestinians in Gaza and the occupied West Bank, six million people who face the continued tyranny and death from a pandemic, and many of them live or work literally metres from vaccinated Israeli citizens. They should not have to wait. And I've said many times in this place, and I'll say it again today, Australia has been a friend of Israel since its creation, and as a friend we must respectfully tell our friends when their actions are wrong. They must not stand idly by. We must help them find a different path. And as friends we must not allow the last chances of a long-term peaceful resolution to be lost. Such a resolution requires a clear affirmation that Palestinians must have equal rights to Israelis. And equal rights means equal rights to vaccination in the midst of a pandemic. Israel has a surplus of COVID vaccines, so much of a sur surplus that its Prime Minister seriously floated the idea of sending that surplus to countries who have moved or will move embassies or offices to Jerusalem, Guatemala, Honduras, the Czech Republic, Hungary, literally giving it away to friendly countries while Palestinians go without. It is my hope that Israel will understand that it has a clear obligation to fulfil by sending vaccines to the Palestinian Authority. Differential access is morally and legally un unacceptable under international law. So today I urge Israel to donate the extra doses it has ordered but does not need to the Palestinians, and I urge them to do that with speed and efficiency. Beyond that, I I urge Israel to work with Palestinian authorities to ensure that vaccination of the Palestinian population with the same determination, resources and expertise that they demonstrated to the world with the Israeli population. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, my comments relate to the February 2021 review into the National Water Initiative, which forms the basis for the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. This is the second five-year review. The first review did nothing to improve the Basin Plan, and this version will continue that tradition. The many deficiencies and injustices of the plan are simply ignored in this Productivity Commission report. Surely the essence of good government is to accept when you have made a mistake and then put things right. This report does the opposite. The bureaucrats have dug in deeper than a sand slug in the Murray River's Barmer choke. For listeners who are wondering about the relevance of sand slugs, stay tuned. Last month, I met with Peter Millington, Order of Australia recipient, the last commissioner of the Murray-Darling Basin Commission, 
before the Basin Plan started in 2012. This meeting confirmed that the 2012 Basin Plan was flawed from the start. Senator Hanson and I have come to the same conclusion based on our extensive consultation during five tours of the Murray-Darling Basin over the last five years. We've spoken to farmers, to local businesses, to local Aboriginal peoples and to water irrigation authorities. And when One Nation consults, we actually listen, check, research and then act on the data and on what we're told. After watching the Morrison government in action for 18 months, it's clear to us that the only reason this government listens is to fine-tune their marketing pitch. The Murray-Darling Basin Plan cannot be saved by lies and spin, even from formerly robust organisations like the Productivity Commission. This Productivity Commission report refers to the recent drought as unprecedented. Has the authority not read the Australian Antarctic Climate and Ecosystem Cooperative Research Centre's report dated June 2016, commonly called the Ice Dome Core Reconstruction? That report found that Australia has had eight droughts across the last 1,000 years that were more serious than the recent drought. And the 1920s, 1940 drought was far more serious and much, much longer. Global warming did not cause, cause the last eight droughts and it did not cause the recent one. The formal assumption behind the need for the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is flawed. The plan is not needed to counter water, falling water inflows caused by, water, water, caused by climate change. Inflows are moving back to their long-term average following the end of the recent far shorter drought. A plan, though, is needed to manage cyclical water flows and to fairly balance the competing interests in the basin. By ignoring the need for cyclical flow management, the basin plan has gone off in the wrong direction and caused great harm to our rural communities and to the agricultural industry. The most important element of cyclical water management is suitable water storage. Now, new dams are something we will never see under the Morrison Liberal National Government, who have signed onto the whole global warming scam, hook, line and sinker. There will be no new dams, or power stations for that matter, under a Liberal National or Labor Greens government. Well, not real ones anyway. The hastily announced Wyangala Dam wall raising has stalled in the face of a cost blowout to $1.5 billion before construction has even started. The new Dungowan Dam has moved forward. A year after the announcement, the government now knows where it's going to go. Big deal. They actually cite the dam. At a cost of $500 million for an additional 16 gigalitres, the money being spent on Dungowan could be better used building weirs to provide better water security in rural communities. Many of these communities almost ran out of water in the last drought, and Stanthorpe in Queensland did run out. Now that's inexcusable in a developed country like ours. One Nation's Weirs for Life project will expand weirs in country towns to provide five years water security for town water and regional areas. One Nation will fund the business case for an 800 gigalitre dam on Mount Buffalo known as the Big Buffalo Expansion. Outside of the Murray-Darling Basin, One Nation will fund the business case for the Bradfield Dam system, including Hell's Gate Dam. We will renew the dam wall to original storage levels at Paradise Dam and ensure construction of Urana and Emu Swamp Dams. Only one nation has the courage to stand up for rural and regional Australia and build the dams we need to provide certainty for our agricultural sector. Artificial water scarcity has allowed water trading to turn into water speculation. This report ignores the, the scourge of water speculation. Now, according to Peter Millington, prior to the Basin Plan, there were rules that prevented more than 10 per cent of local water being transferred from one valley to another within the basin. The new Howard Turnbull Basin Plan in 2007, though, eliminated that restriction and allowed unfettered, free-for-all water trading. This has led to water licences being transferred from above natural constraints like the Barmachoke and the Lower Goulburn to areas further down, down river. Water has to be forced through these natural constraints to meet irrigation and environmental commitments demands downstream. This erosion is causing that's caused is stripping out the banks and silting up the river. For hundreds of kilometres, the Murray and Goulburn banks have been eroded back several metres on each side. The Barmachoke has suffered a reduction in capacity from 10 gigalitres a day to 7 gigalitres a day as a result of this damage. One third lost. The Productivity Commission report waxes lyrical on how well this system is working. What? 
Did the Productivity Commission even leave its office in Barton, just nearby, and see what is really happening along the river? Can I ask residents of the basin, when was the last time you saw someone from the Productivity Commission in your area getting the facts for themselves? Never, I suspect. To the Productivity Commission, the only measure of success is how much money can be created out of thin air through water speculation. There's no concern for the family farms water speculation is sending broke. The destroyed lives, the country towns that are emptying out, none of this matters to the Productivity Commission. Well, the natural environment matters, rural and regional communities matter, and people matter. The environmental and social damage caused by water speculation must be factored into the cost-benefit analysis of the Basin Plan. If it were, then the need to stop intervalley trades and water speculation would be so obvious. Schedule 3.3 of the Water Act 2007 calls for a transparent water register to record water trades. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority tried to implement a water register in 2012 and, after spending $30 million, gave up. They just gave up. One Nation will shortly be introducing a legislative amendment to remind the government that they have had 14 years to introduce the water register required by the Water Act and to indicate a date by which that implementation must be completed. Now, I did promise to discuss sand slugs. A sand slug is a plume of sand caused by human activity like mining that is washed into a river where it slowly travels down until building up over time at a, constant, at a constraint like the Barma Choke. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority is claiming with a perfectly straight face that the sand blocking the Barma Choke came from gold mining in areas like Beechworth and Mitta Mitta 150 years ago. The authority is seriously asking us to believe that sand from gold mining has taken 150 years to work its way down to the choke. And the authority is asking us to believe that the sand being ripped out of the riverbanks right now is clearing the choke and heading out to sea, but sand from gold mining 150 years ago is building up in the river bends. Now, look at where Mitta Mitta and Beechworth are on a map, upstream of the Yorongo Dam Wall, Yarrawonga Dam Wall. Well, the authority must answer this simple question. Why didn't the weir at Yarrawonga stop the sand slug? That dam has been there since 1939. Would we not have noticed sand building up behind the wall for 80 years? I call on the Minister for Agriculture to withdraw the sand slug report and apologise for insulting the intelligence of the basin community and disrespecting it. The federal government does not have the power to legislate agriculture, water or land use, despite the fact that it's stolen land rights. As a result, the Water Act 2007 relies on a combination of referred powers and external affairs powers to cobble together legislation that never contained the triple guarantee that we pretend is there. The triple guarantee is protection for agriculture, rural communities and for the environment. The, mon the moment guarantees are written in for agriculture and for rural communities, the Water Act becomes unconstitutional. It is a lie. Instead of rubber stamping the injustice and misery the plan has caused for the last, last 10 years, we should be working out how to replace the Basin Plan with something that can produce a true triple bottom line. The Office of the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder is making things worse, not better. When the Basin Plan was brought in, states had substantial amounts of water allocated to the environment. The Commonwealth has no land of its own. The Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder is watering state land with federal water and, in many cases, duplicating watering by the states, all stolen from farmers. Consideration should be given to closing the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder and giving their water back to the states for the environment or to farming before more damage is done. Finally, I note that the data used in this progress report ends at 2019. It's now 2021. What happened to the 2019-20 water year? Was it because there was too much water to sustain the drought narrative? According to the Bureau of Meteorology, as of January 30, 2021, 100 per cent of the Murray-Darling Basin is not in water deficit, which is the latest nonsense way of saying it's not in a drought. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority website clearly states that the Basin Plan was created in response order. to the drought. Senator well, Roberts, the drought your is over, so farmers expired. can have their water back. Senator Freevanti Wells. Oh, thank you, Mr. Deputy President. On 10 July 2020, I made a 52 page submission to the Royal Commission on Aged Care based on two key premises ensuring older Australians have the care they need, when they need it, wherever they need it, and that people want to stay uh, home as long as they can. My submission specifically addressed the systemic problems identified in the interim report, offering solutions for now and the future. The Royal Commissioners agree on a majority of the recommendations, especially on two key points—the need for a thorough 
redesign of the system with new robust governance arrangements and a new aged care levy to deal with the inadequacy of funding. Their findings that aged care has often been treated by the Australian government as a lower order priority and that the Australian government has been the dominant funder of aged care services, but it has not funded the system adequately are correct. But they differ on the institutional form of the respective governance arrangements and how that levy is determined. And this divergence has implications for changes each are advocating. I'm very pleased um, they pick up on many of the suggestions that I made in my submission. Both commissioners were critical, as I was, that aged care wasn't in cabinet, and that the name of the department should include aged care. At least Scott Morrison has rectified this by naming Greg Hunt as Minister for Health and Aged Care. I suggested a full integration of the health and ageing systems under one Medicare umbrella. Australians understand the operation of the Medicare system, including co-contributions. Recommendations include an expansion of Medicare services available in aged care. Co-payments, which are a feature of the Medicare, need to remain a live option for long-term sustainability of the system. Recommendations also include a new Aged Care Act founded on needs-based system with a universal entitlement to aged care when required reconfiguring the system as one of entitlement uh, of care to deliberately mir mirror Medicare entitlements, a rights-based approach reflecting our international obligations and a general non-delegable statutory duty on approved aged care providers to ensure that the nursing and personal care they provide is safe and of high quality so far as is reasonable. I also suggested that by accrediting aged care facilities to provide more services, it would not only add to their viability, but would also effectively allow them to become aged care hubs or one-stop shops for all aged care services. I am especially pleased that the recommendation for the approval of providers for particular kinds of services or general approval for all kinds of aged care services attracting government funding goes a long way to facilitating my suggested hub model. This, combined with changes to aged care areas to reflect local area networks and the expansion of allied health services for aged care, will further facilitate those local providers who are already plugged into local networks. The push for smaller, lower density, low congregate living arrangements for people with dementia reflect my suggestions for care similar to that which we were able to acquire for my dad who had de dementia. Recommendations also pick up my suggestions about the need for greater medical services in aged care, recognising that the need to alleviate the critical intersection between health and aged care, including greater usage of technology, real-time reporting and the use of outreach services and aged care accredited medical practices. I was especially pleased to see many of my suggestions regarding workforce issues, including staff ratios, addressing pay gaps, better training and career progression, including abolishing ACFI, were picked up. This will go a long way to address the paper war in aged care and return staff to doing what they should be doing and what they prefer to be doing, and that is taking care of our older Australians. My submission advocated for a five-year agreement, a partnership between the government and the sector, to tackle the necessary reform. It would be a consensus-based process, depoliticising the important process of reform, given that both sides of politics have shied away from reform for fear of criticism. A five-year agreement would straddle different governments. It would be akin to the pharmacy agreement approach. This is about the method of achieving reform, and I sincerely hope that the government will adopt this approach. Tonight, I would like to focus on the important issue of funding. Commissioner Pagoni advocated an independent commission model, arguing that if you continue with the same failed system, you will get the same results. He advocates for a hypothecated aged care levy, a dedicated fund with, within consolidated revenue to be used only for aged care. Parliament would set the levy based on Productivity Commission advice and assessments of all aged care costs over 30 years. In short, under the Pagoni model, contribution to the aged care system would be according to one's income, with the more financially fortunate paying a greater share. 
Commissioner Briggs, with her strong public service background, advocates for a government leadership model with greater independence in certain areas like quality regulation and pricing. She believes it is better to reform existing institutions, the argument being that the Commonwealth is the primary funder of aged care and therefore only it can run the system and ensure ministerial accountability and greater integration with the states and territories. She advocates a non-hypothecated earmarked levy, an aged care improvement levy. Like the Medicare levy, it would be paid into consolidated revenue. However, with notionally earmarked funds, the government is not legally obliged to spend them on the identified purpose. She suggests 1% 1, 1 of taxable personal income. And whilst this would fund substantial part of improvements to the system, the government would need to meet the shortfall. The commissioners were critical of the 1997 Act and Department of Finance Cabinet Memorandum, which was, and I quote, not primarily concerned with the quality of care or with ensuring that older people can access the care that they need, but identifies the billions in savings that had been achieved to that time by capping service provision and the risks to the government's budgetary position presented by the new arrangements which might, if not carefully managed, undo some of the long-standing fiscal constraints that were operated in aged care. The commissioners were also critical of the decisions made by the government to apply an efficiency dividend to aged care funding and to ration care, concluding aged care that spending was 22.4 per cent lower than it would have been if the efficiency dividend had not been applied. On top of this, they estimated the rationing of places has further reduced uh, expenditure on aged care by 25.7 per cent by the government um, from what it would have been if demand had been met by an unrationed supply of places. The commissioners concluded that collective decisions of successive governments have cut more than $9.8 billion from the budget for aged care in 2018-19, the last prepared by Scott Morrison as Treasurer. In the many reports in recent decades, the most important one was the 2011 Productivity Commission report, Caring for Older Australians, upon which I based my blueprint. It was an important reference point for the Royal Commission. Funding is not about how much we spend, but how we spend it. The Productivity Commission said it was important to unpack accommodation, everyday living, health and personal care costs in designing future funding for aged care. The PC said that older Australians don't want to be passive recipients of services dependent on funded providers, but prefer to be independent and be able to choose where they live, which provider they use, the way in which the services are delivered and whether to purchase additional services and or a higher standard of accommodation. Australians own their own homes or rent, hence critical to any reform is the need to be upfront about the principle of personal responsibility for accommodation and personal needs. Just because you get old does not mean suddenly Australia, the Australian taxpayer must pay these personal expenses. The PC said that Australians will have to pay more for the care of older Australians as our population ages. Finding the right balance between public funding and private funding is a sensitive and complex task, and we need to be upfront with the Australian public about this. In the end, the Productivity Commission concluded that a pay-as-you-go tax finance system supplemented by higher co-contributions and a lifetime stop-loss mechanism was the best approach. Any reform must also be undertaken against the background of two circumstances. Baby boomers are more financially able to contribute to care. For them, choice is very important. Also, the dependency ratio is relevant. That is, the people of working age, 15 to 64 years, for every person aged 65 years and over. In 1978, it was seven. Today, it's 4.2. And by 2058, it will be down to 3.1. And it's against this background it is now time for the government to have the political fortitude to fix aged care. We owe it to all Australians. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Paradise Dam is Australia's greatest or indeed worst infrastructure fail. And, and I think the word fail does not do, do justice to the scandal that is Paradise Dam. Uh, it's, a, it's a stuff up 
And if, if buggering up dams was a criminal offence, then the former Labor government in Queensland, led by Peter Beatty, uh, would be certainly serving time behind bars. Because the failure to build Paradise Dam properly and then the failure of the current Labor administration in Queensland to adequately deal with Paradise Dam is a blight not just on public administration in Australia, but a, a huge blight on, on the farmers of the Wide Bay Burnett, farmers who have invested millions of dollars in building one of Australia's greatest food bowls and are now in the fight of their lives fighting for their very existence because of the failure of the Labor government in Queensland. Now, the farmers are working to raise money for a class action. And I'd like to commend Marlon Law, who are based in, in Bundaberg, uh, for the work that they are doing to bring farmers and the business community and just the community across the, 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 the broader Wide Bay Burnett together to, to fight for, for justice and to, to fight this, this Labor government that just don't seem to care. And for those who might be listening at home, I'd encourage you to go on, on, on Facebook and, and go to Paradise Class Action, uh, one word, and, 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 and get involved with what Marlon and Laura are trying to do. And what I'd like to do is, is thank a number of, of, of businesses and supporters who have already put money into the class action. Wilson's Industrial Sales, Ads Up Engineering, J and R McCracken, Ag, Ag Culture Enterprises, EMU and Sons, Lindsay Australia, Ag Plus Consultancy, Suncoast Gold Macadamies, Vanderfield, DPM, Farmgate Backpackers at Childers, Mason Ag, Zadco, Nowa Power Products, Sunfam CRT, Adrico, Total Growers Services, A1 Real, Realty, Wide Bay Burnett and First National Childers. It's important I read those, those businesses out because they are business, businesses who, who know the importance of Paradise Dam for the broader Wide Bay Burnett. And they know that this class action is probably the last thing left to them because of the failure of the state Labor government in, in Queensland. Now, Without significant rainfall, Paradise Dam is projected to be, to be empty, zero capacity, within months, possibly even weeks. And that's, that's very serious. This is a food bowl that depends on water to irrigate the crops that, that feed Australia and also export it to the world. And what we're facing with these farmers is that the government I've been to, to, to the dam, the government is tearing down parts of, or parts of this dam wall. They gave the community next to no notice. They refused to acknowledge expert advice, and they're refusing to tell the farmers whose livelihoods depend on access to water when or how they will restore the dam. Now, they've also failed to, to produce their own construction reports to their own inquiry. And farmers are being drip-fed quite inadequate information as to the plans that the state Labor government may have for the future of Paradise Dam. I don't even really think it is a, is a dam anymore. It's more just sort of like, like a, a paradise hole, a, a paradise sort of sort of this massive emptiness, a paradise black hole that once once led the way for the growth of this food bowl, but now just leads the way to, to economic ruin for an area that should be able to do so much more for Australia. Now, farmers and their representatives have been advised that one alternative water source is Fred Haig Dam. Now, Fred Haig Dam is a bulk capacity uh, share scheme with two sub-accounts. One is for the Colon sub-scheme and one for the Burnett River sub-scheme. However, details of the inflow distribution show that just 15 per cent of that water share from Fred Haig Dam is available to customers of the Burnett River sub-scheme. Now, Sunwater has indicated it has no intention to make an amendment to the bulk capacity share rules for Fred Haig Dam. 
So the Queensland Labor government are again failing our farmers terribly, hurting those who have invested in the region, who have decided to, to risk all to help grow their community so they can employ people, so they can, can sell food to Australians, so they can sell food overseas to help Australia grow. But you know who doesn't have their back? Well, the state Labor government doesn't have their back. So my, my message, please, and I, it's, it's a begging message to, to Premier Palaszczuk. You have a, have a, have a three-and-a-half-year term ahead of you, and I would ask that, that please give, give the farmers and the community of the Wide Bay Burnett the answers they deserve. Please rebuild the dam wall and restore this dam. But in the meantime, uh, because we, we know Labor won't deliver, we know, we know Labor don't care really much about regional Queensland because uh, they're so focused on, on green preferences to help them stay in power. I would encourage those listening to, to get in touch with, with Marlon Law or go on Facebook and, and, and get involved and, and put some money into this class action so we can hold this state Labor government to account. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.